Tune in to nostalgia. Tune in to now. Golden Radio Hour. And now, here's Act One of The Old Ones Are Hard to Kill. It begins with a stethoscope, a blood pressure reading, an electrocardiogram, and an altogether satisfying report on the health of Mrs. Ada Canby. Hmm. Well, can't see a thing to complain about, Ada. That little congestion you had last time is all cleared up. All in all, I'd say you're doing fine. For a woman my age, you mean. (laughs) (laughs) The older the chicken, the tougher it is to kill. (laughs) That's what my grandmother used to tell me, and she lived to be 98. Mm -hmm. Speaking of relatives, you uh, see much of Walter. My grandson? Oh, the usual once-a-year visit. And he always comes up with the same complaint. What's that? That I shouldn't be living all alone. Oh, that big house of yours must get pretty lonely sometimes. Well, the truth is, Dr. George, I'm not alone there. Mm -hmm. You're not? I decided to take in the border last month. Really? I haven't written Walter about it. Uh, I'm sure he'd object to my taking in a stranger, but there's really nothing wrong with Mr. Paulson, except his health, maybe. His uh, health? What's wrong with him? Oh, the poor man's had a terrible cold for the past two weeks. Well, let me do a thing for him, though. Well, now, where did you meet this, Mr. Paulson? He answered the ad I ran. He's just back from South America. Been living in Brazil for years. He's a very nice gentleman, really. He keeps himself and tends his birds. He has the loveliest blue parakeets. You can hear them chirping all over the house. Oh, it's the friendliest song. Well, I, uh, I don't see anything wrong with what you're doing, Ada. Just make sure you don't go and catch the man's cold. Well, there's not much chance of that. The poor man hardly ever leaves his room. Well, how much do I owe you? I'll send you the bill. I'm sure you'll forget all about it. <laughs> <laughs> Promise me you'll send it. <laughs> No, thank you, Mrs. Canby. Thanks very much. I'm going to try to get some sleep. Well, all right, if you say so. I guess it's time I was in bed myself. (laughs) Oh, my, listen to that poor man. I wonder if he keeps his birds awake, too. Mrs. Canby... I was paid. Did you hear me? Oh, Lord. Uh, Mr. Paulson, do you know what you're saying? Do you understand me? Lindell is innocent. I killed Richardson, not Lindell. Well, let, let me get help. Uh, you can tell them yourself, Mr. Paulson, and the police and the doctor. You tell them, please. Tell them to free Lindell. He's innocent. Tell them I'm the one who killed Richardson ten years ago. Oh, I don't know anything about such things, and I know why. Well, I did it. I killed Richardson. I, I did no, it. No, I don't. I don't want to hear it. I don't. Please don't tell me. <laughs> Mr. Paulson, I... I... 
Mr. Paulson? Oh, dear God. I, I think he's gone. <laughs> Those poor little birdies. I suppose they miss poor Mr. Paulson. I'll leave them in his room. Well, let's see about this letter now. Dear Walter, I hope you don't mind my turning to you for advice. But I really don't know what to do. It's been three days since my boarder, Mr. Paulson, passed away, and I still haven't told the police what the man said to me. I just can't bring myself to get mixed up in anything like this. Uh, dear, what's the use of writing, Walter? He'll probably think I've dreamed it all up. No, I'll just forget it. Only how do you forget such a thing? Those names, I keep hearing them. Richardson, Lindell. Lindell is innocent. God, what if it's all true? If Mr. Paulson actually murdered this Richardson and Lindell is innocent, only, well, who are they? I wonder if the telephone book, well, well, why not? Let's see, Richardson, Richard, all right, let's see there, J.R. Yes, yes, here it is. Oh, Lord, this doesn't tell them. Well, I'll try Lindell. That wouldn't be as common, I don't suppose. Yes, yes, here it is. There's only about half a dozen, then. Oh, oh my heavens, Lindell and Richardson. Both names together, Lindell and Richardson Investments. Nine Concourse, 4153132. I wonder if... Well, maybe, maybe it's the only way to be sure. there I can speak to. Yes, yes, please. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. This is Mr. Chilton. May I be of service? Well, maybe you can. I, I want to know about your Mr. Richardson, uh, about when he died. I think I did business with him once uh, a long time ago. Well, it's ten years, madam, just about. But uh, if you're interested in investment advice... Well, I'll think about it. Thank you very much. Ten years. Well, it could be a coincidence. I guess it all depends on how he died. Well, Mrs. Canby, please come in. Have a seat. Thank you. Well, now, how can we be of help to you? Well, I didn't come here to get help, Mr. Shelton. I came to help you, as a matter of fact. Or rather... Somebody you know. Who would that be? Uh, Mr. John Lindell, the man who was supposed to have murdered Mr. Richardson. <laughs> I'm afraid I'm not following you. Well, it took me all week to find out what happened to those two men. And finally, I found the story in the old newspaper room down at the library about Mr. Lindell being indicted for killing his partner. But I'm, I'm sure you know the whole story a lot better than I do. Well, of course I know the story, but <laughs> that was quite a long time ago, Mrs. Canby. Ten years doesn't seem so long when you're my age. Anyway, the point is that I can help your Mr. Lindell, only I can't do it alone. Did you know John Lindell? No, no, I didn't. Nor Mr. Richardson, for that matter. The man I knew was named Paulson. Who? I rented a room to Mr. Paulson, and he died about eight days ago of pneumonia. I was there when it happened. Well, that's unfortunate, but... Uh... Before he died, Mr. Paulson told me something about Mr. Richardson's murder. He said Mr. Lindell hadn't been responsible, that he, Mr. Paulson, had committed it for money. Oh, Mrs. Canby, listen to me. It was this man Lindell that bothered him. 
the fact that he was in prison for something he didn't do. I thought I should tell you this, Mr. Chelton, because you knew both of these gentlemen. It said so in the newspaper. Mrs. Canby, my my dear woman. What? <laughs> I don't know what silly story you heard, but it's completely wrong. There wasn't any question about what happened. This border of yours, whatever his name is, merely had an obsession. Well, just the same, I thought you could follow through on this business. Yeah. Tell the police, because if it is true... Mr. Lindell should be freed. On evidence like that? Well, I don't know anything about evidence. I'm just telling you what I heard. <sighs> well, never mind. I suppose I should have told the police myself. Wait, wait, Mrs. Candy. Uh, let me put your mind at rest. John Lindell is no longer in prison. He isn't? He's dead, Mrs. Canby. He's been dead for the last three years. Oh. He wasn't a young man when all this happened. When he accused his partner, Fred Richardson, of defrauding him and shot him dead. He died? In prison? Even if all you say is true, that this man was Richardson's murderer, you can't help John Lindell any longer. He's beyond that. But his name, don't you want to his name? Have you any proof? Any living witness? Just myself. Forget it, Mrs. Canby. That's my advice to you. The old wound is healed. Don't reopen it. Oh, well, it troubles me so. I haven't thought of anything else since it happened. Perhaps if I saw a minister, if I had some advice from a man of God, maybe... Mrs. Canby, now you said something. Now you've shown me the way. That's where our answer lies, dear woman, in prayer. Mm -hmm. In the forgiveness of our dear Lord. Will you pray with me, Mrs. Kenby? Pray? Here? Why not? God is everywhere. Please, join me. <sighs> dear Lord, tell us what to do. Give us your divine guidance. Show us the path to righteousness. Mr. Chelton, I... Help us, O oh Lord. I... Help us to understand... Teach us to forgive the sins of others and to forget them. To forget. <sighs> I feel much better now, Mrs. Canby. Do you? Well, I'm not sure. Let us turn this matter over to God, Mrs. Canby. Not to the police, but to the Lord. It's in his hands now. Don't you agree? Well, in a way, that's true. Since they're dead now... All of them. Yes? Uh, Mrs. Candy? Yes? My name's Stuart Winfield, Mrs. Candy. Mm -hmm. I understand you have a room for rent? Yes, 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 I do. Well, I'm new in town. I just arrived from Philadelphia. I've been staying at a hotel, but I'd like something homier. Well, the room I have is $35 a week. I can't offer you any meals, but you can use the kitchen all you want. Well, that sounds good to me. Would uh, Would you like to see the room? Yes, ma'am, I sure would. Well, uh, come on in, then. Thank you. By the way, how did you know I had a room for rent? Hmm? I was going to place an ad this weekend. Oh, I, uh, I, I guess someone at the hotel mentioned it, uh... I forget just who. Say, this is a real fine old house, Mrs. Candy. Mm -hmm. I can see that I'm going to like this place. Just fine. And so Mrs. Candy has a new boarder. He's a very personable young man. With a great deal more charm than old Mr. Paulson had. Perhaps in a little while, Mrs. Canby will be able to forget her former boarder and the shocking confession he made on his deathbed. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. I want to... Stu Winfield took no time at all to make himself at home in Ada Canby's big old house. He loved everything about his room. The fine old four-poster bed. The crazy quilt that Ada herself had sewn up 40 years ago. The lace curtains on the window. 
He even loved Mr. Paulson's blue parakeets. But what he really seemed to like best was Mrs. Canby herself. Just take me two minutes to get these clean sheets on the bed, Mr. Here, Mr. let me give you a hand. No, 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 I can manage. I've been making this bed for almost 50 years. 50? You've lived in this house that long? Moved in here when I got married back in 1919. My husband David bought it for us. Our only son, Ralph, was born in it. And you've lost them both? Yes, they're both dead, but I haven't lost them. Oh, yes, yes, I understand, Mrs. Canby. I guess I feel that way about my mom. Your mother's dead? Yes, she died when I was two. Oh. Listen, Mr. Winfield, are you sure you want these birds in your room? Mm-hmm. I could take them to the parlor if you want. No, no, I think they're great. I, I think everything's great about this house. Uh, but there is something you can do for me. What's that? Would you mind not calling me Mr. Winfield? Oh? Uh, that's what they call my father. My name's Stuart. Well, well, all right. Stuart. <laughs> Dear Walter, I think it's about time I told you that I have a boarder in the house. Mr. Winfield is the nicest young man you could want to meet. He's a great deal friendlier than my first gentleman, Mr. Paulson. And he seems to like nothing better than to sit around evenings and talk. We talk about his home and his parents and his plans for the future. I think the poor boy misses his home and family, and I'm sort of a substitute for all that. Mm. You know, it isn't really fair, Mrs. Candy. You said I had kitchen privileges, but that doesn't mean you have to cook for me. Well, it's a pleasure, Stuart. I haven't had anyone to cook for in years. You're kidding. You mean to say you cook this good without practice? Oh, you're just being nice. I'm sure that stew is just plain ordinary. It's terrific. No kidding. It, it tastes like... Well, it it tastes like home, if you know what I mean. But it depends on whose home you mean. <laughs> Well, my mom cooks stews like this. That's what I meant. Your mom? Mm. Well, but she died when you were only two. Oh, well, I, I guess I, I didn't mean my mom exactly. I, I was thinking of my Aunt Martha. Uh, I mean, she's the one who sort of took over the cooking and stuff after my mother died. And my father's sister, you know? I see. Well, that was lucky that you had someone to take her place. Yeah, that's right. It's... Oh, Excuse me. My Stuart, yeah. you're not coming down with anything, are you? <laughs> no, no, I'm fine. Just a little case of the sniffle. Listen, if your room isn't warm enough, I have an extra book. No, yet. no, the room's just fine. Don't worry about it. Oh, you'll be sure now. I know I felt a little guilty about poor Mr. Paulson when he got sick. Uh, maybe I didn't take good enough care of him. Uh, Paulson? Mm-hmm. Oh, was that your former boarder, the, uh, the bird lover? Yes, yes, that was his name, the poor man. Well, tell me about him. Well, I don't really know that much about him. He lived here less than two months. Well, what sort of a guy was he? Well, very quiet. He kept to himself. Did you say he was from South America? I don't remember if I did or not. Well, you must have said it. Yeah, yes, of course. He was American, but he'd been living in Brazil. I don't know why exactly. Although, come to think of it, maybe I do. What do you mean? Well, it it just occurred to me that Brazil might be just the place for someone who came into a lot of money and and wanted to leave the country. I don't understand. Is that... oh, uh, I really think you are getting a cold, Stuart. I'm getting that blanket out this minute. Now, wait, Mrs. Candy. I'd rather hear well, about... Never mind. I don't want to take any chances. I'll be right back. Yes, Mrs. Candy. Don't take any chance. Stuart? Yes? Come in. I brought your tray, Stuart. Oh. No, you shouldn't have. <laughs> you shouldn't have gone to all that trouble, Mrs. Candy. Well, not least bit of trouble. Besides, you've got to have some supper. Feed a cold and starve a fever. That's what I mean, I, I was going to come out to the kitchen and, and get myself a sandwich or something. You didn't have to bring it to me. Oh, look at that. Is that roast chicken? Well, that's what it's supposed to be. <laughs> mm. I hope it tastes 
that's all right. The noodle soup with dumplings. Mrs. Candy, you're spoiling me rotten. Do you know that? Hey, I just thought it'd be a good idea if you stayed in bed and took it easy. You weren't planning to go out tonight, were you? No, no, I was just going to stay in and read for a while. <coughs> Maybe watch television. Oh, well, that's good. Here, I'll just set this tray down. Oh, <laughs> the service here is just too good. Oh, we, <coughs> we never... Uh, we never finished our talk the other day about that border of yours, uh, Mr. Paulson. Well, there's not much to say about him, really. Well, you said something about his living in South America. <laughs> you said you thought you understood why he was living there. Sounded real interesting. Well, the truth is, Stuart, there is something to tell about Mr. Paulson. <laughs> maybe, maybe you can help me feel better about it all. About what? Now, I'm not going to tell you if you don't eat. <laughs> All right, Mrs. Candy, I'll, I'll eat. Well, it happened just about three weeks ago. No, something, Mrs. Candy. That's about the best roast chicken I've had in years. I'm sure it spoiled your appetite with all my chatter. <laughs> no, no, that was a really interesting story. But what do you think of it all, Stuart? Hmm? Hmm. No, the killer is the man who hired Mr. Paulson. Don't you see? Is it right that he should get away with it? No, wait a minute. <laughs> You're jumping to conclusions. No, I'm not. Mr. Paulson told me that he was hired to do this thing. Well, maybe he was hired by Lindell. Maybe Lindell hired him, and then Paulson got cold feet, and Lindell did the shooting himself. No, I'm sure that isn't true. You see, I read the newspaper article all about it. Well, you, you really were thorough about this, weren't you, Mrs. Candy? <laughs> you poor man. That cold's gone to your chest now, hasn't it? No, I'm all, I'm all right. Stop, stop worrying about me. Let's talk about this... This other problem of yours. Well, maybe I'm making it more of a problem than it should be. Maybe if I just told the police everything, I could forget it once and for all. No, I, uh, I, I really couldn't advise that, Mrs. Candy. Well, it said in the newspaper story that the two men were partners in that investment firm. And Mr. Lindell thought that his partner, Richardson, was cheating, taking money out of the firm... And that's why he's supposed to have shot him. Wasn't there a witness to the shooting? Why, yes, I think there was. Come to think of it, it was Mr. Shelton. That's right, that's right. Well, doesn't that, doesn't that wrap it up for you? Well, it would if it wasn't for Mr. Paulson. Listen, Mrs. Candy, you know how much I like you. Well, in just a few days, you're more like family to me than my Aunt Martha ever was. Well, it's nice of you to say, Stuart. And that's why I want you to listen to me about this. That's why I want you to forget about this whole foolish thing. And then... <laughs> listen to you. You sound awful, Stuart. Just tell me. No, I'm all right. No, you're not all right. I'm going to get you some cough medicine right this minute. <laughs> Hello? Um, Mr. Chowton, it, it's me, Winfield. Well, what's happening? I think I better stick around for a few more days, Mr. Chelton. The old lady's beginning to get fidgety, if, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Something tells me that Stuart Winfield isn't such a nice young man after all. Could it be that he wasn't telling Mrs. Canby the truth about his dear mother and his Aunt Martha? Could he have not told her the truth about his plans for the future? Of course, the real issue is, what sort of plan does he have for Ada Canby's future? I'll be back shortly with Act Three. If you are one... Mrs. 
can be. She isn't sleeping well tonight. But of course, Mrs. Canby has good reasons for insomnia. Her thoughts are whirling. Her border steward was right. She doesn't want the bother of going to the police. And she firmly believes in the old adage, if you don't trouble trouble, trouble won't trouble you. But still... Oh, my... I'm never going to get to sleep tonight. Poor Stuart. He's still coughing. I'm sure that room is just too dry. I never should have let any boarders in until I got the windows fixed. Oh, dear. That poor boy. I'll never forget the terrible night Mr. Paulson was coughing so badly. Huh? And the way he looked, all gray and shrunken. If only I knew he was so sick. No. If only he'd never even come to this house. Mrs. Canby, I killed Richardson. I did it. Do I ever forget the sound of that man's voice? Lindell is innocent. Lindell is innocent. That poor man. All the years he spent in jail for something he didn't do. Let sleeping dogs lie, Mrs. Camby. My Aunt Run always said, let sleeping dogs lie. If only I could get some sleep. Let us turn this matter over to God, Mrs. Camby. Not to the police. Not to the police. Not to the police. What a strange man he is, Mr. Chum. He talked about God praying at his desk. Of course, God is everywhere, but his desk. I killed Richardson. I murdered him for money. I was paid. I was paid. Paid. Someone had to pay him. Mr. Paulson wasn't the only guilty one. Someone else was, too. Okay. article say the chief witness against Mr. Vendell was Arnold Shelton. But how could he be a witness to something that never happened? How could he be? I'll have to tell someone. I'll have to talk to someone. Yes, I'll tell Stuart about it in the morning. Yes, I'm up, Mrs. Canby. Come in. Oh, oh no. Now, don't tell me I'm getting breakfast in bed, too. Well, I know you had a terrible night last night, Stuart. You were coughing much worse than ever. I guess that medicine wasn't very good. Sorry I kept you awake, Mrs. Canby. Oh, that wasn't your fault. No. Something else kept me up. What was that? Oh, my mind, I guess. Maybe I should say my conscience. Oh, that sounds serious. <laughs> but it is something serious, Stuart. Well, I might have let a man get away with murder. No, it's even worse than that. He did something worse than murder. You're talking about Paulson again. <laughs> no, I'm talking about the man who hired Mr. Paulson. He didn't just have that man Richardson shot. He let an innocent person go to jail and die there. Now, that's like committing two murders, if you ask me. I have to tell you something that occurred to me last night. Sure, go ahead. Well, it's about Mr. Chelton. Mr. Arnold Chelton. Yeah? Go on. I I'm listening. Stuart, I wonder if maybe the reason Mr. Chelton was so upset with me... The reason he didn't want me to go to the police was because he was afraid. Explain what you mean. Well, what I mean is maybe Mr. Shelton had good reason besides the one he told me. 
He was working for both Mr. Richardson and Mr. Lundell at the time of the murder. Well, so what? Well, he was also the chief witness at the trial. A witness for the prosecution. But he saw the shooting, didn't he? But that's just the point. He saw Mr. Lindell shoot Mr. Richardson. Well, that's not what you told me last time. I mean, that he was an eyewitness. No, that's right. He didn't actually see the shooting. He was miles away when it happened. I don't quite remember the details. There was something about a phone call, maybe? Yes. Yes, that's what it was. He claimed that Mr. Richardson was talking to him on the phone when Mr. Lindell showed up at his apartment. He said that Richardson cried out something about Lindell having a gun. And then he heard the shot. But how could that have happened if the gun was fired by Mr. Paulson? If, Mrs. Candy... That's the big little word, isn't it? If. (laughs) But don't you see what I'm saying, Stuart? Arnold Chelsea had the most to gain. Gain? From what? From both these men leaving the firm. That would leave the whole thing to him. All those customers, all the investments he handled, all the commissions or whatever they call it. Are you accusing this guy Shelton of being the killer? Yes. It's it's the only answer, Stuart. Well, look, if that was the case, the, <coughs> the police would have figured it out. But they didn't. There was nothing in the stories I read that pointed any suspicion at Mr. Chelton. I don't suppose it's even a to them. And now the company is all his. Well, you don't you don't call that evidence, do you? <laughs> well, then why didn't he let me go to the police? Why did he try so hard to talk me out of it? That man was praying to it. He was taking the name of the Lord. (laughs) Oh, I'm sorry, Stuart. I'm so sorry. I won't bother you anymore. I know what I have to do anyway. Mrs. Candy. I won't be gone long, Stuart. No, no, wait. But the minute I get back, I'm going to call Dr. George and ask him to come over. You're sick. Never mind the doctor. Are you calling the police? No, no, I won't call them. You're right. I don't want them tracking my in my parlor. I'm going down to the station house and talk to them. I'll get dressed now and go straight there. Please, please think about what you're doing. I'll tell them what I know and they can do the rest. Now, you try to eat something, Stuart. Please. Mrs. Candy. Oh. <coughs> <coughs> What is this, Winfield? I told you not to call me at the office. It's an emergency. You sound terrible. What's the matter with you? I'm sick. Only you're going to be a lot sicker. What are you talking about? The old lady. I can't stop her. She's decided to talk. What? She figured it out. Figured out exactly what you did, Sheldon, and how you did it. You fool. Stop her. Do you hear me? That wasn't part of the deal, Shelton. It's all of the deal now. The price didn't include anything like that. The price just doubled. Old ladies are always having accidents. Make her have one. Make her have one now, Winfield. All right. All right. She's going to... She's going to have a fall down the cellar steps. Right now. i got to get my robe on. My slippers. I've got to hurry. Stuart? Is that you? Open up, Mrs. Candy. Stuart Winfield, what are you doing out of bed? Now, you go right back there this second. I gotta, I gotta talk to you, Mrs. Candy, before you go to the police. Just listen to you. You're all winded. You can hardly talk, Stuart. Now, go back to bed before you catch pneumonia, too. Now, don't go, Mrs. Candy. It would be better if you never went to the police. Better for you. Better for me. For you? I don't understand. Well, then, I... 
I wouldn't have to hurt you, Mrs. Candy. <laughs> That's what I mean. I wouldn't have to do anything bad to you. Stuart, what in the world are you talking about? Come on, old lady. You're, not... You're smart, all right. You really think things through. So now, think a little harder. You knew? Stuart, you knew about Mr. Paul. That's right. That's how you know my room is so red, because Mr. Shelton told you. Now you're getting there, Mrs. Candy. And that's why you rented it. That's why you were sent here. Just to watch you, Mrs. Candy. Just to see oh, that you yes. stayed sensible. Mr. Shelton. <laughs> Mr. Shelton did. I was hoping you'd never change your mind about calling the police. No, the... I didn't want this part of it. This isn't the part I like. Oh, let me go. 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 Please, please, don't. I hear it right as a feather, Mrs. Candy. Oh, Just like my Aunt Martha would have been if I, if I had an Aunt Martha. Please, 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 please. We've got a date now, Mrs. Oh, Candy. Let me go! Stay, Eddie! Put up such a fight, Mrs. Candy. I'm sick, remember? Stay, no! Shut your eyes. Please, shut your eyes and... Don't look down. Oh, my God. Uh, Stuart, those stairs. Yes, shut your eyes. Yes, I'm all in the stairs. Hey, I'm all the old in the stairs. Hey, I'm all the old in the stairs. It's all right, my lady. Uh, Just be glad that it wasn't you at the... Bottom of those stairs. Well, will he be all right, Dr. George? Now, what do you want to worry about that man for? Uh, Truth is, his uh, injuries don't amount to very much. A couple of broken ribs seem to be the worst of it. But he'll be a patient for some time before they can put him in prison where he belongs. Him and his uh, friend. What was that man's name again? You mean Mr. Chubb? Have they arrested him? Yeah, yeah. That's what the police detective said. I don't understand. Stuart's injuries aren't safe. It's not the fall that made Winfield so sick. His case was diagnosed as simple pneumonia at first. And then I remembered about your first border. Nelson, was it? Nelson. Yes, Nelson. But he had pneumonia, too. He died of it. Oh, is, is pneumonia contagious? Yes, yes, it is, but... This disease was even more contagious. It's a pneumonia caused by a disease called psittacosis, better known as parrot fever. Uh, you get it from sick birds, like the parakeets in your spare room. Oh, no. Mr. Paulson's bird. Sorry, Ada, but it had to be taken out and destroyed. Oh, what a shame. There's one reason I... I feel sorry for them. They saved your life. Made Mr. Winfield too weak even to throw a little old lady down a flight of steps. Uh, those poor little creatures. Yeah, but you can be grateful they didn't make you sick, too. Mm. Parrot fever is so contagious that no more than one person in a thousand could be exposed to it and escape infection. It was pretty darn close to a miracle, they do. Yeah. They're hard to kill, Doctor. Remember? The old ones are hard to kill. They say that people are living longer than ever before. And when we look at Ada Canby, we can understand why. She's a tough old lady. So tough she could withstand the threats of man, beast, and bird. So let that be a warning to all those who think that our senior citizens are easy prey for crime. Watch out. They may turn the tables on you. Or the stairs. I'll be back shortly. final comment for you on behalf of Ada Canby and old people everywhere. There's a saying, 
There's no fool like an old fool. But it's also true that there's no wisdom and strength like old wisdom and strength. There. Does that make you feel better about your next birthday? Our cast included Agnes Moorhead, Leon Janney, and Roger DeCoven. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. the sound of suspense, the fear you can hear. For the next 52 minutes, we're going to take you into the world of mystery, into the world of terrifying imagination. The story you are going to hear concerns a question which has been asked since the first men on earth were born and died. Is there a life after death? Is there a way to return from the grave? And if there is, can we come back in the body of a living creature? Even one that has claws instead of fingernails? Here is one chilling answer. Dr. Singh, you have to tell me. Could my wife have come back as a bird, a sparrow, something like that? Well, your wife was a rather big woman, Mr. Morrisby, in a physical sense. How about a snake? A seagull? How about a cat? A great, big, fat cat? A cat. Our mystery drama, The Return of the Moresbys, was written especially for the Radio Mystery Theater by Henry Slesser and stars Patrick O'Neill. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Now here is Act One. Like all murder stories, sooner or later, it reaches the office of a daily newspaper. You wanted to see me, Chief? You bet I want to see you, Pronty. Come in and shut that door. I bet I know what it's about. That story I filed on Richard Moresby, right? I got a flash for you, Pronty. This is a newspaper office, not a fiction magazine. You take this story of yours and see if you can sell it to Weirdo Digest or something. But get it off my desk. Now, wait a while, Max. I know it's offbeat, but I thought I handled it with a, with a kind of a light touch. Stories about murder can't be handled with a light touch. Not on this paper. But it's accurate. I mean, this is exactly what the guy Moresby told me just before he died. Well, he must have been out of his head. He asked for somebody to hear his story. That's how I got to meet him. I was at the hospital covering that subway accident. Now, that story made sense to me. Nothing but nice, clear facts. But this nonsense... Please, let me tell you about this guy. Maybe you'll change your mind. All right, what about him? Well, for one thing, he was a real distinguished-looking guy. The only thing peculiar about him was his eyes. His eyes? Yeah. They were the palest blue eyes I ever saw on a man. They weren't really blue at all. They, They were... They're like silver. Big deal. So he had silver eyes. And when he started to tell me about himself, well, I just had to hear the whole story, Chief. Yes, I was born in London, but my family moved to the States when I was young. They didn't improve much on the climate when they did. We lived in Vermont. I don't think I was ever warm enough until the age of 24 when I moved to Southern California. I lived on beaches. A superb swimmer, a superior surfboarder, 
and a terrible bum. It was on the beach at Malibu that I met the woman who was to become my wife. Her name was Una. She was as pale as a gardenia, a gardenia with bones. Una had more bones than any other woman I've ever met. Lovely day, isn't it? I beg your pardon? I said it's a beautiful day. I don't think I've ever seen the ocean look prettier. Frankly, the Pacific always looked a little muddy to me. <laughs> I wonder if that's what Balboa said when he first saw it. <laughs> well, he probably said, what a great place for surfing. Ah, I see you have a surfboard. Yes, uh, as a matter of fact, I think I see a wave that I like. Uh, will you excuse me? Oh, I wish I had the nerve to try it. Yeah, you really should. Well, bye now. Maybe I'll ask my chauffeur to teach me. I'm sorry. What did you say? Charles, my chauffeur. He's very good at sports. Show. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, come to think of it, that wave doesn't look so good after all. Uh, uh, by the way, my name is Richard. Richard Morrison. How do you do? My name is Una. Una Vandermeer. That was her name. As soon as I realized that she was from the Vandermeer family, she didn't seem half as bony as she did before. In fact, not only did I become accustomed to Una's appearance, I was even able to tolerate her inane conversation. Can't you just feel the mystery of the stars, Richard? Sometimes I feel their vibrations as if they're trying to communicate with me. Do you ever feel that? Well, sometimes, I suppose. I really think we must be one with the universe, don't you? I really believe there's just one great universal soul, and we're all part of it. Don't you think so, too? Yes, of course. <laughs> right on, as they say. You see what I mean? She talked that way all the time, from the first day of our honeymoon. Well, it was a, a fine honeymoon just the same. It lasted a whole year on the beaches of the Caribbean... The French Riviera, I got browner and browner. Una got freckles. Finally, we returned to our home in Los Angeles and settled down to a quiet, comfortable marriage. What on earth is that you're playing? It's sitar music, darling. Oh, it's just so spiritual. What What made you buy the record? Mm-hmm. Oh, well, Dr. Singh recommended it. Who? Dr. Singh. At the Temple of Metapsychosis, you know. The Temple of what? Metapsychosis. I told you about joining the temple last week. Oh, Richard, sometimes I think you don't listen to me. Now, as you may know, Southern California abounds in quasi-religious organizations. And she'd gone through a number of them without discovering the universal soul at any of their altars. Darling, please come to one of Dr. Singh's lectures. He's such a magnificent speaker. He emits such vibrations. And I went. You see what an obliging husband I was? And actually, it turned out to be more interesting than I thought. The temple itself was unpretentious. And Dr. Singh was an impressive man. And when he spoke, I realized why his message had such appeal for Una. Because he preached a doctrine that combined eternal life with a love of small animals. The soul is immortal. The soul cannot die. The soul, upon leaving the body, must make its passage elsewhere. There is a science called eschatology which deals with the last four things. Death, judgment, heaven, and hell. It is the most ancient of all sciences. And from its wisdom has come the inescapable certainty of the transmigration of souls. Yeah, yeah, I know it's a bit weird, but stay with it. And where does the soul go? According to the wise men of all generations past, the soul departs from the mouth of the dying. It is, consequently, a small thing. A bird, a snake, a mouse, a dove, or a hawk, a dog, a cat, an insect. For these small creations of God are empty vessels placed upon earth for only one purpose. 
to house the departing souls of humanity so that they need not wander forever in a trackless eternity. Yeah, yeah, it's pure rot, of course. But that's what the man said. And Una sat there and believed every single word. Oh, wasn't he marvelous, Richard? Isn't it wonderful that the soul never dies? That we can all come back as little animals? I'm not sure I want to come back as an animal. But you'd still be you, Richard. Oh, don't you see? Mm -hmm. Well, by the way, what, uh, what was that envelope you handed Dr. Singh after the meeting? The envelope? Oh, that was my donation, of course. Your donation to the temple? Yes, to support the work of Dr. Singh. To open other temples around the world. Uh -huh. Well, um, how, how, how much money was in the envelope? Now, what does it matter, Richard? I'm just curious. Two thousand dollars. Two thousand... Una. Una, you go to that temple once a week. Do you always give that kind of donation? Oh, it's all in a very good cause, Richard. <laughs> Well, in an equally good cause, that of finding out exactly how much of my wife's money was supporting this nonsense, I sneaked a look at Una's checkbook. The answer astonished me. Not only had my wife put more than $30,000 into Dr. Singh's collection plate, she had also donated some 20000 more to various institutions for the care and feeding of cats, dogs, and birds. It was so kind of you to honor us with a visit, Dr. Singh. I know how terribly busy you are. On the contrary. You were kind to invite me to your lovely home. Oh. Now tell me, Dr. Singh, what determines the kind of animal one becomes when the soul escapes after death? Ah, uh, Mrs. Morsby, that is a question which has baffled wise men for countless generations. But isn't it possible to do, well, research? Yes, Mrs. Morrisby. I don't doubt that we could find the answer to such great questions if only we had the proper resources. But, unfortunately, that would require money. A great deal more money than the movement has at present. Well, it seems to me you don't do badly. There you are. Hello, Richard. Where have you been all morning? Right here, in my little sewing room. <laughs> don't tell me you were sewing. Oh, don't be silly. Actually, I've been composing something. A letter? Oh, something more important than that. Richard, do you realize that I have no last will and testament? <laughs> well, why should you? Healthy young chicken like you. I can't call myself young anymore, Richard. You'll always be young to me, darling. Oh, that's very sweet. But just the same, it's only practical to have a will. Would you read it over, Richard, and see if it... Well, if it sounds legal enough? Certainly. Well, let's see now. I, Una Vandermeyer Morsby, a resident of the city of Los Angeles, state of California, residing at 8 Sheridan Drive, being over the age of 21 and of sound and disposing mind and memory. Darling, this is superb. Where on earth did you get the language? Well, to tell you the truth, I copied it out of Daddy's will. <laughs> the one that left you ten million? Yes. Well, I don't see how you could go wrong. Let's see now. Not acting under duress, menace, fraud, or undue influence of any person whomsoever. And... Good Lord. Una. What's the, what is it? What? You're, you're not serious about this. Oh, about making a will? Well, of course well, I am. I, I mean, I... This, this bequest to the temple, a, 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 a mumbo-jumbo. What's wrong with it? Now, listen, darling, I told you how important Dr. Singh's work is, but it requires money to carry it on. Tons of money. So the least I can do is to help the poor man as much as I can. But you're giving him 90% of your entire fortune. Ah, you'll still have a million dollars if I go first, Richard. Isn't that enough? No, it isn't. I, I, no, I mean, the, the whole thing is ridiculous. Don't you realize that man is a fraud? A charlatan? What? Oh, for heaven's what? sake, Una, open your eyes. Don't you realize the simple truth? Your money won't build any temples. It's just going to line the pockets of that turban phony. Richard, what a terrible thing to say. Well, you told me you liked Dr. Singh. That you were very impressed by his theory of transmigration. Darling, I was only saying all that to please you. But now I'm telling you that the only thing Dr. Singh is planning to transmigrate is your money into his savings account. <gasps> and frankly, 
I'm not going to let him do it. Richard, what are you doing? You're tearing up my will. That's right. How dare you do such a thing? It's my money, and I'll do whatever I please with it. Oh, no. Darling, I just want you to have a chance to come to your senses. Oh, there's nothing wrong with my senses. I can see very clearly what the real trouble is. If I didn't leave a will, all my money would go to you, wouldn't it? Well, naturally, I'm your husband. You don't have any other evidence. That's why you're acting this way. It's just plain and simple greed. Una, listen to me. No, it's all right. It's all right. I'm glad you tore up that will, Richard, because I realize now that I was quite wrong. Do you? Yes. It's a mistake to leave only nine million of my money to the temple. I'm going to leave all of it to Dr. Singh. When Una actually drafted that incredible document and called our attorney for a Monday morning appointment, I realized that I had to do something very drastic before the weekend was over. I had to kill my poor misguided wife. I had to make her one with the universe. It's obvious that Mr. Moresby is going to be a very reluctant murderer. The question is, will his reluctance get in the way of his efficiency? We'll get the details when we return shortly with Act Two. Now let's return to Richard Moresby. In order to find him... We'll have to search the highway, for Richard has taken his white jaguar out for a spin. But there he is now. On Saturday morning, I took a little spin in my XKL and did some thinking on the open road. I didn't want to kill poor Una, of course. The whole idea was repellent. But on the other hand, the thought of Dr. Singh spending the fortune that was rightfully mine was even more abhorrent. However... I decided I would make one more stab at a reconciliation. Darling, may I come in? It's your living room, too. <laughs> it doesn't feel like it. Matter of fact, I've felt like a stranger in this house for the past two days. I suppose that's my fault. Well, you haven't been exactly cordial, have you? I've hardly been home, Richard. I spent all day yesterday at the temple and... All morning at the Pet Breast Kennels. And how are all the little souls doing? <laughs> you just won't stop being irreverent, will you? It's been my money all along, hasn't it, Richard? From the very beginning, you were attracted to my money. Oh, now, darling, if you thought that, you would never have married I me. I didn't want to believe it. I don't want to believe it now. Well, now, how, how can I prove to you that you're mistaken? Richard, you really want to prove it. Of course, I'll do anything you say. All right. Now, I know exactly what you can do. <laughs> you can let me leave my money to Dr. Singh and the temple. The whole ten million? Yes, because that's the only way I'll know that it's me you love. Well, you can't say I didn't try. But Una's decision now left me with absolutely no alternative. I was still deeply unhappy about the necessity of taking your life. However, fate was, was kind to me that very afternoon. Now you're sure that you want me to continue reading, Richard? Of course, darling. Well, I'm sort of embarrassed about this part. It's, it's, it's a paper that I wrote myself. Oh, something you wrote? Yeah, I wrote it this morning. I was going to show it to Dr. Singh. It's, um, well, it's a sort of a poem. It's called Death. Snappy title. Hope I can read my own handwriting. <clears throat> Death has become nothing to me. Death holds no fear for me. Come, Death, I welcome you. Lead me to the woods, the waters, the air above the earth. Come, take me, death. Your touch is kind. Richard? Oh, Richard. 
Richard, why do you look like that? Is it really that terrible? Oh, terrible. Oh, no, 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 my darling, it's, it's beautiful. Do you mean it? You must give it to me, Una. I, I must have it. You like it that much? Oh, I, yes, I certainly do. Oh, oh. Oh, well, I- I'll type it up for you, Richard. No, 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 I-, 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 I must have the original. No, just just the way you wrote it. Oh, darling, I'm so flattered. What will you do with it? Oh, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to put it in a frame, of course. And I know just where I'm going to hang it. Yes, I could hardly believe my ears. Una had written her own suicide note and her own handwriting. It was truly karma at work. Now there was no question of failure and no longer any need for delay. Oh, what a lovely idea this was, Richard. Candlelight dinner for two. Yes, yes, I, I, I thought you'd enjoy it. It's so sweet of you to handle the whole menu with Cook. You spoil me shamefully. <laughs> night, I spoiled her just a bit more by bringing hot cocoa to her in bed. Oh, oh Richard, you shouldn't have bothered. Well, I know how you you like your hot cocoa before retiring, only you can't get to sleep without it. No, but Parker could have brought it to me. Oh, no, this is something I had to do myself. Oh. Uh, well, yeah, drink it down now. Yes. I'm drinking it. Does it taste all right? Oh, it tastes just fine. Now that was very good news Because I'd prepared the hot cocoa myself And I had no idea whether 25 melted sleeping pills Would seriously affect the flavor Finally, Una was all tucked in for the night I went into my study Picked up the poem she had written for Dr. Singh And brought it to the bedroom I placed it carefully on the night table beside her Then I bent over my sleeping darling to see if she was getting along all right. She was very, very quiet. And then a dreadful thing happened. Una opened her eyes. Uh, Richard. Oh, Richard. Hush, hush, darling. Now go go back to sleep. Richard, I'm I'm sick. No, 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 my love. No, no, no. You're only sleepy. Go, go. Tasted so. Strange. I didn't want to upset you, Richard, but I'm sick. No, you, you'll feel much better in the morning, Ona. I, I promise you, tomorrow morning you'll you'll be oh. one with the universe. Richard, that paper. What paper, darling? My, is my poem, my my poem for Doctor Singh. What's it doing? I, I, I well, I was just just reading it over, darling. That's all. And uh, and, uh bottle my. Sleeping pills. Oh, it's, it's empty. The bottle is empty. Oh, Richard. Oh, Richard. What have you done? Nothing, darling. Nothing. Now, go, just go to the sleep. Coco, you put sleeping pills in it. All of them. Uh, don't try to get up. Oh, no, please. Now, don't. 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 trying to kill me. He, Trying to no, murder. No, for me. heaven, heaven's sake, Una, now stop saying things like that. Do you help. want the servants to hear? Help somebody. Help. Now, come on, lie down. Lie down, Una, for heaven's sake. Come on, now, lie, lie down. Lie down. There, there. That's, that's better. You won't get away with it. You won't get away with it, Richard. I promise you. Anything you say, darling. I'll come back. Richard, you know I'll be back. Yes. Yes, of course. Just just welcome death, Una. The way you wrote in your little poem. I'll be back. I swear it. funeral was held two days later. It was a magnificent occasion, of course. I gave Ona a farewell that was consistent with her vast fortune. Everything was the best. Coffin, flowers, preacher, everything. 
A burial place was one of the choicest bits of real estate at Forest Lawn. The only discordant note was the fact that Dr. Singh insisted on saying a few words at the service. They were familiar words, but frankly, they gave me a slight bit of a chill. The body of Una Morsby is dead, but her soul lives on. The soul cannot die. The soul is immortal. It has left the earthly remains of this woman and has sought the body of a small living thing. There it will abide until the Almighty is ready to choose its next home. Mourn not the end of Una Morsby, for there is no end. I couldn't help congratulating myself on how well everything had gone. When I called for medical attention the night of Una's death, the physician was only too ready to declare her a suicide. The police had to be informed, naturally, and they, too, agreed with the doctor's verdict. Una had died by her own hand, and she had died without a will. There was simply no question that the matter would be probated in my favor. Suddenly, I realized I was not only rich, but a rich widower. What vistas open for me? The devil... Look out, you stupid mongrel! Dog, oh, trying to get run over. I admit I was shaken up by it. Uh, I mean, it was sort of a coincidence, you know? Right after the funeral and, and all that. I was very glad to be home again, you can be sure. Excuse me, Mr. Morsby. Yes, Parker? Cook is worried about the raccoon, sir. The what? There's been a raccoon at the kitchen door all morning, and Cook is badly alarmed, I'm afraid. I've tried to scare it away, but it keeps returning. A raccoon, for heaven's sake? Why don't you just shoot it and make a coat out of it? I was wondering if you wished me to call the game warden, sir. Oh, please, Parker, do whatever you please about it. I'm going to take a nap. Yes, sir. Very good, sir. Upstairs at once, undressed, and got into bed. It was a warm day, and yet, yet I found myself cold. I got out the electric blanket and soon felt very cozy indeed. In fact, I felt so much better that I made a phone call. Hello, may I speak to Rachel? Thank you very much. Hello, Rachel? Yeah, who's this? Rachel, you you probably don't even know my name, but it's it's Moresby, Richard Moresby. Oh? Huh? Uh, you met me at the club numerous times. I I'm the rather distinguished looking gentleman who sits at the table on the far right corner. Oh, yeah, well that's not my station. Yeah, I know, I know it isn't, and I've always regretted it. Frankly, I would have enjoyed my lunches at the club even more if you had served them. Listen, I'm pretty busy right now. Well, but what I wanted to find out was if you're busy this evening. Oh, what'd you have in mind? Oh, a little uh quiet dinner, perhaps. Is that all you had in mind? Why don't we just wait and see? I can pick you up outside the club whenever you're free. Yeah, how I know it's you. I mean, I'm, I'm still not sure which gentleman you are. I'll uh, be sitting in an XKL Jaguar. Do you think you'll recognize it? A Jag? I get off at 6.30. <laughs> See you then. Yes, I was feeling very good now. Very good indeed. I would have drifted off into a pleasant sleep except for one thing. The moment I thought a bomb had gone off in the room. Then I realized it was nothing more than a bird. A foolish sparrow had dived in headfirst into the plate glass window of the bedroom and now lay stunned on the carpet. I looked at the thing's fluttering little heart and suddenly I was struck by a terrifying palpitation of my own. The dog, the raccoon, the bird, Good Lord, could one of them have been Una? Has Una Moresby returned from the grave? <laughs> Nonsense. Such things don't really happen. But uh, perhaps we should reserve judgment until I return shortly with Act Three.
Now let's see if common sense has returned to our hero. He's doing a sensible thing right now. He's taking a good, refreshing shower. By the time evening came, I was feeling better. All my peculiar notions about Una's animal reincarnation seemed ludicrous as I stood in front of the shaving mirror. I thought about the delicious young woman that was waiting for me at the club. I'd admired Rachel's way with a tray for months, but ever faithful to my wife, I hadn't done more than gaze from afar. But now, things were going to be different. Yes, who is it? It's Parker, sir. Yes, come in, Parker. It's all right. Excuse me, sir. A bit of emergency in the kitchen. Well, what is it? A snake, sir. A what? Cook insists that there's a snake curled up in the telephone wire. Oh, that's ridiculous, Parker. Cook says it's there, Mr. Moresby. They do get into the house sometimes. Well, tell Cook she's seeing things. Tell her to stop nipping at the cooking sherry and she'll soon stop seeing snakes. Yes, sir. What was that? I would guess it was Cook, sir. Oh, for heaven's sake, go down and see to it, Parker. I'll try, sir. But I'm not very good with snakes, sir. Well, what do you think I am, an expert? <laughs> but that wasn't the end of it. Ten minutes later, Parker was back upstairs saying that the snake had left the kitchen and run into the living room. No, I, I suppose snakes don't run, they slither. It slithered into the living room and was now embracing still another telephone wire obviously mistaking it for a long-lost love. But then, another, another unsettling thought came into my mind. What if the, what if the snake... No, no, that, that was ridiculous. Hello? Hi, is this Mr. Moresby? Yes, who's this? Rachel, from the club. Oh, oh, yes, Rachel, what is it? Listen, could you make it six instead of six thirty? I'll try to sneak out a little early. Yes, fine. I'll be there as soon as I can. In the Jaguar, right? Yes, yes, in the Jaguar. Listen, the reason I want to leave earlier is because my husband always picks me up at 6 Danny. What was that? So I asked one of the girls I work with to tell him that I, I got another job someplace. He, he won't care. He likes me to earn extra money. Yes, I, I see. So, just to make the story look good, I guess you'll have to lend me a few dollars after our date. Yes, of oh, course. As it happens, I have a very full head of hair. But distressing as Rachel's telephone call was, an even more disturbing thought intruded. The snake was in the telephone wire. What if the snake had been trying to listen in on the extension phone? I, I, I knew the idea was absurd, but I, I couldn't help a superstitious shiver of dread. In fact, I was so troubled that I... I decided to forego my date with Rachel, the waitress. It, 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 it wouldn't matter anyway. She, she'd be angry at some man at the club with a cute, bald head. The next day, I, I did the only thing that really relaxed me. I went to the beach. It proved to be an excellent idea. I stretched out on the golden sand and let the sun warm me. I listened to the waves beating against the shore. I listened to the haunting cries of seagulls circling overhead. Suddenly I was aware that the gulls which had been hovering over the water were now hovering over me. Now, instead of their cries being sad and plaintive, now they, now they seemed menacing. I, I stood up hastily, but the gulls seemed to be increasing in number. I saw their sharp, pointed beaks, their raking claws. They were predators, of course. How many times had I seen them swoop into a dive and snatch up some poor fish out of the sea? And there was one seagull in particular. Its beady eyes seemed to be staring at me. No, it, it, it was my imagination, of course. I, I, I wasn't a fish. I was a man. But just the same, I, I, I found myself found myself running down the beach. Running. Running for dear life. 
And that's... That's where... Where I knew it was time to see a doctor. Yes, Mr. Morsby. I'm very pleased that you honored the temple with your presence. I'm grateful that you're willing to see me, Dr. Singh. I realize that, well, you... You've had a disappointment. A disappointment? I'm afraid I don't understand. I know my wife made certain promises to you concerning her will. I believe she mentioned some modest donation. She wasn't in her right mind, of course. I mean, when she took those sleeping pills. Yes, it was very sad. I trust that she has found the peace and happiness that she sought. Frankly, that's that's what I wanted to talk to you about. I, I mean, about... About whether you really believe that my wife is... Well, that, that she's some kind of animal right now. But of course I believe it, Mr. Morsby. I don't merely believe. I'm positive. When your wife passed from this world into the next, her soul made its escape. Yes, yes, I, I know how it goes. But, but what I'd really like your opinion about is... What, what sort of animal do you think she might be now? I told you, Mr. Morsby, we have no way of knowing. But can't you take a guess? I, I mean, you said it it might be influenced by a person's karma. Am I, am I quoting you right? Yes. The kind of person she was in life may well determine the kind of animal she is now. Your wife was soft. Your wife was gentle. Your wife was independent in spirit. Now, what animal does that remind you of? I don't know. I, 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 I can't think. Then go home and think about it, Mr. Morsby. Go home and try to be one with the universe. I went home. And I tried to be one with the universe. And when that didn't work, I tried being one with a bottle of scotch. I was still in the library, asleep in the big leather chair, when I heard the noise in the cellar. I simply had to investigate. I looked into the cellar and found that one bare bulb wasn't enough for a thorough search. I found a flashlight and went down the cellar steps. At first, at first there was nothing I could see. But then, there was an empty oil can. Swiftly, my, my flashlight picked out the culprit. At first, I... I, I, I thought it would turn out to be a mouse, but instead... Instead, it was a large, white cat. I don't like cats. I never have. Skulking, cynical creatures. When the beam of my flashlight hit it, the cat froze. I saw it was an alley cat. Its, its fur shaggy, its, its eyes baleful in the light. It was fat, and yet it was bony, too. I, I said scat, but it didn't scat. Instead, it started to walk toward me. And I knew for certain what Dr. Singh had meant. I knew for certain I was looking at the reincarnation of my wife. As soon as that hideous apparition howled at me, I, I made a cowardly dash for the cellar door. Once, once I was on the other side... I remembered the hunting rifle that Una had given me for Christmas. It it stood unused in an upstairs closet. I, I I found it. I loaded it and brought it back to the cellar. I hadn't fired a rifle since boyhood. I I stood on the top of the stairs with my flashlight picked out the ghostly white form of the cat. I put down the light, raised the weapon, and squeezed the trigger. The report was deafening, but the recoil was worse. My precarious balance on the top step was lost. I fell to the bottom. I tried to get up again, but the, the pain in my right leg was agonizing. I found out later that it was broken. But the cat, the cat was still alive, and it was regarding me at at eye level now, its fur matted with plaster dust, its, its eyes filled with hatred. I tried to crawl toward my fallen rifle, 
just as I saw the creature advancing toward me, I, I screamed, Una! Oh, my hand was on the rifle now, grasping it. Too quickly in my panic, my fingers touched the trigger, the rifle went off again. Morsby ended up in the hospital, Chief, with a broken leg and a bullet in his hip. And then he died. But I think he was telling the truth. You could see it in his eyes. His silver eyes, right? Yeah, his silver eyes. And you really believe that the guy's wife came back as a cat to get her revenge? What does it matter? It's still a good story. Sorry, Prouty, I can't okay it. Well, what if I got more details? What, what, what if I talked to this Dr. Singh? If I went to the Moresby cellar and found that cat? And what would you do then? Ask her if she's Mrs. Moresby? I still think it's worth a try, Chief. <sighs> I'll tell you what, Prouty. What are you doing for lunch? I hadn't thought about it. Well, think about buying my lunch. You? There's a pretty good restaurant right around the corner where the Moresby's live. Now, we can get a bite there and then... Check out that cellar. So, uh, this is where it happened, eh? Huh? Forsby fell from these steps when he fired that rifle. Hey, you can still see the plaster dust where the bullet hit. Yeah, I see it. But I don't see any white cat. It might be hiding someplace. Or it might be a figment of his imagination. Maybe so. Hold it. Did you hear something? No. Listen. There it is. Look. Hmm. It's a cat, all right. And it looks like it just found its supper. Oh, that mouse is still alive. Yeah, but not for long. Look at the squirm. He's eating it. Yep. And there goes your mouse. Oh, my God. What's the matter, Prouty? Never see a cat eat a mouse before? Chief, did you see that mouse? Sure, I saw it. But didn't you notice something? Like what? Its eyes. Chief, did you ever see a mouse with eyes like that? They were so pale blue, they were almost silver. And so the cat and mouse game comes to an end. But according to Dr. Singh... There is no end. Perhaps Richard Moresby will have his turn next in another afterlife. I'll be back in a few moments. Do you believe in reincarnation? Do you believe the dead return? We have to believe it. Because here we are. The reincarnation of radio drama. We hope you'll keep us alive by listening again to the Radio Mystery Theater. Our cast included Patrick O'Neill, Marion Seldes, Nick Pryor, and Dan Ocko. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. The Bullet was written especially for the CBS Radio Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Larry Haynes. I shall be back shortly with Act One. It's a quiet little bar, Patty Noonan's, and Jerry Price stops there every evening on his way home from work. He's not looking for anything special in the way of atmosphere, adventure, companionship, and he has no intention of getting drunk. Just a couple of beers, perhaps, to bridge a busy day, to ease the fatigue, the strain on his nerves. In the comfortable half-light of Patty Noonan's, the world outside becomes vague, distant. Especially when old man O'Rourke is holding forth. And he lay there, his head against the barricades, and the blood from him fallen soft upon the pavements. I looked in his face, and I could see his death was upon him. "'Tis a bitter thing, I said, to die at seventeen. And for a moment his darkening eyes held mine. And with his last strength he said, 
Tis a sweet thing to die for Ireland. Sweet indeed, Mr. O'Rourke. Any calls for one on the house? I thank you, Paddy Noonan. Ah, I see, uh, Jerry Price. Excuse me. Good evening, Jerry. Hi. I didn't notice you come in. Well, when old man O'Rourke's in form, you don't see anybody, Paddy. The old man there, he carries his war. I know I carry mine. You ever think of yours, Jerry? No, no, never. Never? No. The day I came home from Vietnam, I put away the uniform. I also put away everything that went with it. The army, the war, like a snake sheds his skin. Now oh, the past is gone, Patty. It's dead, so you forget it. You go on to other things. Hey, what's everybody drinking? This round's on me. Set him up, Patty. Mr. Edward Clark himself. <laughs> and what's the occasion? Hey, I got a little announcement. Guess what the old lady tells me this morning. <laughs> Number 10 is on its way. Oh, is that event? The round must be on the house, Mr. Clark. Oh, just a quick one, Patty. Hey, I got the truck outside. What are you hoping for this time, Ed, boy or girl? Let's see. What do I got now? Uh, four boys and five... No. No, no, I, I got five boys and four... Ah, who can keep them straight? All I know is I'm always tripping over somebody. Yeah. Ten kids in 12 years. Well, you can't tell me it isn't exciting to hear there's going to be a new baby. Oh, yeah, yeah. I know it's going to be a kid that'll wet its pants and keep me up half the night. It's another mouth I got to feed. Yeah, well, guys, I, I got to ride. Uh, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> you know, Penny, it's funny. People who don't want kids, can't stand kids, can't afford them, can't raise them, they can't help getting kids. Whereas, oh, well, <clears throat> guess there just isn't any justice in this world. Well, there may be no justice, Jerry, but there's always hope. How long have you been married? Hmm? Right after I got out of the Army, it'll be uh, nine years. A fellow used to come in here, and they were married 15 years before they had their first. Gee, am I really out of the Army nine years? Tell me, Patty, you're an old philosopher. Where does it go, huh? Down the hatch and try another. Yeah, don't mind if I do. Oh, wait on the paying customer first. Where? The fellow standing at the end of the bar. What are you saying, Jerry? There's nobody standing at the end in, of the... In the brown hat and the raincoat. Now, Jerry, what do you say? I know. That's... Tell me, what's the matter, Jerry? Paul. Jerry, listen to me. There's no Paul. way. Paul. Hey, he was just standing here. Where, where'd he go? Where is he? Jerry, where is who? Are you all right, Jerry? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm all right. But I, I saw him. Who? Oh, a uh, guy I was in the army with. Uh, the two of you. Were you close? He was my buddy. Well, when was the last time you saw him in, in person? The night he was killed. Have you... Have you ever seen him again? Like you thought you did just now? No. No, this is the first time. Well, maybe you need a rest, Jerry. Hattie, why now? Why tonight, after all these years? Well, you say you saw him last the night he died in battle. Well, the sight of him dead must have stayed with you always. But that's not how I just saw him, Paddy. He wasn't in uniform. He was in civilian clothes. You might have pictured him as he looked at a happier time. I never saw him in civilian clothes. We met in the army. And, Paddy, I... I didn't see him as he was then. We were both kids, about 20. I saw him the way he'd look today, about 30. His face was more mature. Jerry... Are you sure he's dead? He is dead, Patty. I just saw him. I know I saw him. Jerry, it's after midnight. Oh, I'm uh, not finished, honey. I uh, have to clean up these reports, Marge. Honey, a new rule has just been passed in this house. All paperwork shall be done in the daytime. Marge, I have to call on customers. Be reasonable, huh? Am I the kind of wife who makes idle criticism? No, indeed. Constructive suggestions, that's my motto. Northeast distributors can solve all your paperwork problems by hiring a girl. Honey, I'm lucky to have the job. No, Jerry. You're not lucky. They're lucky. Well, everybody knows you're a terrific salesman. Wait, you could get another job tomorrow. More money, less headache. Honey, I couldn't walk out on Joe Keller. Why not? Well, I'll never forget what that man did for me. 
I came home from the army, a kid with no experience. I needed a job. He took a chance with me. Now he needs me. Oh. Well, I'm, I'm just worried about you, Jerry. You look so tired all the time. No, I'm in great shape. Will you go see Doc Steiner? I did, today. Oh, well, it's about time. You needed a checkup. Well, I, uh... I didn't just go for the checkup, honey. I, uh... I went for the, uh, for the other thing. Oh, Jerry. Well, he said some people, men, well, they're okay in every way, but it just doesn't work out for them. Jerry, it's all right. No, 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 honey. It's all my fault. Oh, honey. It, it's, well, it's just unlikely there can ever be any kids. He said unlikely. What he meant was impossible. We've got each other? Yeah. For me, you didn't want a child so badly. Now we'll definitely think about adopting, okay? Yeah, okay. Sometimes that works out even better. Come on, honey, let, let me see you smile. <laughs> Marge, 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 I don't know what I'd do without you. <laughs> oh, that makes us even. I don't know what I'd do without you. Come on, get to bed. Yeah, I'll uh, just have a cigarette, huh? Why don't you turn on the music? To make sure you don't try to sneak in some work. I know you can't concentrate with the music going. I'll just be a couple of minutes, honey. Halt! Let's hear that password. Paul, is that you? Jerry! Hey, climb down the hole make yourself at home. I'm so beat, I can't even remember the password. That's all right. I don't even know what it is. I got a cigarette? What'd they want back at the CP, Jerry? A patrol. You going? Yep. But you went out yesterday. Well, maybe I better write to my congressman, huh? I don't have any more cigarettes. Here, finish this one. Paul. Paul, I don't know if I can go out again. We're being relieved tomorrow. We were promised a rest. I just don't know if I can go out again. But you ain't going out, Jerry. Didn't you hear... I'm gone. Oh, no, no. I'll say you and I made a trip. No, Paul. I can't let some other guy but do... But I'm not some other guy. I'm your buddy. What's the matter, Jerry? You never did it to me? Can I have a drag on that butt, Jerry? Paul. Paul, you're alive. I'm alive, Jerry. I'm here with you. In your living room. No, you can't be here. I went out afterward. I found your body. I carried it back. Maybe it wasn't you. It was me. But you were dead. You were killed. Yes, Jerry. I was killed. Jerry, will you turn that radio off and come to bed? Marge, he's here. Who's here? Can't you see him? Jerry, I don't see anyone. Paul, why can't she see you? She will. They all will. When? Later. I have to go now, Jerry. No, no, Paul. Paul, tell her. Jerry. She'll think I'm crazy, Paul. Paul. He's gone, Marge. He's gone. Jerry. Honey, what, what's going on here? Marge, he, he, he was here. He was right Ooh. here. Now, you've got to believe that. I'm not drunk, and I'm not crazy. I, I, I believe you. I believe you, Jerry. Now, here, uh, just, just sit down. Now, don't do anything. Don't say anything. <laughs> calling. But can a doctor help what ails Jerry? And now, act two of the bullet. Let us trace the path of the bullet. We have a worried Marge, a concerned Dr. Steiner, and a distracted Jerry. Tell me about this man, uh... Paul, you called in Jerry. I said we were buddies, Doctor. That tells it all. Jerry, please don't be so hostile. Dr. Steiner's only trying to help. You were buddies. You came back alive and he didn't. Yo. There's an extensive medical literature on the subject. Oh, I'm sure there is. Jerry. I'm not being hostile, Marge. I know I saw him. Of course you saw him. Well, finally. But that doesn't mean he was there. You see, Jerry, 
The death of a wartime comrade remains an eternal reproach. All who survive are sentenced forever to feelings of guilt. No, no, no. Doctor, the wars are fought by kids in foxholes. The literature is written by doctors and authors. That's hardly fair, Jerry. I'm the authority on war, Doctor, because I was a kid in a foxhole. And I don't feel guilty about... about my buddy. You don't? No. Tell me why. Oh, you wouldn't believe it. Try me. All right. You see, there's a bullet. And it's designed especially for you. And if it's your bullet, it'll find you no matter where you are. You can't evade it. You can't avoid it. It was meant for you. It was meant to be. You and the bullet. Both of you were dust originally. You were dust because the Bible says so. And the bullet was also just dust in the ground. Well, that bullet was mined and refined and cast into metal. It was shaped into a slug and joined with a shell. It was one of billions of bullets, but it was yours. All yours. And at the right time... At the right time, there'd be a tremendous explosion of gases in a narrow chamber. And the bullet would be torn loose from the shell case and spun around the grooves of a gun barrel and hurled through space. This is the bullet you don't hear. You don't hear it, Doctor. You don't hear it whine past your ear or ping off a rock or thwack against a tree. That's because it's your very own bullet. It's coming to meet you, or you're going to meet it. It's been arranged. You see? It's an appointment that can never be broken. The dust that had become the bullet would encounter the dust that had become you. And after a while, after a while, both of you would become dust once again and, and return to the ground, your original home. Jerry, I know you're overworked, you're overwrought, you're overtired. I keep telling him to slow down. Okay, okay, I know I'm under a strain. I know I'm working too hard, but what can I do? Jerry, try to understand. Right now, you're having what is popularly known as a nervous breakdown. This alleged visitor from another world. I say he's an illusion. I say you have subconscious feelings about him which you're not aware of. And I say they burst through because of heavy pressure on your nervous system. Yeah, I knew you'd say that. Prove me wrong. How? Go away. Get out from under. Rest a while. Relax. Oh, honey, this looks like a good spot. You want to stop here and try for some fish? Well, Marge, uh, I think I'd like to go back and play nine holes this afternoon. Great. I need more practice with my iron. Uh, honey, honey, you know, uh, you, you've been getting a lot of sun. Maybe you better take it easy for a few hours, huh? And besides, you have an appointment with, um, oh, what's that name? Uh, Biscayne Appliances. <laughs> See, Jerry, I wasn't sleeping when you called that number this morning. No, Marge, I've been good all month. I was just getting restless, that's all. Look, they're a big chain down here. If I can open them up, I'll justify the trip. Justify? To whom? Why Why do you have to justify anything? Isn't your health important enough? Honey, Joe Keller was very nice about it. Joe Keller had no choice. Marge. Honey, Steiner was right. I was beat. I, I don't know how I managed to drag myself along. So I did, I did the right thing. I chucked it all. Now I'm fit, see? I, I never felt better in my life, and I'm raring to go. Great. In a month or two, we may think about going back. I'm, I'm not used to being idle, mm, honey. Neither am I. But I am learning to love it. <laughs> oh, boy. Why didn't I meet you when I was young? <laughs> young? Jerry, you weren't even 21. Well, I was already made when we met. I had already become what I was going to be. You know, I've got a certain amount of ability. Mm, a tremendous amount, Jerry. But I'm not confident, honey. I doubt myself. I, I guess I didn't have very much encouragement when I was a kid. You know, my brother was a great athlete. My sister was a great beauty. I, I was kind of clumsy and funny looking. Anyway, Frank and Alice were sent to college. When my turn came, the money had run out. Or well, maybe they thought I wasn't worth the effort. That's why I... Enlisted when I was 18. I had to get away from the house and my father. There was no place else to go. You never told me this, honey. I decided if I ever had a kid, I'd never make jokes at his expense or tear him down in any way. I know how these things cut inside where it doesn't show. I would do everything to build him up and give him confidence. 
I, I will never, never have any real confidence, Marge. Oh, yes, you will. No, no, no baby. You, you won't get it from a pep talk. I think we can go back home now, Marge. Mm. All right, on one condition. You'll just have to slow down. Mm -hmm. I promise. And, honey, there's only one way you can really slow down. And that's to get a partnership from Joe Kelly. Now, Marge. Don't you deserve of it? Of course I do. Well, we're, we're going to adopt a child. Which means I'll, I'll quit my job and you're not going to spend time on the road. That kid will need both of us, won't he? Yes. Yes, honey, he will. Then we need that partnership. Don't we? Jerry! Jerry, baby! <laughs> you look like a million bucks. Less 2% for cash, of course. Yeah, Joe. Oh, hold it, hold it. Ramona, no calls. I'm in a meeting. I can't be disturbed. Well, anyhow, Joe, hello. I want you to take it easy for a while, you hear? Yeah, I'm ready for action, Joe. Oh, you think you're ready. Now, listen. I know you had a lot of expenses. I want you to take this little check. It's only 500 I'm strapped for cash this week. I had to pop for a whole new computer setup. But anyway, I decided to increase your bonus to 5%. That'll amount to a pretty sweet raise, huh? Now, Joe... Don't, 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 don't thank me, kid. You're entitled to it. we got to make sure you don't get sick again. Joe, I have to talk with you. Well, sure, kid. What about? Well, it's, uh... Personal and important. Well, let me buy you lunch. Well, Jerry, what are we going to talk about? I'm fresh out of polite conversation. Joe. Joe, I want a partnership. No, you don't, Jerry. But Joe... No, 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 don't interrupt. You don't want one. You'd like one. Two different things. Now, don't nitpick, Joe. You'd like a partnership, which means it would be swell. Great if you had it. But want is something else. It means lack. It means need. I know you'd like to own a business, but you're not cut out to be an owner. Why? Because an owner is an officer. And in your heart, you'd always be an enlisted man. Tommy, could you ever fire a guy because you could get someone else cheaper? If an old customer, a good friend, was getting slow-paying bills, could you cut him off? Thousands of guys like you go bankrupt every year. You're nice, sweet, big-hearted. But you don't have the guts business needs. Well, I'd like to remind you of the volume I sell. I know it's to the penny, Jerry, and you're well paid for it. Well, I'm worth more now. You are. You got a sweet raise this morning. Joe, Joe, don't, don't think I'm not grateful. You gave me my first break. But I think I can do better elsewhere. Where? Anywhere. Consolidated. Freeman and Singer. Should I go down the list? Oh, they'd love to have you, Jerry. What do they pay? They handle the nationally advertised brands. What did you be there? Glorified order taken? They don't need your full selling ability, so they don't have to pay you full price for it. Sure, with me, you push out all the schlock. It's rough. But you get top dollar. There's 20 outfits like mine. They grab you tomorrow. But where's the improvement? They won't pay you more. At least here, you got nine years equity in a pension plan. You and me are used to each other. Besides, I really like you. Yeah. Sometimes I feel like a father to you, Jerry. <laughs> a fiasco, Patty, a fiasco. And how do I break it to Marge? Oh, what's it all about, Jerry? Well, at least I don't have to put up with Ed Clark tonight. I think I'd punch him right in the mouth. We'll be deprived of his wonderful company the next two weeks. He's tooling that trailer into the southwest. Hello, Jerry. What? Patty. Patty, is someone standing behind me? No, Jerry. Oh, will you tell me why? I'll tell you everything, Jerry. When? So, I think maybe tonight. Paul, why do you keep popping in like this? I don't know, buddy. I can't control that. Yeah, but Paul. 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 Patty, don't you see anyone? No, Jerry. Hey, you didn't hear anyone talking to me either. No. 
Patty, Patty, do you think I'm crazy? Well, maybe you should see a doctor. I saw a doctor. Well, how about one of them uh, psychiatrist fellas? I never even told my wife. I did see a psychiatrist. But after a while, I figured, why pay him 50 bucks an hour when I can come in here and talk to you for nothing? Well, there must be more to them fellas than that. Oh, sure. He said that the roots of my problem go back to my unhappy childhood. But, Patty, I have a brother, Frank, who feels terribly insecure. He goes to a psychiatrist, too. Why? He had a happy childhood. Well, put it this way. If you see someone, and I don't, the flaw can be in me and not in you. Drink? No. No. I better go home and face the music. Jerry? What? Oh. Let's go someplace and talk. Where? Let's go to the parking lot. Sit in your car. It's cold. That won't bother you, will it? Not yet. Turn the heater on for yourself. When will everyone else be able to see you, Paul? In two weeks. Oh, that's great. No, it ain't. Why not? Because you'll be dead. Because you'll be dead. Cold words from a warm friend. The chill inside the car becomes intense. But Jerry knows there's no point in turning on the heater. We'll rejoin these two friends when I... And now we return to the final act of The Bullet. And a reunion of two war buddies who haven't seen each other in almost nine years. Jerry Price, who is alive, and Paul Gardner, who is dead. The heater in this car doesn't do much good. You're shivering. Why am I going to be dead, Paul? Remember the night I went out on the patrol? Yeah, I'll remember that night as long as I live. I completed my job. I was headed back. And then I felt something smash against my head. And I knew... I knew I just met the bullet. You know, the bullet we used to talk about? I bet you don't remember. No, I remember. I remember. I felt it slam into me. And then I didn't know anything anymore. Yeah, well, when the guys told me, I went out to get you, Paul. Yeah, I might have known you would. One minute, I was moving through a rice paddy. And the next minute, I'm, I'm sitting in an office. And I knew a lot of time had gone by. Don't, don't ask me how. I, I knew, that's all. A man was talking to me. What, uh, what kind of man? You know the type that's a clerk in the government or a big corporation, fussy, self-important. Everything's got to be in the right place. He doesn't even look at me. He's got a piece of paper. He says, Paul Gardner, you're going back. You should not have died that night. The computation was for you to survive. The plan was for you to marry a girl named Marjorie Stone. I married Marjorie Stone? Yeah. I told the guy, I want no part of it. And he gives me a look, this clerk does. Like he couldn't care less about me or you or anybody else. And he says, come with me. He leads me to a door. It opens. And all I can hear is a hum and a clicking. And all I can see is a computer. I mean, there's no end to the thing. That's all you can see is computer. And he says, there it is, friend. City Hall. Go fight it. <laughs> By this time, I'm shaking. That machine scared the pants off me. You couldn't see the top nor the bottom of it. There was no end to it. Just machine, wherever the eye could see. Well, uh, then what happened? This clerk, he tells me there's a plan. A capital P plan. It calls for me to come home, not you. Yeah, well, may maybe that's fair, Paul. You you were always the better man. No, you got more on the ball. You never got a break, that's all. I had a chance to go to school, become somebody. 
I could have gone into the old man's business, become the biggest hardware dealer in Atlanta. You and me. We both run away to join the army. You because you had nothing. Me because I had everything. But why are you coming back? Because Marge and I are supposed to have a boy. A certain kind of a boy. He'll grow up, I don't know, discover something, create something, or be somebody the world needs real bad. They wouldn't tell me what. Anyhow, 40, 50 years from now, he has to be here. And of all the millions of men and women, he could only be born to me and Marge. When? When uh, am I leaving? I told you. In two weeks. How? Nine o'clock at night. A trailer truck will go past Patty Noonan's saloon. Just as... You're crossing the street. Well, why does it have to be like that? Because... You don't know how careful these things are figured. You could get killed a million ways. But the plan calls for a truck... driven by a guy named Ed Clark. Oh, yeah, I know Ed Clark. He doesn't have a good record. So it'll be easy to prove he's a careless driver. He works for a big outfit, so Marge will have a good settlement. But why? I still don't understand. She'll need the money. You see, I won't be a good father. Not as good as you, for sure. Oh, I'll love the kid. I'll love Marge, but I won't be there a lot. You know me. I have to keep moving. But if you know how important it is for the kid... I won't know. Once I'm alive, I won't remember any of this. Now, you say it's all figured out. Maybe not. The human element. How, how can the machine predict Marge would go for you, huh? With all due respect, Jerry... Did I ever have any trouble landing any dame I had my sights on? Well, with all due respect, I can't see Marge falling for your line of chatter. She will, Jerry. I'll be there when she's having a bad time. She'll be all alone. She'll need somebody. Things will take their natural course. Sure, she'll see through my line, but after a while she'll get to like it. I'm different. You're quiet. I raise hell. You let things... Eat at your insides, not me. I pop off. Maybe my way's no better in the long run. And she's married to you. And she loves you. But deep in her heart, she loves my way better. She'll fall in love with me. Jerry, you have to believe I don't want to do this. But it was your bullet, not mine. thinking about? Oh, a guy downstate wants to cancel a carload of refrigerators, so I'm uh, figuring an approach. Didn't we agree to we'll no. work at home? Yeah, well, honey, this is just uh, thinking. Did you talk to Joe Keller about the partnership? Yeah. And? He said no. Did you give him notice? No, he gave me a raise. Oh, okay. Marge. Why don't you mix us a drink? Honey, aren't you going to say anything? Mm-hmm. Don't put in too much ice. Marge, please, you don't understand. I understand. I married a certain kind of man. And you're stuck with him? No. I'll stick by him. Because I love him. Would you have wanted a guy who'd barge into Joe Keller's office and say, Joe, either give me half the joint or I'll open up across the street and run you out of business? Oh, come on, Answer Jerry. me, Marge. I have to know. Well, maybe I did. Why didn't you marry him? He never showed up. So you settled for me. That's what's known as falling in love. Come on, honey, take me to the movies. No, no, I, I don't want to take you to the movies. Let's go downtown and see a play. But that's a lot of money. Are you going to worry about money? Now, and look, this weekend, would you like to fly out to, uh, say, Snow Valley and Snow. ski? Yeah, or how about Las Vegas, huh? <gasps> Jerry, what's gotten into you? Honey, we're going to have two weeks of the most fantastic... Why, fun. why two weeks? Oh, what, what's so special? You... Me. I just want to spend the rest of my life having a ball with you. Well, hello, stranger. I haven't seen you. Why, it must be weeks. Where have you been? Oh, uh, giving Marge a good time. Well, I must say, it's done wonders for you. You look so calm. Do I? Do you ever see the little guy who wasn't there? Uh, no. 
Well, that's good. Let's drink to it. Uh, Jerry, if I'm not being forward, what did he want from you? You wouldn't believe it, Patty. Do you believe it? Well, I uh, just dropped in to say hello, Patty, and goodbye. Jerry. Yup. Something's the matter with you. Well, I, uh, I understand Ed Clark is due back here tonight. I don't want to run into him. I just don't want to talk to him. Well, if that's how you feel, I'll buy him from the joint. Now, Jerry, something's wrong with you. No, 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 nothing, Pat. Now, look, I'm an old soldier, Jerry. I can tell. No, it's really nothing. Really, is it? No, Jerry, you got a look on your face. What kind of look? I've seen it before in the war. I've seen it on men who go out on the impossible mission. The look of men who know they're not coming back. The resigned look. What are you resigned to, Jerry? You have a vivid imagination. I have an imagination. Jerry, whatever it is, don't be resigned to it. Fight it. You can't fight city. Life. I knew it. You're in a fight, Jerry. Well, you can fight anybody. You're an ex-combat soldier. And you weren't afraid of anything. When you were out there, you faced up to death, hunger, despair. What happened to you, Jerry? Where did you lose it? Face up to it now. Whoever he is, bit in his eye. Patty, I can't do anything. Jerry, I'm going to throw you out of here for your own good. Now leave, leave town. Go far away for a while. Fight it, Jerry, fight it. Patty, Patty, wherever I go. Listen to old Patty, just take off. Don't you see there's a plan? Who cares? Put up a fight. Why are you so upset, Patty, huh? I don't know. But listen to me. Fight now. Now get out of here. It's Jerry. I decided to fight it. Good boy, Jerry. You know, Patty, there's something about your place. I don't know how to say it, but I feel stronger, better, away from it. Well, I don't mind. So I'm going to fight. What have I got to lose, huh? Why, why should I do what he tells me? Why should I believe him? I don't know what it is, but I agree. I'll see you around, Patty. Universal Airlines, flight number three for Los Angeles and Mexico City, now boarding at 817. Who are you calling, Jerry? Marge, I have to tell him. Oh. Jerry, don't do it this way. There'll be a hundred other people on that plane. Do it the way it has to be done. Paul, I have to fight you. Why? Because it isn't fair. Was it fair for me to stop your bullet? Come on, Jerry. Ed Clark will be tooling by Patty's in less than an hour. Paul, I, I don't know if I have the nerve. I'll help you, buddy. I'll help you. I called you, and I hope it wasn't out of turn, Mrs. Price. It's about Jerry. What about Jerry? He's sitting back there in a the booth. Now, wait. Don't go to him yet. He's in trouble. Well, it can't be. We, we've had such a glorious two weeks. He's in trouble. Well, what kind of trouble? I don't know. We have to help him somehow. Is it that buddy? I think so. Well... The time has come to lay that nonsense to rest once and for all. And I'm going to... That won't work. Agree with him. Show him anything he wants is okay with you. Don't fight him. Or we can give him his love. Hi, honey. Hi. Buy me a drink? Oh, sure. You know, I, I never knew you had those little gold highlights in your hair. Oh, I'm using a different bottle this week. I love you. I love you, too. And I want you to be with me always. Come on, Jerry. Let's start. No, not yet. Are you talking to me? The plan calls for it. How do I know there is a plan? Ask anybody. Ask Marge. Jerry, what are you talking about? Marge. Marge, do you believe there's a plan that determines the actions of everybody in the whole world? No. You sure? I'm sure. Well, then how do you think things work out? Well, Every which way. Come on, Jerry. It's time. No, no, I won't go. Where won't you go? Then, Marge, as far as you're concerned, there isn't any plan. Oh, well, well, I 
Well, what do you think, Jerry? No, that's not important. What do you think? Well, uh, yes. Yes, there is a plan. I, I can prove it. You can? Yes, but you started me thinking there has to be a plan. Otherwise, you and, and I, we just never would have met. Remember that day? Yeah, yeah. You, you were taking cash at Ryman's Drugstore. That's the only reason I walked in there. <sighs> well, I'd already given notice I was going to leave. And then you walked in and asked Doc if you could open a charge. Then and there, I decided to stay. And where? Where were you going? Oh, away. Pull up stakes. Why? Well, my folks were gone. My friends were married. The neighborhood had changed. The girl I went to school with had a father, a construction engineer. He'd been transferred. Well, she took a job in his new office, and she wrote and said she found a nice crowd. They needed secretaries down there. She could fix it up. Well, why not? I was set to go. But it was not to be. You came wandering into Ryman's. Obviously, there's a master plan that rules our lives. And, and where was this wonderful place you almost went to? Atlanta. Atlanta? Oh, what's so remarkable about that, Jerry? It, it was definite you were going. Oh, well, sure. And only because I... Only because you met me. Only because I met you. Otherwise, I'd have gone to Atlanta and married a southern millionaire. But evidently, something had been planned for me. Aren't you flattered? I met you. And it changed my whole life. Are you ready to go now, Jerry? Boys, will you come with me? Yes, Jerry. Where do you want to go? Why, well, I, I have to do something. I'll come with you. No, no, wait here, darling, please. It's time, buddy. Just like going out on a patrol. Jerry, where are you going? That's all right, Patty. It's all right. I didn't want this, buddy. I know, I know. I don't want you to take my bullet either. Goodbye, Jerry. Yeah, goodbye, Paul. Take care of her for me, huh? You know I will. Throw this coat over you. She's gonna fade. It's all right. I've got her. We'll bring her into that bar where it's warm. Give her a little stimulant. It's all right. Everything will be all right. Everything will be. It'll be all right. So many people preface what they believe with, "It is written." It is written in the stars. It is written on the wind. And for so many like Jerry, it is written on the bullet. I'll be back shortly. I remember an old soldier once told me he wasn't worried about the bullet that had his name on it. What really bothered him was the bullet marked to whom it may concern. Our concern is mystery, excitement, suspense, thrills and chills. Our cast included Larry Haynes, E.V. Juster, Martin Newman, Ralph Bell, Leon Janney, and Danny Ako. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Welcome to the world of mystery, to the world of terrifying imagination. The story you are about to hear is called Lost Dog. Yes, a dog story. But please don't expect a charming family tale about man's best friend. In fact, you may even decide that the dog in this story is man's worst enemy. It all depends on whether or not you share the particular terror of our heroine. 
Miss Julia Smollett. Get him out! Get out of here, please! Please, George, take him away! Give me a job for Pete's sake, Miss Nixon, I hate you! Get him out! mystery drama, Lost Dog, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Henry Flesser and stars Kim Hunter. It is sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll return shortly with Act One. story begins in the quiet parlor of a small suburban house at the end of Elm Street. Well, uh, not completely quiet, since young Ronnie Hughes is once again practicing his scales under the gentle, watchful eyes of his piano teacher, Mrs. Julia Smollett. Well, that was very good, Ronnie. It was much better than last time. I still wish we could skip this scale stuff, Mrs. Smollett. I mean, I'm not saying that I'm ready to play concertos yet, but just the same. Why does it bother you so much, Ronnie? Well, playing scales makes me feel like a little kid, I guess. <laughs> oh, that's silly. All the finest pianists had to learn their scales before they could play any composition. Well, I guess it's my fault for starting to learn to play so late in life. I... Ronnie, 19 years old isn't very late in life. I'm 20, Mrs. Smollett. Are you? Already? Oh, no. That doesn't tell me you've been coming here a full year. No. Just about four months. But my birthday was last week. It was on Thursday. You weren't well last Thursday. Oh. Uh, yes, that's right. You... You still don't look well. Um, listen, why don't we see how well you know the chromatics? Your cheek, it's swollen. It's still swollen. Does it hurt? Uh, no, 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 it doesn't hurt at all. It was, it was silly of me to stumble and fall that way. I uh, know that your husband hit you, Mrs. Smollett. Now, that's a very silly thing to say. You can't tell me it isn't the truth. I remember the first time he did it. At least the first time I knew anything about it. Now, I'm going to have to put a stop to this. Yes. I wish you would. I wish you'd call the police or something the next time it happens. Now, listen to me, young man. You've been listening to a lot of foolish town gossip. Then tell me it isn't true. What I'm telling you is that it isn't any of your business. Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess that's right. It's none of my business. I, I should never open my big mouth. I'll, I'll just keep it shut from now on. Ronnie. Yeah? All right. All right, my husband and I had a quarrel. He was drunk, wasn't he? George is in a very difficult occupation. The competition is very keen, and, well, the people he has to deal with aren't always very gentle. I don't know anything about the trucking business, Mrs. Smollett. I just hate the idea of anybody hurting you. That's all. I, I just can't understand why he'd do such a thing. What did you do to him? Well, if you must know, Ronnie, I, I won't allow him to have a dog. You what? <laughs> it sounds silly, doesn't it? And you're right, it is. It's silly on my part. But I, I'm absolutely terrified of dogs. And unfortunately, my husband wants one. He wants one very much. And that's why he hit you? Well, the argument goes back a very long way. It's almost, almost since George and I were married seven years ago. Well, it, it wasn't much of a problem when we lived in the city. George didn't have his trucking company then. He was just a driver. But when he got the chance to buy into a firm out here, well, we bought this house. And I guess having a house in the country made George think about dogs and things. But I just don't see what's so important about it. Well, some things become important in marriage. Oh, now, just look what all this talk has done to the time. It's after 630 my husband's going to be home in half an hour, and I haven't even started dinner. Well, he beat you for that, too? Ronnie, if you keep talking this way, well, I just don't think it would be wise to continue giving you lessons. You, you don't mean that. Uh, I'll see you on Thursday, Ronnie. Yeah. Sure. 
Goodbye, Mr. Smollett. Goodbye, Ronnie. And happy birthday, Ronnie. What else could I tell the guy? I had two semis in a repair shop. If I wanted the job, I had to use his equipment. Well, fine. Only nobody was going to hook me for a 500-buck premium. Hey, are you listening, Julia? Uh, yes. Yes, I'm listening, George. What's the matter with you tonight? I'm a little tired, I suppose. Tired? You? From what? Lifting the piano cover? Ah, you make me sick, you know that? You weren't listening to a word I said. You don't care about what happens in my business. You never cared. Well, I never understood much about it. You always talk to me as if I'm one of your associates. I know what's eating on you. Think I don't know? You're sitting there like the last judgment. You're sitting there blaming me for taking that swipe at you last week. No, you're wrong. Look at yourself. You didn't even bother putting makeup on that cheek of yours. Makeup wouldn't cover the swelling. Yeah. You want to remind me how much you suffer. Well, I got a hot flash for you, kid. The one who suffers around this house is me. I could enjoy this house plenty. I could have a great time if you weren't so sick in the head. Uh, you're talking about the dog again. Why not? You think I forgot? But surely it can't mean that much to you. I've had dogs ever since I was six years old. You never talked about it when we were living in the city. That was different. Who put a dog in that air-conditioned chicken coop? But now we've got a house. A real honest-to-God house, Julia. A house needs a dog. Oh, George. You know I feel terrible about saying no, but I can't help myself. It's just something in me. It's a phobia, I guess, but dogs terrify me. Even small dogs. Tiny, harmless little dogs. I... I go to pieces when one comes near me. That's all in your mind. Yes, but isn't that enough? No, not for me it isn't. Can't you understand that it, it's like a sickness, like a disease? Okay, so if it's like a disease, how come you never got cured? How come you never saw a doctor about it? A doctor? Yeah, that's right. You're telling me you're sick? Well, just find out. Well, where, where are you going? I'm going to get you an appointment, a doctor's appointment. I'm calling Dr. McCann right now. At this hour? I'll call him at home and make an appointment for tomorrow. We're going to settle this thing once and for all. Well, Julia, maybe, maybe I'm the wrong kind of doctor. What do you mean? Well, if you're serious about getting rid of this phobia, that would take a specialist. You mean a, a psychiatrist? Oh, some kind of head doctor. I'm sure you realize that people who are afraid of certain things, well, they've usually had something happen to them in their childhoods, some traumatic experience or other that gets stuck in their mind like a burr and won't come out. Doctor... You know we couldn't possibly afford going through analysis. George's company isn't doing that well. He'd never stand for paying all that money week after week. Well, maybe you don't need all that couch stuff. Maybe there's something else you might try. Like what? Do you ever hear of hypnotherapy? You mean getting hypnotized by someone? Not just by someone. I mean someone who can put you under and maybe help cure you of this thing. I'm not saying it always works, but it does sometimes. Oh, I, I don't know. The thought sort of frightens me. Nothing frightening about it. It might be just the way to find out why you're really afraid of dogs. One minute. Ah, what'd you do, forget your key? Yes, George, I'm sorry. Why are you burnt so late? It's almost a quarter after seven. I I went to a movie after I saw Dr. McCann. I, I was I was just so nervous. I, I had to get out of myself. So I, I went to this movie, and it lasted longer than I thought it would. Oh, that's great, just great. Now what happens to my dinner, huh? Dinner's all ready. All I have to do is heat it. That's a fine thing. I come home early to surprise you. You're not even here. I'm sorry, George. 
Oh, do, do you think you should have more to drink now? I, I mean, it won't take me more than ten minutes to get dinner on the table. Never mind how much I drink. Besides, I'm in no hurry for dinner. I want to know what the doctor said. Oh, well, it's just as I told you, George. There's nothing Dr. McCann can do for me. It's not something that can be cured with a pill. There's got to be some way. Well, he suggested that maybe a different kind of doctor, a hypnotherapist. A uh, uh, what? Someone who hypnotizes you, who tries to make you go back into your past. Yeah, it sounds like a lot of junk to me. Well, it might do some good. I, I really don't know. I'll tell you what would do some good. A little direct action. That's what you need. What are you talking about, George? The only way to learn how to swim is to jump in the water, right? Well, that's what you need, Julia. I simply can't make you understand, can well, I? Well, maybe I can make you understand. That, that, forget it. You want to get that dinner ready? I'm hungry. Yes, yes, I'm going now. Uh, look, uh, why don't you change first? Change? Yeah, yeah, your clothes. Get more comfortable. Well... Yes, I think I'd like to do that, George. I, I won't be long. George! George, there's, there's a dog on our bed. A big dog. Take it easy. That's my surprise. That's it. Tell him. Please, please, George, take him away. It's only a dog for Pete's sake. He's not going to hurt you. Get it out, George! only goes to prove that there are more terrors in this world of ours than anyone imagines. But the question in the Smollett house is, which one is the real terror? Attila the dog or George the husband? We'll learn more about both of them when we return shortly with Act Two. This is WOR New York, your station for the Mystery Theater. Turn to the plight of Mrs. Julia Smollett, the woman whose nightmares take the shape of a barking dog. How long do you want me to board the animal, Mr. Smollett? I don't know. Until that wife of mine gets her head on straight, I guess. Uh, beg your pardon? My wife doesn't like dogs. Took one look at a tiller and screamed the house down. Well, some women get scared of Dobermans. This dog's only six months old, for Pete's sake. Practically a puppy. Can you board my dog until my wife gets through with her treatment? Treatment? I don't think I understand. Just give me a straight answer. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, certainly, I uh, will take the dog for as long as you like. We'll see how long that is. Uh, please sit down, Mrs. Smollett. Uh, thank you. Uh, right here, Mr. Smollett. Uh, yeah, thanks. You both seem a little nervous. Oh, I, I'm sorry, Dr. Froelich, but I i suppose I am. <laughs> I know. Uh, Dr. McCann explained to me. He said that hypnotherapy was was an accepted kind of treatment. For some cases, yes. Not all of them. All I want to know is, will it work? Well, frankly, I don't know much about your wife or her problem. I'm not going to say I can help her get over this particular phobia until I do. Please, George, uh, let me tell the doctor about it. I can tell him in one sentence. My wife's afraid of dogs, all dogs, big ones, little ones. Falls apart when she just looks at one. No, that isn't true. I, I don't fall apart, as my husband said, unless, unless I'm close to them. Animal phobias are one of the most common types I deal with, Mrs. Smollett. And I might say that I have a great deal of success with them. But but how do you do it? I use a technique called hyperamnesia. Amnesia? Actually, it's the opposite of amnesia. After placing the subject in a trance state and making her completely willing to free herself from critical judgments about her past... Hey, wait, wait, wait a minute. I, I, I'm not following you. What we do is get the subject to remember long forgotten, very, very deeply repressed experiences. Sometimes they remember them in great detail, even though they still maintain amnesia at the conscious level. And do you see? I'm not sure I do. Do you mean you can find something in my mind that, that I don't even know is there? 
Possibly. It may take some time. We might need several visits to establish a rapport between us. But if all goes well, we should soon be able to find out if anything in your past is causing this problem. And, of course, that something will most likely concern a dog. That wasn't one of Hank's longest passes, but it was a bullet right at Joe Flax, deep in enemy territory. Joe? Three minutes left in the half. Are you home already? Yes. To try to go all the way. Well, what happened? How'd it go at Folix? It was all very strange. Oh, well, come on, let's hear it. Did he get you hypnotized or didn't he? Um, look, I just want to hang my coat up. Look, I'm missing a big game just because I want to hear. You might as well turn it on again, George, because all that Dr. Froelich did was what he called the first stages. What does that mean? I mean, well, he put me under all right. There wasn't any problem about that. Yeah, I figured that. Tell me what he said about the dog. He didn't say anything, George. Oh, well, what do you mean? Just that. He didn't start talking about my problem. That's going to have to wait until I'm more receptive. What's he trying to do? Keep stringing you along until he bleeds me dry? Those visits cost 50 bucks each, you know that? I know it's expensive, but you're the one who insisted that I go. 50 bucks a week plus kennel charges. A couple of months of that and I'll be hocking half of my trucks. Look, you tell that guy to get down to business. It's only my second visit, George. Well, we better start seeing some results on number three, understand? I'm not waiting any longer. There doesn't have to be a number three. As far as I'm concerned, we can stop right now. What are you talking about? George, I don't want to do this thing. I, I hate being put under. I hate anybody poking around in my subconscious for, for something that, that, that isn't even important to me. You mean you want to be sick? I think I'll lie down for a while. Don't you walk out on me. I'm sure you'd rather watch a football game. Oh, tell me what to do. I know. You think I'm Mr. Lowbrow. But let me tell you something, kid. You're no fairy princess anymore. Maybe that's what you used to think you were back in the old days. But the only fairy around this house is that piano student of yours. I don't like to talk to you when you're like this. That's what you always say when I'm drinking. Well, I'm not drinking now, and you better listen to what I'm saying. Oh, please, George, don't touch me. Yeah, I knew that was coming next. Don't touch. That's your favorite phrase, night and day. Don't touch, George. You're hurting me. That's the only thing you understand. The only touch that means a thing to you. Let go of me. Stop being such an, an animal. I'll show you what animals do. No, George, please, don't. Don't. I'll show you what kind of an animal I am. No, I'll show you. No, George, please don't. Please. Well, I guess that wasn't much better, was it? Uh, what? You didn't think much of the performance. Uh, I mean, it wasn't exactly Horowitz, was it? Uh, no, I, it, it was perfectly all right, Ronnie, really. But you're not all right, are you? Yes, I'm fine. You look awful. No, I, I didn't mean that. You never look awful. But you're acting so funny today. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I guess I have something on my mind. Can I take a guess? No. What you can take is the next page of this lesson. Listen, Mrs. Smoke. Look. Can I call you Julia? Oh, really, Ronnie. I know, I know. You're going to give me all that stuff about teacher-student relationship. Only I'm sick of calling you Mrs. Smolin. I, I hate it. I hate it because it's his name. Ronnie. No. You're the most important thing in my whole life. Please, you... Ronnie. I don't want you to say things like that. They're not true, and they're just making it impossible for me to teach you. You know how I feel about you. I'm sure you do. You're just too smart not to have seen it. I know that you're 20 years old. Is that why you don't want me to talk about it? 
because I'm younger than you are? It's flattering that you feel that way, Ronnie, but I know it's just a little crush you have. Boys go through that sort of thing all the time. Boys? Crush? Look, you're treating me like a kid. If you ask me, that's why you keep me on those damn scale exercises all the time, so you won't have to think that I'm any more of a man than those ten-year-old kids that you teach all the time. Uh, no, Ronnie. I know you're a man. Of course I do. Well, and if you think that, uh, treat me like one. Just once. Uh, please. Please. Let me... Let me kiss you, Julia. Just once. Uh, uh, Ronnie. Please, Julia. Uh, uh, what is it? What, what's the matter? Uh, it's nothing. It, it, I, I just bruised my neck a little, and, and when you touched it, it... Your neck? Yes, it, it's nothing. Is that why you're wearing a scarf today? Let me see. No, Ronnie, don't. Oh, my God. It was an... It was just an accident. Nothing but an accident. You're all bruised. Your whole neck. Look at it. I can see more bruises. Down the shoulder. What did he do to you? Oh, please, please don't talk about it. I can't bear to talk about it. You don't have to. Julia, you don't have to. But he's going to talk about it. With me. <laughs> Sit down, will you? Doesn't that bring back memories? Hey, Julia. What? That song. We used to dance to it, remember? In a girl room, first year we were married. Hey, you want a drink? No, thanks. We're drinking enough for both of us. Ah, that makes me feel good. Yes, I know. That's the thing about wives. They ought to do what their husbands do. A man needs a pal, not just a wife. I'm sorry that I'm not a pal, George. That's why I need a dog, you understand? A man's got to have a friend. Somebody who understands him, you see? You really think that dog, what's his name, would understand you? His name's Atella. Atella. That's an awful name for a dog. A frightening name. Everything scares you, even names. Oh, who the heck is that? I don't know. Hello, Mr. Smollett. Hey, what is this? Since when do you get piano lessons at night, Julia? Ronnie, what are you doing here? I didn't come for a lesson. I came to... to talk to Mr. Smollett. You want to talk to me? About what? May I please come in, sir? Yeah, yeah, sure. Come on, sonny. Ronnie, you shouldn't have come here. I won't stay long. I just want to say something. To your husband. Sure, kid. Go ahead. I wanted to say that I know what you're doing to Julia. I know how you've been hurting her. And I won't let you get away with it. What was that? Oh, Ronnie, no. Oh, no, look. Even if she doesn't want to say anything about it, I will. You touch her again. I'll go to the police. I mean that. See, there are laws in this country. I think maybe I'm hearing things. I swear, Mr. Smollett, you ever hit her once more, you're going to go to jail. So I'm going to jail her, and you're going to put me there. Riley, I begged you not to do this. No, 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 no. It's okay, Julie. I like hearing this. I mean, I want to know what the younger generation is thinking. You don't want me to hit my wife anymore. Is that it? That's it. You sure you know the difference between hitting and just giving little love taps? Please, Ronnie, go. Go right now. I mean, maybe you made a mistake, kid. For instance, this is a love tap. Oh, George! Now, that's a love tap, Ronnie, baby. This is... Oh! George, stop it! No! Now, you see the difference, kid? You better be sure you know the difference before you talk to the cop. George! No. Yes, it's sad to realize that all men who love dogs aren't necessarily lovable themselves. 
But obviously, George Smollett is a man who believes that brute force trains people as well as animals. He may be right in some respects, but perhaps he should be aware of the old saying that every dog has his day. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. important day has arrived in the life of Julia Smollett and her husband George because Julia is on her way to the offices of Dr. Froelich, who has promised that this is the day which may bring her back to the forgotten days of her past, perhaps to the very day when she equated the word terror with the friendly eyes and wagging tail of man's best friend. Well, this better be the payoff. That's all I've got to say. I hope you're not disappointed, George. Well, at least you're talking to me. That's the first word you've said to me in two days. I haven't had much to say. Look, the kid Ronnie's all right. I didn't mark him up. He's still as pretty as ever. That worries you, doesn't it? Nobody's got a right to walk into my own house and say those things to me. You have nothing to worry about, George. Yeah, that's what you say. Fifty bucks a visit is something to worry me. And 40 a week for the dog and a lot of other things. We've also lost a piano pupil. I suppose you realize that. Who cares about that? Ronnie paid $20 a week for his lessons, George. I won't miss it. Not as much as you'll miss your little Prince Charming. Well, what about it? About what? You're going to miss him, right? You're not going to have any shoulder to cry on, are you? I think I'd better explain exactly what I plan, Mrs. Smollett. Uh, We're going to try something called age regression. Age regression? It sounds as if you're going to make me younger. (laughs) That's almost exactly what we'll try to do. Well, if you can, Doctor, you'll have every woman in America on your doorstep. All I'm going to do is attempt to take your mind back into your own past. I'm going to see if you can relive some of your early years. You mean that I I might actually remember things from from my early childhood? I'm hoping that you'll recall one particular thing. The thing which you've been concealing from your adult self for a very long time. It's, uh, it's rather frightening, isn't it? No. No, you mustn't fear knowledge, especially self-knowledge. Now, uh, we'll just draw the window shade and we'll get started. <laughs> Smollett, would you like to come inside? Me? You mean you're all through so fast? No, 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 we're not through. But your wife is in a deep trance, and I thought you might want to be here when we begin the age regression attempt. Well, sure, if you want me in there. Hey, she looks like she's asleep. But she isn't. Hypnosis only resembles the sleep state, but it's not. Mrs. Smollett is very much awake. Yeah? Mrs. Smollett. Julia. You may open your eyes now. Ah, that's fine. Now, tell me, do you know what day it is today? Uh, yes. Wednesday. No, you're wrong. It's Friday, Julia. Is that right? Yes, Friday. No, Julia, it isn't Friday either. Do you know what day it is now? No. I don't know what day it is. In fact, right now you don't know the day or the month or even the year, Julia, do you? No. You see, Mr. Smollett, I'm purposely doing this to dislocate your wife in time. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I understand. Julia, you're going to be a child all over again. You're going to see and hear and feel everything you did since you were a baby. And you're going to tell me everything I want to know about what you see, hear, and feel. You're going to answer all my questions starting right now. You understand? Yes. Julia, you are one year old. Do you hear me? You're an infant, only one year old. Tell me what you know, Julia. Tell me... 
if you're afraid of dogs. Oh, my God. You sound like a happy baby to me, Julia. I don't think you had any fear of animals when you were a little baby. Did you? Now you're two years old, Julia. You can probably say a few words now. Are you afraid of dogs? No. No. And now you're three, Julia. You're growing up very quickly. Now you're a big three-year-old girl. And are you afraid of dogs now, Julia? No. No. I'm not afraid of Bow Wow. You're four years old now, Julia. Tell me if you're afraid of dogs now. <laughs> <laughs> It's all right to shake your head as long as you tell me, Julia. Now you're five. Five years old. What? Still not afraid of dogs? No. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. Now you're six, Julia. Six. This can go on forever. Please, Mr. Smollett. Not afraid at six, Julia? Then let's be seven years old. You're seven years old. Still not afraid, are you? Now, what about eight? You're an eight-year-old girl now. Topper. Topper. What was that? Topper. Poor Topper. What's she saying? Julia, who is Topper? Is Topper a dog? Topper's my dog. Where is Topper now, (laughs) Julia? Topper's dead. They put Topper away. Then they killed him, and it's all my fault. It's all my fault. What's your fault? What did you do, Julia? No. It's his fault. It's Bobby's fault. Who is he, Julia? Is Bobby a friend of yours? I hate him. He teases me. He teases me all the time. I'm glad I did it. I'm glad. Only, only don't kill Topper, please. Please don't kill my dog. Does all this mean something? Yes, it means a great deal, Mr. Smollett. Uh, Julia, now please listen. I, I want you to tell me all about Bobby and Topper. Bobby lives next door. He's ten. He teases me. He pulls my hair. He, he tore my dress. He put mud in my shoes and he hit, hit Topper with a rock. Mommy! Mommy! What happened, Julia? Why are you calling your mother? What's happened to Bobby? <laughs> he's killed him. He, he killed him. Who? I warned him. I told him what I would do. I told him. Was it Bobby you warned? Sick him. Sick him, Topper. Kill him. Kill him. Kill him. Oh, my God. Quiet. Hey, Julia, listen to me. I want you to explain everything to me very clearly. Did you tell your dog to hurt Bobby? Yes. Did he hurt Bobby? Did Topper kill him? No. No, he hurt Bobby. He didn't kill him. He hurt Bobby in the neck, but they killed Topper. They killed my dog. And it's my fault. It's my fault. Well, I think we found the lost dog. So, now you know, Mrs. Smollett. Now you may be able to understand. It was this one incident in your childhood, this one tragedy of your past innocence, which is responsible for your phobia. More than anything, you have a strong feeling of guilt. You blame yourself for what happened to little Bobby when, in all likelihood, you were not in any way at fault. No, Dr. Froelich. You're wrong about that part. It was my fault. I remember it all now. You probably just wished that Topper would turn on the little boy, and you saw your wish become a reality. So you accused yourself of a crime. I didn't wish it. I told Topper what to do. I hated Bobby so much I wanted him to sink his teeth in that little boy's throat. Well, 
At least you've brought it all into the light, Mrs. Smollett. And something tells me that it won't be long before you'll willingly accept the love and friendship of a dog again. Okay, I guess. That looks like a brand new car you're driving. Oh, yeah, it is. My parents gave it to me for my birthday, but, well, it took a couple of months to get it here from the factory. Well, you see, I mean, I wanted a couple of special things done to it. It's very handsome, Ronnie. I'm sure you're enjoying it. Yeah, it's great. Uh, I guess you've been shopping, huh? Ah, uh, yes, I have been. Oh, Ronnie. Maybe you'd like to come inside for a few minutes for some tea or something? Hi, uh, I'm afraid I can't right now. I mean, see, I'm supposed to pick up Lisa at her house. Lisa? Yeah, Lisa Bryant. We, uh, sort of going steady now. Uh, yes, 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 of course. Well, um, it was very nice running into you, Ronnie. Yes, it was. Uh, hey, by the way, you're looking, well, I mean... You seem real fine these days, Mrs. Smollett. Yes, Ronnie. I'm really very fine. Now I've got to go inside. It's time to feed Attila. Who? Goodbye, Ronnie. Attila! Where are you? Attila? Here, boy! Oh, where's that animal? Oh, well, I suppose he's playing in the yard or something. Oh, or maybe he's in the bedroom. I tell her. No, not in there. Oh, I see George's jacket's back from the cleaners. I hope they haven't taken all the smell out of it. <laughs> no, they couldn't do that. Nothing will ever take the smell of George out of anything. Now to find that animal. I tell her. Where are you? Good dog. Good, good boy, Attila. Now, 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 let's play our little game. See the jacket, Attila? See? Smell the jacket, go on. Go on, smell it. That's a good boy. Good boy. Now, stick him, Attila. That's it. That's it. Who said a dog has to be man's best friend? Why not woman's best friend? Especially a woman like Julia, who is just learning how really helpful a dog can be. Or rather, she's remembering how helpful. And one day soon, George Smollett will come home to a very surprising greeting from his own pet. I'll be back shortly. given you the impression that we don't love dogs. We love them very much, especially since dogs are descended from wolves. And the wolf is not only a fascinating creature, he also does something wonderful for all lovers of mystery stories. He makes this chilling sound. <laughs> Our cast included Kim Hunter, George Matthews, Robert Dryden, Gil Mack, and Mandy Patinkin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
I am E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the world of terrifying imagination. Our story deals with fate. Some call it luck. Whatever it is, it works in the strangest ways to reward us or defeat us. Fate walked into Charles Powell's life in the person of Clint Livitz. Now look, Clint, or whatever your name is, I don't like you, and I don't like your insinuations. Now, if you don't get out of my office and leave these premises immediately, I'll have you put out. You must be putting on an act, Mr. Charles Powell. Now, maybe this will jolt your memory. Three, five, four, one, oh, six, three. What? Yeah. <laughs> I thought that would do it, Charlie. I thought that might help you remember. <laughs> mystery drama No Hiding Place was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sidney Sloan and stars Larry Haynes. It is sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg Special K cereal. I'll be back shortly with Act One. And now another tale of the ball and chain at Kellogg's Special K presents Overweight on an Overnight Train. Is this seat taken? Please, sit down. Mm. You have exceptional legs. Oh. Uh, but why is one of them attached to a ball and chain? This ball and chain? It's a symbol. Funny, I would have sworn it was a ball and chain. I mean symbolic. Because carrying around a few extra pounds can be just like lugging around this ball and chain. I see. May I suggest something? Uh. Try a bowl of Special K skim milk, orange juice, and coffee. It's the Special K breakfast. Will it make me lose weight? No. Oh. You must also exercise and eat smart at every meal. I see. Do you know the Special K breakfast is less than 240 calories, 99% fat-free, and delicious? No, but if you hum a few bars... And that's another tale of the fallen chain. Your happy ending could begin with the Kellogg's Special K breakfast. That's Kellogg's Special K. Good night. Well, it's all right to tell one lie, isn't it? You can't. Then how about lying just a little bit? Not a little bit. You mean you can never lie? Never. Well, why not? Because when you tell a lie... Yeah? It gets stuck inside your heart. You mean that just one lie will make your heart dark? It makes you sad, too. Oh. Then what should you do if you tell a lie? Well, you just say I'm sorry. And then what? Then the light goes inside your heart. Oh, the light goes on? Yeah. Oh, a light doesn't really go on in your heart, does it? Yes, it does. Well, how do you know? Because, because the light in your heart will shine in your eyes. Oh. And, and then you'll be happy. Hmm. I wonder why people tell lies. I wonder why, too. From the Franciscans, with love. Everything looked right to Charles Powell that crisp September morning when he walked into his executive office at the J.P. McCready Company. And why shouldn't it? Charlie Powell was a big shot there. At 37, executive vice president of one of the largest manufacturers of heavy construction equipment in the country. And he had done it all in less than 12 years. It was a real-life Horatio Alger story even to his being engaged to J.P. McCready's daughter, Allison. How could anything go wrong? But it did. The moment he walked into his private office. Yes, Elsie? There's someone to see you. Appointment? No, sir, but he says that you'll see him. Mr. Powell, mm -hmm. maybe I'd better come in and explain. Yes, all right, come in. Sorry if I sound strange, but really, Mr. Powell, that man is kind of frightening. Frightening? Well, he just sits there and grins at me. I, I told him he didn't see people without an appointment. He said, oh, he'll see me. Just tell him it's an old friend, Clint. You know anybody by that name? Clint? Clint? No, it doesn't ring a bell. All right, send him in. I'll get rid of him. Okay. Don't say I didn't warn you. Mr. Powell will see you. Nice of you to see me, Mr. Powell. Well, I try to see everybody, Mr. Uh... Just Clint. 
I don't think you ever knew me by anything but Clint. You must remember, Mr. Powell. Well, I'm sorry, but I Come don't... Come on, give it a try. Give it a good try. Now, look here, I'm busy, and I have neither the time nor the patience. You must be putting on an act, Mr. Charles Powell. Uh, maybe this will jolt your memory. Three, five, four, one, oh, six, three. What? Yeah. <laughs> I thought that would do it, Charlie. I thought that might help you remember. Charles? Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. McCready. I guess it was daydreaming. Something bothering you, young man? Oh, no, no, no. I hope not. Here I take you to the best French restaurant in town. You pick at your food, gaze into space, send your dinner away hardly touched. Oh, did I uh, send all that good food back without eating it? You did. I uh, I uh, particularly wanted to see you alone, Charles, because uh, I have a little news for you. News? What uh, what kind of news, Mister McCready? And that's another thing. You're so damned formal with me, Mister McCready. Do you realize that in exactly five weeks you're going to be one of the family? Yes, of course I realize. How could I overlook it when Allison keeps reminding me regularly? Very well, then. Do you think it proper to call your uh, father-in-law to be Mr. McReady? If you don't start calling me John... Okay. John, it'll be. I'm, uh... I'm going to leak a little information to you. Yes? As you know, I've been, uh thinking of stepping down from the presidency of the company. Yes, well, it has been rumored, but I wish you'd reconsider. Now, sincerely, the place wouldn't be the same without you. Oh, i will still be there, Charlie. I'm not giving up my stock. The name of the company will still be J.P. McGreedy Company. The only difference will be that uh, you will be sitting at my desk. Sitting at your desk? Well, I, I thought Hedges was slated to take over when you stepped down. No. Well, Tom was seriously considered, but he's a bit too old for the job. No, the company needs young blood. Well, I, I'm uh, really bowled over. Well, I've watched you grow, come up on merit, ability. You're going to go far, my boy. Of course, uh, the board will have to vote on your appointment, but... Uh, that, as the saying goes, is in the bag. Well, there's uh, something you've omitted, uh, John. You haven't asked me if I wanted the job. Is it necessary to ask? I remember another lunch with you several years ago. We got talking about ambitions, and you said that you would never be satisfied with second best. It had to be the top job, or you'd move on. Yes. But that was before this morning. Hmm? What? Uh, nothing. Just mumbling. I'd like to know how you feel about it, Charles. Well, even to be considered for the position is an honor, Miss, uh, John. And your answer? Let me think it over. I must think it over. Trying to collect your life insurance, Charles? Uh, what? The way you're driving. Are you out to get me, yourself, or both of us? Oh, I, I'm sorry, dear. I guess I didn't realize how fast I was going. This car has more power than it needs. More than I need. I'm sorry. At least it gave us a topic for conversation. Hmm? What did? You're driving. Darling, I'm the girl you asked to marry you. Something is troubling you, something big. <sighs> Allison, did your father tell you what he's planning? Dad never tells me anything. I have an idea he thinks of me as a bird friend. He wants me to take over the presidency of the company. That's marvelous. Couldn't have made a better choice. What, you're prejudiced. But it's a nice kind of prejudice. I, uh... I don't think I'll accept. What? But, darling, it's right for you. You've worked toward that goal. You're the right man for the job. Am I? What is this? Lack of confidence, buck fever... You're being ridiculous, darling. No, I'm being practical and sensible. My being president of the McCready Company would bring nothing but trouble. What are you saying? I'm even considering resigning my present job. Why? Allison. Tell me. Whatever it is, I'll never stop loving you. I'll tell you. 
when I get up enough courage. Please, darling, be patient with me. Just be patient. I love you, too. So you finally got here. Thought you were going to forget our appointment. Uh, you didn't really think that, Clint. No, I knew you'd come. You wouldn't dare not to come. Sit. You got it with you? Yes, I've got it. In small bills. Five stands, as specified. Let's have it. Here. Pretty manila envelope, too. Nice and neat. Thanks. Now, look, I don't know how much longer I can do this. You'll do it as long as I say. And if I run out of money? You'll just have to scrounge around and find more. Well, I'm thinking of quitting my job. You wouldn't want to do that, Charlie. Well, suppose... Suppose it gets too much for me and I say, go ahead, spill what you know. No, you wouldn't do that. You're going to marry a very rich girl. A couple of extra yards ain't going to change your manner of living. Even a couple extra grand. How long are you going to suck my blood? I don't like the way you put that, Charlie. I'd rather you'd think of it like it was sort of uh, sharing the wealth. You got the bread. I got nothing. This way, we both got something. I got a nice living, and you... Uh, you got your freedom. <laughs> Yes, Mr. Mc... Uh, yes, John. Uh, sorry to bother you at this hour. You wanted to sleep, were you? At 10.15, no. The, uh, the reason I'm calling... Yes. Is something bothering you, my boy? Well, I, uh... I've had some things on my mind lately. I'm sorry it was so noticeable. Well, it occurred to me that a young man gets a bit absent-minded as the day of his wedding approaches. Perhaps a bit frightened. No, 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 it isn't that, J.P. Oh, uh, excuse me, John. Someone's at my door. Hold on. Just a moment. Forgive me for coming shh, here. Shh, shh. I've got your father on the phone. Come in, darling. Hello, John. Uh, it was just the porter with a package. What were you saying? Oh, nothing really. I'm just concerned. Whatever's troubling you can be taken care of. I'm backing you all the way. Well, I, uh, I appreciate your feelings, J.P., but there really is no cause for concern. I'll snap out of this in a day or so. Good. It's reassuring to hear you say that. Now, forgive me for disturbing you. No, no, I wasn't disturbed. Thanks for calling. Good night. Good night, J.P. Even Dad notices that something is wrong. Yeah. I haven't seen you in three days. Are you trying to tell me something? All I, uh... All I want to tell you is that I... love you very much. From a distance? Hmm? I called you at your office twice this afternoon. Allison... Listen, I, I can't keep this from you. I thought I could, but every day, every hour, it grows bigger. Until now, it feels as though it, it, it's going to engulf me. And you, our life, everything that has meaning for me. Darling. No, 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 hear me out. And then if you want to go out that door quietly, I won't say anything more, and you can forget that you've ever known me. He loved you? Are you trying to say you don't want to marry me? That you stop loving me? Darling, it's because I love you that I'm going to tell you. I considered keeping the whole matter from you, writing out the trouble and probably overcoming it. Darling, I... how little you know me. No matter what the trouble is, I want to be with you. If you want me. <sighs> Allison, I'm a fraud. What? I'm not Charles Powell. It's a name I assumed to hide my real identity. Want me to go on? Yes, darling. Go on. At the age of 22, I was charged and convicted of murder and sent to San Quentin for life. I was innocent, evidence, circumstantial evidence, court-appointed attorney who didn't know what to do or didn't care. A weak effort to appeal, which was refused, and there I was, at 22, in prison for life. Chance of a parole only after serving 20 years. I'd be old, all my young life confined in prison. So, when I had a chance to get out... You escaped. ...and ran for two years. 
Do you know what it means to be hunted? You can't get a job. You have no place to live. You can't ever sleep for fear someone will see you and turn you in. Oh, darling. I was ready to give myself up. When I suddenly discovered that it wasn't necessary to run any longer, I picked up a two-week-old newspaper and read a report of my death. What? Yes, a man... A man had been burned to death in a flop house fire. The only thing he had on him was something that I had kept, my only possession. A locket belonging to my mother. It had a picture of her taken when she married my father. And it had been stolen from me as I lay asleep in a freight car. I guess the thief thought it was gold. It was just cheap gold plate. And the man was identified as you? My mother and father's names were inscribed on the back. The man was so badly burned that the locket was the only thing that could possibly identify him. And after two years of hunting, the authorities were glad to close the file. On Robert Hagen. Robert Hagen? Sounds so strange. The name doesn't fit you. It sounds strange to me, too, now. Darling, I'm innocent. I never did it. It was all a mistake. I don't doubt that for an instant, dearest. I only wish you'd never told me. I had to tell you. I... You see, someone knows who I am. He's blackmailing me. When you're being blackmailed, you don't have many alternatives. Charles Powell's whole life, his future, the happiness of the woman he loves, all hang by a very thin, flimsy thread. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. I'm High Brown, producer of Radio Mystery Theater. And as you may imagine, I'm excited about this new adventure in modern radio. This new statement of radio's marvelous power to stir the imagination. Now, we're wondering about your reaction about who you are and how you like what we're doing. So to encourage you to get in touch with us, we're holding a drawing for three weeks, 50 prizes a week, two AM FM stereo phonos, two travel clock radios, and 46 anthologies of modern suspense. Just mail us your name and address, and you're eligible. Of course, we'd like knowing whether your glad radio drama is back, but name and address will do it. To Mystery Theater, Box 50, Radio City Station, New York, 119. That's Box 50, Radio City Station, New York, 119. All for good everywhere, unless locally prohibited. It's always a pleasure to add beautiful new furniture to your home. And it's even more a pleasure when you can save substantially on its purchase. You can do both this week at Adele Hunt's. 7015 Snyder Plaza during Adele Hunt's great winter furniture clearance sale. Take advantage of Adele Hunt's staff of professional interior designers at no extra cost, of course, and save on such famous brands as Henriden, Drexel, Thomasville, Lazy Boy, and many others. For instance, there are exciting accent pieces on sale from Baker, Tomlinson, and Irwin Lambert. The hundreds of fine values in bedroom, dining room, living room, and occasional furniture may not be equaled again. Even a large selected group of lamps and pictures are as much as 60% off the regular price. So shop early, while selections are good during Adele Hunt's great winter sale. Adele Hunt's, 7015 Snyder Plaza, near the corner of Lover's Lane and Hillcrest in University Park, where Dallas buys with confidence. Open tonight till 9 p.m. Charles Powell chose to give in to his blackmailer. He didn't envision the trouble that was building up for him. Just keep paying and I'll keep my mouth shut, his blackmailer assured him. But then something happened that threatened to destroy Charles' fragile security. Yes, Elsie? Mr. Hamill is here to see you. George Hamill? Well, we're not playing tennis until tomorrow. I know that, Charlie. I've got something else to talk about. Business. Business? Yours or mine? Mine. But it concerns you. Okay, come in, George. Sorry to barge in on you. I know you're busy. Well, I'm never too busy to see George Hamill, rising young district attorney and next governor of the state. (laughs) (laughs) Your humor creaks, Charlie. (laughs) 
Seriously, I've got something that sort of disturbs me. Oh, what does? Last night in a bar over on the west side, a man was bashed over the head with a bottle. He's in serious condition. Well, what has that got to do with me? Well, the man who did the bashing, an ex-con by the name of Clinton Livitz. Yes? He's asking for you. Says you'll go as bail. Now, what I want to know is, how does a guy like you get mixed up with a Joe like that? Uh, George, what did you think? That he and I were buddies or something? I, I didn't know what to think. Well, I, I, I do know the man. He, uh... He applied for a job with the company a week or so ago. The foreman who interviewed him discovered he was an ex-con, and uh, and uh, he refused to hire him. It was brought to my attention when one of the societies that helps ex-cons called me. So you got him a job in the plant? No, 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 I couldn't. I mean, I wouldn't go over the head of the foreman, but I, I did see him, and I, uh, you know, handed him a couple of dollars. A couple and... of dollars. You know how much money he had on him when we brought him in? $276. Oh, well, uh, m maybe he got lucky at the races with the money I gave him. How much was it? Oh, gee, I don't remember. Uh, 15, 20, I just took it out of my pocket and handed it to him. It was a, you know, a way of easing my conscience. I felt bad about the way our foreman had treated him. Well, take my word for it. This Clint Livitz is a bad customer. Stay away from him. Uh -huh. Uh, what, uh, what will become of him? Well, he'll go back to the pen where he belongs. Well, what's the bail set at? Five thousand. And you're not seriously considering putting it up, are you? No, I was just asking. Because if you are, that's the last you'll see of your money. For that matter, Mr. Livitz, he'll jump bail. Please, to... George, I'm a big boy now, and I think I can make my own decisions. Well, <laughs> who would have thought it? Charles Powell Bleeding Heart. Now, look, we've been friends for over five years. When you were running for D.A., I backed you with substantial contributions. I like you. You're my friend. Now, let's not kick that all out because of some stupid disagreement. No. Let's not kick it out. I'm sorry, Charlie. But I just can't understand what your connection with that ex-con is. Now, Mr. Powell... I hope you'll understand. I accept Clinton Livett's case with strong reservations. Yes, I understand, Mr. Hargrave. As Hargrave's. an attorney, I... Well, how shall I put it? You, uh... You don't like your client. Exactly. However, I shall do my best to get him off. Or at least get him a light sentence. I'm extremely pessimistic about Mr. Livett's even showing up for trial. Yes. George Hamill also said he expected that Livett's would jump his bail. And you would forfeit $5,000. Yes, I know. And that doesn't disturb you? No, no, I... I don't believe he'll run. I see. Do you want to speak with him? He's been released. He's waiting in the other office. Uh, not particularly. He says he wants to see you. Oh. Well, in that case, yes, I'll, I'll see him. Send Mr. Liberts in. I'll leave you alone. If you need me, I'll be in the other office. Now, come in, Mr. Liberts. Mr. Powell will speak to you. Thanks. I'll be back when you call. Just flip the switch on the intercom. Yes, I will. Are you sure know how to complicate things, Clint? Story of my life. Do you realize you could go up for one to five years for what you've done? No. It couldn't happen. What do you mean it couldn't happen? Because you wouldn't let it happen, Charlie. Look, even with the best lawyer defending you, he can't guarantee he'll win the case. You won't let me go to prison, Charlie. I'm, I'm doing my best for you, but... No buts. I'm not going back to the pen. Okay. Okay, you're not going back. Now, suppose, just suppose, during the trial, if things look bad, yeah. we, uh, we get you out of town and let you run for it, forfeit your bail. <laughs> oh, oh, you'd like that, wouldn't you? I'd be out of your hair, and all it would cost you would be the five G's for the bail. No, 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 no. I, I'd give you a substantial sum. Oh, Mr. Powell. No sale. I'm too old to run. Well, su suppose I, uh, I, I got you out of the country. With a good hunk of bread stashed away for me? Swiss bank account. I don't know. Why don't we, uh, play it by ear? Come in. You, uh, wanted to see me, J.P.? Uh, yes. Uh, can you spare a minute? Yeah, sure. 
I've heard it on the grapevine that you were... How shall I put it? That you were aiding some ex-convict in trouble with the police. Is that true? Yes, it's true, John. And I think I know what kind of grapes grow on that grapevine. All right. Now, George Hamilton. Oh, that damn busy party. Why can't he stick to his job and... Now, George is a friend. He tells me that the man you're uh, protecting is a rather reprehensible character. Will you and... let me explain? It's, it, it's just a matter of policy, my helping this man. Policy? Well, yes, you, uh, you did ask me a few days ago to consider taking over the job of running this company. You're going to accept? Well, I was, uh, I was going to tell you today. Wonderful. Wonderful news. Allison will be delighted. I know she's been worried about your seeming reluctance. Oh, no, no, not reluctant any longer. In fact, I've got all sorts of ideas about what I want to do. This business of giving a hand to ex-convicts is just one of them. Do you realize what this would mean in publicity for the company? To take an interest in the rehabilitation of men who would otherwise be lost, a burden to the taxpayer? I'm going to hire a PR man. We're going to be the big corporation with a heart, J.P. <laughs> Lies. Lies, lies, and more lies. How, how can I keep all these phony stories straight, Allison? It's like a long, dark tunnel with no ending. It will end, and it will all turn out all right. Don't lose your courage. No, I love you and need you. We'll worry this out together. You know, you know what I've considered. What? Going to the authorities and saying, look, I'm Robert Hagen, the man you think died 13 years ago. No, darling, they'd throw you back into prison. Well, I'd hire the best lawyer. No, no, don't, don't. Please don't take such a chance. What would I do without you? Darling. Darling, I don't know how much longer I can stay in this pressure. I've got to do something. Something to free myself. Why not give him a lot of money and ask him to go away? Promise to stay away forever. In Hartgrave's office, I suggested that he jump bail and get out of the country. What did he say? Well, when I mentioned a big sum, I didn't exactly say how much. You know, a Swiss bank account. He was interested. Did he say he would accept? Well, we were interrupted, and he didn't say definitely. Offer him anything. Just get him to go. Well, how would I get a large sum of money together? I have some small investments, a fair bank account, but what he might want would be beyond me. You forget you're marrying a very rich girl. Oh, no, no. No, I wouldn't think of that. Don't give me that male ego business. I've got money. That was nice enough to give me a big hunk when I was 21. Now, look, look, Allison. With all my earthly goods. I'd be endowed. We're not married yet. You're not going to back up now, not after I've endowed you with all my earthly... Or is it worldly goods? <laughs> you know, you are the nuttiest woman I've ever known. As you see, I've got you laughing. Darling, all our troubles are going to evaporate, vanish. No. It won't work, Alison. It'll never work. But you said... No. Clint Livitz will never stick to any bargain. He'll want more, and he'll want more. He'll never be satisfied. If we got him out of the country. What's to keep him from coming back when he's broke or even threatening us from abroad? I gave him $1,000 in cash only a few days ago. When he was picked up in the bar, he had only about 270 some dollars left. In a matter of two days, he'd squandered over 700 But if he were made to understand that the sum agreed on was all he was going to get... Can I make you understand? We're not dealing with a rational, honest man... He'll agree to anything. And then he'll... When his money runs out or he decides he wants more, he'll... He'll be right back. What can you do? There are only... Two things one can do about a blackmailer. Keep on paying and paying forever. And the other? And the other? Kill him. Just two ways to deal with a blackmailer. Charles now must face his conscience. The thought that has been in the hidden recesses of his mind has been spoken aloud. We will be back shortly with Act Three. Oh, all right. When you say butter, you said a lot of things nobody else can say. Yeah. When you say butter, you've gone as far as you can go to get the very best. Um, I think about it. Decide. 
for yourself. Well, sure, the Budweiser people really do believe that brewing beer right does make a difference. But even that's up to you. Because the king of beer is leading all the rest. When you say Budweiser, you said it all. And I said, boy, St. Louis. Who knows how to help you solve your shopping problems? The Better Business Bureau knows. Honey, the TV set just won't work. Who do I take it to? The lady down the street took hers into a place that charged her more than her set was worth. Gosh, I don't know. I'll tell you what to do, folks. Who are are you? you? I'm the man from your Better Business Bureau. Now, before you take your set in for repairs, shop around and check into a firm's reputation. You know, that's even more important than the price. Friends and neighbors can help, or you can ask for a few names of previous customers to find out if they were satisfied. And since the amount you pay will vary from one place to another, it's up to you to find out in advance what a service will cost if you have it fixed at home. Just another consumer tip. From your better business, Bureau. Charles Powell's life has reached a climax. He must make a decision to rid himself forever of his blackmailer. And perhaps that very decision will destroy his life. And the life of the woman he loves. The alternative is to keep paying and paying, never feeling safe. Oh, Allison, I I was... uh... You were expecting him, weren't you? Yes, yes. I gathered as much when I called you at the office this afternoon. Aren't you going to ask me in? Uh, yeah, come in. You were so evasive. Well, he, uh, wanted to see me this evening. He, uh, wants more money. And you're going to give it to him? Well, I haven't many choices, have I? You mentioned one. No. No, Allison, I'm, I'm sorry I let that slip out. I didn't mean it. It, I, I couldn't go through with that if I wanted to. I could. What? Honey, you don't know what you're saying. I know very well what I'm saying. How long do you think you can keep this business hidden? Well, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe forever. Look, look, he's not a young man. All those years in prison, the kind of life he's led. How many years do you think he has left? He could die tomorrow. He could do something tomorrow that would expose the whole game, and then where would we be? No, Charles, I love you. I want us to marry and live a good, peaceful life. How can we with all that hanging over us? Oh, Allison, darling. Darling, you don't really know what you're suggesting. Look, maybe if we could get him to leave the country... You said there were only two ways to deal with a blackmailer. To keep paying... No, no, to murder him is unthinkable. George Hamill asked me to stop by at his office this afternoon. Why? He's not stupid. The story you gave my father about helping ex-convicts as a public relations stunt didn't wash with him. He wanted to know what I know. Well, he was just fishing. The best way would be to make it look like an accident. Allison, we... Hear me out. A car accident. How? If if I cracked up with Clinton, the car, I might be the one who gets it. And what guarantee do we have that that he would die? No, you can't be in the same car. If he were in another car and you were following him, and if you raced ahead of him and cut him off and forced him to crash off the road... Oh, if, if, if. It's too iffy. It's so impossible. It's so dreamlike. It was a dream. Last night I dreamt... You were in a car with me. We saw Clint up ahead of us. I said, there's Clint ahead of us. Cut him off and make him crash. Faster, faster. We've nearly caught him. Now we're alongside him. Push him over. Cut in front of him. Then I woke up. I was calling out. I was afraid someone had hurt. Oh, my darling. It was all so real. That's Clint now. Honey, you go out the back door. I'll phone you later. I'm going to stay and meet him. No. I'm staying. I've got something to say to him. He won't like your being here. Well, it sure took long enough. 
What's the idea, Powell? Uh, this is my fiance, Allison McCready. What's she doing here? Will you come in and stop being childish? I ain't saying a thing. You got nothing on me. And remember, Mr. Powell, you got a lot more to lose than I have. I'm not going to lose anything, Mr. Livitz. You're going to gain by my being here. Yeah? Mr. Powell has told me his story, and I agree that it must not get out. Go on. I have a lot more money than... Let me put it this way. Charles and I are going to be married. We want you to leave the country. Oh, 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 oh. I bet you do. Now look, Clint, you'll do better by accepting our proposition. We intend to hand you $50,000. And an airplane ticket. One way. And never come back. And never come back. Well, I always wanted to travel, but... What? 50 G's. Just chicken free. Well, that's all there is. Not enough. I'm thinking around a quarter of a million. Out of the question. I'm not going to bargain with you. I can raise 100000 No, Allison. It's worth it, Charles, if we can depend on Clint to wipe the whole matter out of his memory and just go away. Oh, you can depend on me. I'll keep my bargain. Then it's a deal? A deal. Good. It'll take about ten days to raise the money. I ain't, Nari. You are. And, uh, speaking of money, that was the reason I, uh, came tonight, Charlie. Yeah, here. That's 500. What? I said a G like the last... That's all I could raise in a hurry. When that runs out, I'll have more. You went through that first thousand awfully fast. Well, I got rolled in that bar where I had the trouble. Oh, that reminds me. Your trial comes up in less than three weeks. Yeah. Lawyer called me at my hotel. To see if I was still around, I guess. Our plan is for you to jump your bail. I'll forfeit the 5000 I put up for it. And get you out of the country. With a keister full of green. Now, wait. I ain't got a passport. Now, that can be arranged, Clint. Just leave that to me. Okay, friends. You got yourself a deal. Say, Charlie. Hmm? You're going to put this meal on your expense account, I hope. <laughs> Too rich for your blood, George? <laughs> Too rich for my pocket. That's well, J.P.'s favorite French restaurant. Oh, yeah. Nice to have wealthy, high-paid executives for friends. <laughs> I'm a simple man. I like simple things. And I like simple answers. Really? How long are you going to cling to that cockamamie story about your helping ex-cons rehabilitate themselves? Well, it's the McCoy, George. That guy got something on you, Charles. Pardon, monsieur, the telephone for you. Oh, uh, yes, thank you. Where is it? It is here, monsieur. I will plug it in for you. Thank you. <laughs> Just like the movie. Yeah. Hello? Charles? Oh, yes, Allison. I know George Helmel's with you, Elsie. He told me you were lunching with him. Listen to what I'm going to say, but don't let on to George. Uh, yes, 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 dear. Uh... Allison says hello and to remind you that in two and a half weeks, she wants to see you at the church promptly at 11. <laughs> I'll try to remember. Okay. He's all set, darling. Now, what's so important? It's got to be tonight. I'll have the house all to myself. Uh, why is the color scheme so important? The housekeeper and her husband are going into town to see their 15-year-old son in the high school play. Well, I don't see that that's such a problem. Choose whatever color will make the bridesmaids happy. Rent a car and let Clint take it to drive out and be here promptly at nine. Do not come together. You come out in your own car, but first report it broken down. Have it picked up tomorrow morning. You bring it back after it's all over. Understand? We did not see each other. You couldn't get here because your car was out of order. Oh, yes, yes, I follow, dear. I follow. I'm, I'm not sure I agree. I have a twenty-two target pistol. I know how to use it. Yes, I... I know you have to ask him to come, dear, but... Then what do we do with the unwelcome guest? There's a spot about a hundred yards behind the house. We get him out there in a wheelbarrow. There's a hole, an old cesspool. We drop him in, quick climb. Gardner's got several bags. But, uh... Suppose the gardener wants to supply some flowers He's for it. gone over a year fired. We didn't hire one after that. As soon as it's all over, we'll take the rental car and dump it over the edge of the road near town... You know that bad place where there's no shoulder on the road and only a flimsy guardrail? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, I, I I know. I know. We dump the car there. Let it smash up if it catches fire, so much the better. Then you take me back to the house and rush back to the city. Report the rental car stolen. 
You've been in your apartment all evening. Understand? Yes, uh... The color scheme suits me fine, dear. You sure have it all planned. No baubles, uh... No slip-ups. All planned. Yes, I'll, I'll be in my office till late tonight. Nine, at least, if you want to reach me. Good. That was for George's ears, wasn't it? Yes, that's correct, Allison. I, uh... Now, look, I have a report to get out. Uh, if you've completed your instructions, I'll get back to my lunch with George. Goodbye, dear. <laughs> wow. And that's only the beginning, Charlie. Wait till she gets your sign on the dotted line. Mr. Powell, something terrible's happened. What is it, Elsie? It's been a terrible accident on the late ship. Man's caught in a machine. The big press, they said. Oh, good Lord. Has the hospital been called? I don't know. Well, call them on your phone. I've got to use this one. Yes, sir. I'll call. And then call down to the plant. Tell them I'm coming down. If it's what I think it is, the machine will have to be partially dismantled. Yes, sir. Hello? Allison, listen, there's a change of plans. Charles, where are you? I'm still at the office. Something's happened. It's 8.30. He'll be here at 9. Yes, I know. He has the rental car. I got it for him. When will you be here? Well, there's been a bad accident on a night shift. A man's caught in a big metal press. I've got to help get him out. But us? What about us? Well, when he comes, stall him. Just tell him what happened, why I'm delayed. I haven't got the money, Charles. Tell him I'm bringing the money, the airplane ticket, and the passport. Just stall him. I'll do my best, but hurry. He scares me. from you people this morning. No, 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 no. No, there's nothing wrong with the car. I just want to report it stolen. The City Foreign Car Service. Look, I uh, asked for my car to be picked up in my driveway. It's still here, and I, I called, or rather, my secretary called at 10 this morning. My name is Charles Powell. <laughs> the phone. Oh. Yeah, just a moment. Oh, George. George, it's uh, kind of late for a visit. Come in. Thanks. I, uh, I, I was just trying to phone Allison. Well, what a night this has been. Uh, there was an accident at the plant. Uh, Peterson, I hope they don't have to agitate. I heard. Yes, and then uh, when I got outside, I had a date with Allison, the car that I had rented this morning, was uh, was missing. It was stolen. What happened to that great, big, powerful foreign job of yours? Oh, uh, it wouldn't start this morning. Uh, had Elsie call the service people, but they haven't picked it up yet. I just called them. They they uh, have a night answering service. You've had a busy evening. Yeah, very. Well, I think I can clear up one of your puzzles, Charlie. Your rental car was found with a thief in it. You uh, caught him? Dead. Burned to a cinder. Oh. 
He must have been going at a terrific speed. Tire marks on the road as he went off. Uh, cracked up and burned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some kid? No. This may surprise you. It's your protege, Clint Livitz. We found enough of him to identify him. And a slightly burnt but still usable bankroll of sizable proportions. Well, that uh, closes his case, doesn't it? And opens up several others. Incidentally, where were you all evening? Uh, home. I, uh, after I got back from the plant... You didn't go out? Well, I told you, my rental car got stolen. I came home by cab to change my clothes. The, uh, the big car is out of commission. I won't play games with you, Charlie. I checked it in the driveway just before I came up. The engine is still quite warm. You want to explain that? No, I don't want to explain. Charlie, I'm arresting you for murder. I must warn murder. you that what... It... George, what are you talking about? Are you accusing me of Clint Livett's death? No, no, that was obviously an accident. I'm holding you for the murder of Allison McCready, the girl you were going to marry. And in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, my prosecution of Charles Powell or Robert Hagen has been a painful task. I was his best friend. It was difficult to believe that he would kill the woman he loved, but the evidence is conclusive. Charles killed his lovely fiance because she discovered his real identity. An escaped convict. A killer sentenced to life for another murder. The testimony of the housekeeper, Mrs. Francis, cannot be doubted. She did not leave the house as he thought. She saw him run from the house, jump into his car, and race away. And then she discovered the body of Allison McCready... Shot through the head. Your Honor, may I... May I make a statement before you pronounce sentence? I did not kill Allison. I loved her. To say anything more in my defense is useless and unnecessary. Allison is dead. All I ask is that I be given the chance to follow her. Swiftly. And efficiently. And so a man is twice accused of murder and twice sentenced for the crime. A weary man who asks only to be allowed to follow the woman he loved. I'll be back shortly. Take the time to listen Take the time to care If I know you understand me Then my mind is yours to share Listen with your heart Listen with your mind When you listen Love is what you find How do you do, sir? My grandmother just died I'm so happy for you Meet Mrs. McNulty. How do you do? And did you know you have spinach on your teeth? Oh, that's wonderful. This is Mr. Jackson. Nice to meet you. I have bubonic plague. Oh, yes, Mr. Plague. Meet Mr. Reception lines aren't the only places people don't listen. When you really listen, really listen, love is what you find. A thought from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons. Charles Powell's joust with fate. What difference did it make that he knew that Clint had murdered Allison? They didn't believe him. And he was too weary to try to make them believe. Our cast included Larry Haynes, Ann Meacham, Jackson Beck, Sidney Walker, and Tom Keener. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. 
Now, a preview of our next tale. I don't understand it. Tub's bone dry, ma'am. Hasn't been used. Now, not, not tonight, anyway. His clothes. Howard's clothes. He'd empty his suitcases and put his clothes in the closet. Here's his suitcases, too. Just ladies' clothes. Yours, ma'am? Yes. Hey, look, look, this dream you had. It was no dream. Okay, okay, so maybe you imagined... I didn't imagine anything. Do you imagine a husband? Do you imagine a month-long honeymoon? Do you imagine a man in a chair with a knife in his chest? Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. because you had a bad dream. It was no dream. It happened. I tell you, it happened. No, ma'am, it didn't. You see, it couldn't have. A thing like that to happen. Impossible. Our mystery drama, Honeymoon with Death, was written especially for the Radio Mystery Theater by George Lothar and stars Lois Nettleton. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll be back shortly with Act One. What makes Jennifer Brady think she's going out of her mind? What strange thing happened that couldn't have happened? Perhaps we can find out together. It was a wonderful honeymoon, Howard. I can't tell you how much I enjoyed it. Adored it. But you know something? Howard, you know something? What, Jennifer, what? It's wonderful to be back home. These last ten days driving back from San Francisco, I kept thinking... When, oh, when will I be back in my own bedroom, in my own bed, in my own little old New York brownstone house? Oh, I shouldn't have said that, should I? What? Said what, Jennifer? Am I bothering you with all my chatter, Howard? Bothering me? How could you possibly bother me, sweetheart? I'm just trying to catch up with all that mail Margaret left on the living room table. Oh, hey, I haven't seen that negligee before. I saved it for a homecoming night. Like? <laughs> <laughs> I can see a whole month of honeymooning hasn't changed you a bit. When I've got a bride as beautiful and sexy as you, our whole life is going to be a honeymoon. Now, tell me, what was it you shouldn't have said? What? Oh, I've forgotten. Or something about your own little old New York brownstone house. Oh, well, 
what I meant. It's not just mine anymore. It's yours now, too. Mm. And your sister Maggie's. You both inherited this old brownstone from your father. Though, I must say, I think that you, I mean, we, have the better of the bargain. What do you mean? I much prefer this top floor apartment, don't you? Oh, yes. Luckily, Maggie always preferred the downstairs part. No climbing stairs. The stairs won't bother me. I'll take them two, three at a time, knowing that you're waiting at the top of them. Oh, darling. Mm -hmm. Well, you uh, better finish brushing your hair. I'll finish that nail of the living room. Howard? Yes? About the car. Well, what about it? You think it's safe parked out in the street? One night won't hurt. I'd feel awful if anything happened to us. <laughs> you know, sometimes on a honeymoon trip, I couldn't help wondering which you love more, your new car or me. <laughs> oh, well, I guess one night in the street is safe enough. You can find a garage tomorrow. Howard? You locked the car. You have the keys, haven't you? Howard? Howard, can't you hear me? I asked you. Howard, 
He's sitting in a chair with a knife in his chest, blood all over. No, 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 ma'am. But that, that's impossible. Impossible, I tell you. It's in, impossible. I couldn't. Maybe you want to see for yourself, huh? I, I'll go up with Officer, you. Officer, thank you very much, but there's no need. I do want to see for myself, will you? Sure. Uh, I'll come with you. Well, uh, no, on second thought, what's the use? I mean, I'm... I'm really very tired of this sort of thing. Uh, what sort of thing? Never mind, Officer. Just, uh... You go ahead. Now, uh, is this the room where you, uh, thought that, uh... Huh? I can't believe it. It's impossible. Uh, you can see for yourself. Five uh... minutes ago. Five minutes ago, I tell you. In this chair. He was sitting back in this chair, and there was a knife sticking out of his chest. The mail. The mail was scattered all over the floor. Mail? We'd just come back from our honeymoon. We'd only been in the house a few hours. And Maggie had left all the mail that had collected for a month on the table, on this table. Well, you can see, ma'am, uh, no mail. And blood. There was blood on the carpet, some of the mail. Well, no mail, no blood. But you don't mind me saying so. I think you... Well, maybe you had a dream, a nightmare, huh? Please. I'm not out of my mind. I, I didn't say you were. No, but everybody else does, and I'm not. I'm not. It, it don't mean you're off your, uh, out of your mind because you had a bad dream. It was no dream. It happened. I tell you, it happened. Howard was here in the living room reading the mail. I was talking to him from the bedroom. I had just taken a bath, and I was brushing my hair. And... What? I know. I know. I hadn't emptied the tub. The water's still there. It must be. I'll, I'll show you. I don't understand this. Tub's bone dry, ma'am. Hasn't been used. Now, not not tonight, anyway. His clothes. Howard's clothes. He'd empty his suitcases and put his clothes in the closet. Here's his suitcases, too. Just ladies' clothes. Yours, ma'am? Yes. Uh, 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 now, hey, now, hey. Uh, don't cry. I, um... <laughs> Hey, look, look, this dream you had. It was no dream. Okay, okay, so maybe you imagined... That... I didn't imagine anything. Do you imagine a husband? Do you imagine a month-long honeymoon? Do you imagine a man in a chair with a knife in his chest? Oh, I, I, I got to admit, you, you, you'd have to have a darn strong imagination. To... But uh, they tell me that's what artists got. Artist? Oh, you are an artist, aren't you? That painting there on the easel? Oh, that, that's just a hobby. I haven't touched that since I left on my honeymoon. No? What do you mean? Uh, how long does it take paint to dry? Oh, a day, thereabouts. Well, oh, this paint's still wet. Plenty wet. Look at my finger. Oh, now, don't, don't start crying again. Uh, a woman crying, it makes me feel awful. I'm sorry. Look, um, wh when have you dreamed it or imagined it? I that? didn't. Yeah. I didn't. Oh, yeah, well, uh, um... I know, I know I've had spells. Spells? Uh, what, what kind of spells? Oh, uh, I've always been high-strung, nervous, you know? Well, I don't know if I know. I mean, uh, me, well, I'm, I'm the other way. I haven't got a nerve in my whole body. I envy you. You've never been to a psychiatrist. <laughs> a shrink? No, no, me, no, me. You ask me, anybody who goes to a shrink ought to have his head examined. Uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a joke. You get it? <laughs> well, then, then, then laugh a little bit. Come on, do you good. I... I can't. No, of course you can't. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I should have known better than to even try and make a joke. I'm... You you go to a psychiatrist, huh? Yes. Not regularly. Sometimes. What time? Oh, when I sort of get all keyed up and start having crying spells and feeling so sad. 
so sad I could die. Well, what's to feel sad about? Chick like, I mean, uh, excuse me, a pretty girl like you with everything in life to live for. What's to be sad? I don't know. Some people feel sad for no reason at all. They just suffer from depression. Oh, excuse me? Oh, uh, yes, ma'am? Uh, Jennifer, Dr. Sullivan is on his way over. I just phoned him. All right. And, officer, thank you very much for trying to help. Oh, uh, not at all, ma'am. Not at all. Uh, glad to do what I could. Well, I'll show you out. Oh, that's okay. No, no. Sir, I'll come with you. I'll be just a minute, Jen. Officer, I, uh, I wanted to ask you, you, you don't have to say anything about this, do you? I mean, put it in your report or anything? Oh, no, no, no. There's been no damage or anything like that. Does she get this way often, your sister? Well, often enough. She hallucinates, you see. Huh? Come again? Uh, hallucinates? It, it means, well, just what you saw. She was totally convinced there was a murdered man up there. Her husband, no less. Well, you saw for yourself. Husband. Jennifer's never even had a boyfriend. A cute doll. I mean, a uh, uh, pretty girl like that? Well, it's all part of her condition. She's afraid of people. Men, especially. I wish she could become less afraid, more outgoing. If these spells of hers get any worse, she may lose her mind altogether. Oh, say, I hope not. A sweet kid like that. I, I, sh I sure hope not. I know. So do I. Well... Looks like we've had a little shower. Street's wet. It was drizzling a little when I came in. Well, good night, ma'am, and if you need... Wait! Wait! The car! The yes, car! The car! What car? College! The little red sports car he was so fond of. It... It isn't there. But it was. I know it was, officer. Thank you, Dan, and good night. Good night, lady. Jen, dear. Until Dr. Sullivan gets here, I think you should lie down and rest. Hmm? I don't want to lie down. Well, then just stretch out on the couch and I'll make some tea for us. Oh, that's probably Dr. Sullivan now. Oh. <clears throat> yes? <clears throat> Excuse me, ma'am. I just wanted to get something straight. Yes. Uh, your sister, did she say... Oh, ma'am. Yes, officer. Did you say that car was a little sports car? Yes. Why? Well, nothing, only uh, there was one parked out there in the street. What do you mean? Well, we've had a shower, see, and I, I happen to notice uh, the street's dry in one spot. There must have been a car standing there while it was raining. A small car. Uh, officer, please don't make things worse for me or for my sister. I mean, there's nothing unusual about a car being parked in the street. No, only... Good night, a... officer. Funny, though. Funny. <laughs> exactly is it that strikes Officer Helmut as funny? Perhaps we'll know when I return shortly with Act Two. Has a horrible murder been done? Or is Jennifer Brady losing her mind? Did she find the body of her husband, Howard Lansing, seated in the living room with a knife in his chest? Or did she imagine the frightful scene? Is she married? Was there a honeymoon? Oh, here's young patrolman Ed Helmer at the front door of the brownstone house where Jennifer and her sister Maggie live. And it's the following morning. Oh, it's you. Yeah. Uh, well, won't you come in? Thanks. Thank you for, um, what you did last night. Oh, just doing my job, Miss, uh, uh, Mrs., uh, I, I don't know what to call you. I don't know what to call myself. I don't know if I'm Mrs. Howard Lansing or Miss Jennifer Brady. Not after last night. Well, um, suppose I just call you Jennifer. Um, you can call me Ed. Uh, Ed Helmet. What, what? What are you doing here? Well, uh, I'm off duty, see. I'm, I'm on the four to midnight beat, and I just thought I'd 
drop around and uh, see how you were doing. Oh, well, I'm all right. You mind if I ask you a couple of questions, Jennifer? No. It's your job, isn't it? Well, uh, yes and no, yes and no. Uh, in fact, being uh, off duty uh, now, I'm, I'm kind of asking these questions on my own. Uh, you, you know what I mean? I, I don't. Not really. Well, um, I tell you, that car of your husband's... If I didn't just imagine a husband. Yeah, well, if you didn't, that car of his, that little red sports car you mentioned, well... There was a car parked out front last night, and it was a little sports car. If it wasn't there when you left... Well, the space it left. It, it, it rained, remember, while the car was standing at the curb? Oh, yes. So at, at least you were right about there being a car. I mean, you didn't dream that up. It could have been anyone's car, Maggie said. Oh, that's for sure. Still, though, it could have been a car belonging to a guy named Howard Lansing. Couldn't it? Couldn't it? Why are you doing this? Come again? Well, you know that I'm not well. That all my life I've had nervous problems. That, that... Oh, I can't believe it, but I must have dreamed it all up. Howard Lansing marrying him, going on a honeymoon across country and back, coming home last night, finding a murdered. I must have imagined it all. Maggie says I did. Doctor Sullivan says I did. So why are you? Why are you? You know something? I I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's because. Uh, well. Uh, well, what? I. Uh, I kind of like you and. Uh, well, uh, me, I didn't get much sleep either last night, uh, thinking about this whole thing, uh, thinking about you, and, uh, well, I'm kind of wishing I could, uh, straighten things out for you. That's very sweet of you, officer. But... Call me Ed. Ed? It's sweet of you. But you... You're wasting your time. I'm mentally... Mentally. Oh, come on now. Come on now. Don't cry. You had a bad dream, that's all. A, a nightmare. Oh, it was more than that. Much more than that. When you dream something, you wake up and you know it was a dream. I'm still living it. I remember the ceremony. The hotels we stayed at. The things we did. Even how it's fussing, constantly fussing with his new car. Yeah, there's, there's that car again. Now, what do you mean... Fussing with it. Oh, just, um, just that he was always polishing it, checking this and that. And fussing, that's all. And you remember all about the ceremony and uh, the hotels and like that? It's all as vivid as if it had actually happened. Tell me, tell me about the wedding. Um, who married you? Nobody married me, Ed. I imagined... Okay, okay. So where did you imagine... You got married. A little town in Jersey. By a justice of the peace. What little town? What J.P.? I don't know. It was night and we just pulled off the Garden State Parkway. Howard had said he knew a place, a justice of the peace. Okay, okay. What about hotels? Well, I remember we stayed at the Ambassador in Chicago and the Statler in St. Louis. The Beverly in Los Angeles. And... Oh, that you, Maggie? Yes, Jen. Johnny called when I... Oh. Uh, hello, Miss Brady. Aren't you the policeman who was here last night? Yeah, that's right. Uh, you're wondering what I'm doing here now, huh? Well, yes, I am. I just uh, dropped in to see how Jen was doing, that's all. Jen? Um, I mean, excuse me, uh, Miss Brady. I was never much for being formal. Yes, obviously. Have you been here long? No, uh, uh, ten minutes or so. Well, I don't mean to hurry you, officer, but Jennifer and I have an appointment in one hour with her psychiatrist, Dr. Sullivan. Uh, say, uh, would that be Dr. Martin Sullivan on Park Avenue? No, Dr. Arnold Sullivan on East 82nd. Oh. You seem terribly interested in Jennifer's psychiatrist. <laughs> Me? Oh, no, no. I, I just ask a lot of questions. I, I trained myself. Yeah. Train yourself. <laughs> you're going to laugh. I, I, I know you're going to laugh, but uh, would you believe 
I, I want to be a detective someday. Of course I believe it. Why shouldn't I? Ask my sergeant. He thinks I'm something else wanting to be a detective. Laugh himself silly. Well, I certainly wouldn't laugh. I think it's commendable. Do you think I could make a detective? Of course you could. Well, uh, say, that's a real shot in the arm. I mean, someone like you thinking that uh, someone like me, uh, I mean, just a cop and uh, new on the force. Of that. <clears throat> As I said, officer, I don't like to hurry you, but... I'm going, are... going, Miss Brady. Uh, going right now. Nice seeing you again, Jen. I'll show you out. Oh, that's okay. Some detective I'd make if I couldn't find the front door. Uh, why, uh... uh... Jennifer, would you answer that, please? Of course. Oh, my God. Jennifer, what is it? Help me. Oh, my God, Maggie. Ed, help me. What? He's there. At the front door, he's there. Howard. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Is something... What's all the trouble? He was dead. Murdered. What? Last night after we got home from our honeymoon, I found you in your chair, stabbed to death. Last night, honey, stabbed? Maggie, what is this? Jen's having another one of her spells, Howard, that's all. Oh, I see. What do you mean? You see? You see what? Oh, what just... Excuse me, who are you? Uh, my name is uh, Ed Helmut, uh, Officer Ed Helmut. I'm a cop. A cop? Uh, Howard, I'll explain later what went on here last night. I don't understand this. I don't understand it. You're talking to Howard as if nothing had happened. Jennifer, nothing did. He exists. He's standing right here. He exists. And last night you acted as if you'd never heard of him. As if there was no such person as Howard Lansing. Well, I don't remember. You did. You did. You did. Jennifer, stop it. Now, stop oh. it. Control yourself. Oh. Oh. Officer. We're leaving. Uh, well, uh, there's some sort of questions. I'd better get the answers to Officer, first. this uh, is a private matter. It's a family affair. Well, now that depends on how you look at it. Are you Howard Lansing? Of course I'm Howard Lansing. Why do you ask such a question? Howard, Jen had one of her, her mental lapses last night. She imagined that you and she were married. We were. We and were. And that you just come back from your honeymoon. Oh, good Lord. And then during this hallucination, she thought she had found you with a a knife in your chest. Dead. Oh, no. Poor little Jenny. She ran oh. screaming into the street. Luckily, I got her back into the house before she caused a disturbance, although this officer did hear the screams and came to investigate. Well, did you call Dr. Sullivan? Well, of course. Of course I did. He came over, but there wasn't much he could do except order some new sleeping pills. And we're seeing him in his office at 11 this morning. Uh, just one more question, Mr. Lancer. Yes? Just where do you fit in here? I mean, who are you? To the family, I mean. I'm Miss Brady's fiancée, uh, Margaret, not Jennifer. Oh. I see. I uh, know. No, I'm afraid you don't see. Not all of it. Look, since we've gone this far, you might as well know the rest of it. Jennifer has always had a... Well, a thing for Howard. She's not jealous that he's going to marry me and not her. Don't think that. But the whole situation has been a, a severe strain on her. A very severe strain. Almost certainly that's why her hallucination last night took the form that it did. Thinking she'd been married to me and all the rest of it. Yeah. That makes sense. Well, uh, I'll be on my way. Uh, hey, 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 now. You, you take it easy, huh? And me, uh, if it's okay with you, I'm I'm going to be in touch. I'll uh, I'll see my way out. Hey, hey, uh, Mr. Lansing, you have got a little red sports car. Well, yes, that's it, parked at the curb. Why? Well, Jim, uh, uh, Miss Brady, she seemed to make a big thing out of it on the honeymoon that didn't happen. I mean, big thing. Well, what I mean, uh, you said you were always fussing with it, polishing it and like that. Sure looks as if you do. Oh, I do. I'm a sports car brother. Want to know? I wish I could own a car like that. Put on a top salary. Uh... <laughs> you had it long? Well, two or three months. Oh, like, uh, cross country. Well, maybe someday I will, but so far I haven't had the interest. Yeah. Well, see ya. Bye. Where is she? Upstairs, changing for appointment with Sullivan. I don't know. Oh, boy. If I had a car like that, I'd go for long trips, like uh, cross country. Well, maybe someday I will, but so far I haven't had the interest. Yeah. Well, see ya. Bye. 
Where is she? Upstairs, changing for appointment with Sullivan. I don't like this, Maggie. You don't like it. You don't like it. All the stupid things walking in here when a cop was here. How did I know he was here? If it comes to that, why'd you let her run screaming into the street last night? Howard, come to your senses. Was there any other way? Uh, no, I, I guess there wasn't. I'm afraid we're going to have to move faster than we planned. Why? That young cop, pretty nosy. Come over here to the window. What? Look, down there. What the hell is he doing? He's measuring the size of your car from front to back wheel. What's he doing that for? I don't know. He's doing it. I don't like it. No, Howard, we're... We won't commit Jennifer now. Well, if we, if we don't commit her, what will we do with her? Kill her. Clearly, Maggie and Howard faked his murder. But how could they have managed it? And how will they kill Jennifer? We'll return shortly with Act Three. to discover that Howard Lansing is very much alive? I can't fathom it. Can you? No more than, well, ten minutes could have passed between the time Jennifer saw him slumped in that chair with a knife in his chest, blood all over everything, and the time Officer Helmut entered the room to find no body, no blood, nothing to indicate that a murder had taken place. It would have been impossible for Howard Lansing and Margaret Brady to restore perfect order to that room in so short a time. Even to Howard's clothes and luggage no longer in the closet. A bone-dry bathtub. And the rest of it got me puzzled. Well, we'll soon have the answer as we rejoin Maggie and Howard. Kill her. There's nothing else we can do. Oh, we can do what we planned originally. Commit her. It won't work. Not now. Why not? Your answer is right out there in the street. The cop was just finished measuring your car. Uh, now, what's he doing? Quite obviously getting into your car. I think I'd better get out there and see what he's up to. I was just about to suggest it, Howard. Officer, what are you doing in my car? Oh, say, uh, Mr. Lansing. Say, I hope you don't mind. Uh, uh, like I told you, I, I want to own a little sports car like this myself someday, and... Uh, well, I just couldn't help uh, sitting behind the wheel. Say, I hope you don't mind. As a matter of fact, I do mind. Oh. Well, say, uh, please excuse me. I just I just kind of flip over a car like this, that's all. Is that why you were measuring the wheelbase? Measuring? Oh, that. Yes, that. I saw you from the window. Yeah. Well, now, I tell you, I, I want to get to be a detective someday, see? And I'm, I'm studying, like, uh, fingerprints and stains and like that and uh, measuring. Now, measuring things is important, very important. Uh, you'd be surprised how important measuring things is. So, I take every opportunity to measure things. Ah, uh, yes. Well... Like last night. Were you here last night? Uh, no, I was not here last night. Funny. What's funny? Well, last night, uh, Jennifer, uh, Miss Brady, she said a car, in fact, your car, was parked outside here. Only it wasn't. I mean, when we looked, no car. Well, I just told you that... Yeah, but there had been a car. You see, it had rained, and the car was standing out here during the rain and left a dry space in the street. <laughs> and I, I measured that, too. Couldn't help myself. It's become a habit, you know? Well, I failed to see what this has to do with Identical. anything. Identical. Same wheelbase. That car and this one. Look, there are probably thousands of sports oh, cars I'm, in New York. I'm not saying it was the same car. Oh, oh, no, nothing like that. I'm only saying the wheelbase was the same. Very interesting, I'm sure. But if you don't mind now, Just I... Just leaving when you came out. I apologize if I have set you getting in behind the wheel without permission. Oh, it's all right. Yeah. Well, goodbye. Oh, uh, by the way... Now what? You got 11,243 and nine-tenths miles on the speedometer. A thousand or so more than you said you had. I just thought you'd like to know. Thank you. I'm deeply grateful for that information. <laughs> up 
to something, Maggie. What else is new? He checked the mileage on the car. What of it? Over 11,000 miles. I could easily have driven from here to L.A. and back, which I did. Mileage shows only how far a car went, not where. I'm not worried about your car. I'm worried about him nosing around. The quicker we kill Jennifer, the better. Now look, I didn't bargain for anything like murder. Neither did I, but that's the way it is. How will you do it? How will we do it? Sleeping pills. An overdose. That's the simplest. When? Well, tonight. Why wait? Oh, Jennifer. Oh, ready for our appointment with Dr. Sullivan, I see. Hmm? Yes. I'll just get my coat. Howard? Yes, Jennifer. I'm sorry if I... If I've caused you any trouble. Oh, no. I'm losing my mind, Howard. I must be. Marrying you, a honeymoon trip across the country, returning last night, finding you dead. It was all so real. So real. And yet it wasn't. It never happened. And... Oh, Howard, I... I just can't go on like this much longer. You won't, Jennifer. Believe me, you won't. Did you check all marriage license applications? For... And there's no Howard Lansing and Jennifer Brady, huh? I'll be you at Beverly Hotel, Los Angeles. Uh, right there. Okay, uh, sorry I troubled you. Thanks. Uh, hello. Yeah. Yeah, how far back did you check your guest register? And there's no Mr. and Mrs. Howard Lansing. Hey, Ed, another one. The ambassador of Chicago. You going on a trip or something, man? Thanks. Uh, Officer Ed Helmet here. Yeah, I think I can tell you what you're going to tell me before you tell me. Uh, no record of a Mr. and Mrs. Howard Lansing. Yeah. Well, thanks. Hmm. There's got to be a clue. There's got to be. Why that look on your face? I'm a murderer. I'm just beginning to realize it. I am a murderer. Not yet, Howard. She won't be dead for a while. How can you be so calm? You, you frighten me, Maggie. I've never seen this side of you before. You've got to be kidding. All the time we spent planning this... To commit her, not murder. What's the difference? We're not doing all this for peanuts, you know. We inherited a million and a half dollars from my father, Jennifer, and I. You and I will have all of it once she... Wait. No, I guess we can't pretend no one's at home. The lights are all on. And my car's parked out front. Oh, it's you. Okay, if I come in, Mr. Lance. Oh, well, no, I... I uh... Thanks. Rotten night out there. Just plain rotten. It's, uh... It's Officer Helmet, Maggie. Yes, so I see. Getting to be a regular visitor, aren't you? To be honest with you, Miss Brady, it's a real nasty night, and uh, walking a beat, uh, I didn't think you'd mind if I came in for a few minutes. Uh, also, I wanted to see how Jen's getting along. Jen is getting along very well, if it's any concern of yours, which it is not. Oh, well, I only... Officer Helmet, circumstances beyond my control brought you into this house last night, but I do control whether you'll keep coming here like this. Please leave. Oh, well, now, uh, wait a minute, Miss Brady. I, I like your sister, and I have reason to think she likes me. Uh, now, 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 wait now, wait a second. Just wait a second. I also think she needs somebody like me, somebody to lean on, to protect her. Oh, oh And goodness. further than that, I'm here on official business. Official business? I'm placing you both under arrest on a charge of... Where is Jen? That's no business of yours. What's all this about? Where is she? She is upstairs asleep, if you must know. Asleep? At 8 o'clock at night? She took a couple of sleeping pills. Where are you going? How dare you go up there? Maggie, Maggie, you my God. nerve. Don't lose it now. But he'll know. He'll know she took an overdose. That's all he will know. He will know that we gave it to her. He's arresting us. For what? On what charge? Whatever it is, he'll never make it stick. We've covered our traps too well for the law to... He's carrying her down. All right, baby. It's going to be all right. 
Mm-hmm. Operator, this is Officer Ed Helmet. I want an ambulance sent to 127 Brockhurst and fast. An ambulance? Why an ambulance? An overdose of sleeping pills. She took a... She didn't take them, Buster. They were given to her. Shoved down her throat, you ask me. I'm changing the charge against you two. I'm booking you for attempted murder. You must be out of your mind. You're as crazy as my sister. Who isn't crazy at all. That was a real far-out scene you two tried to pull. i got to hand it to you two. You planned it so careful, so good. There wasn't a loophole in it. Except one. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> you don't, huh? Then let me explain. You set the whole thing up, the two of you. The marriage, the honeymoon trip across country and back, the fake murder, and the whole bit. Oh, and you played it smart. Very smart. Not a clue. I checked the marriage license bureau. No license. Easy enough. You could have bribed the clerk to destroy it. Now, look, you... I checked a few hotels. The big ones, like uh, the Ambassador, the Beverly in Los Angeles. No Mr. and Mrs. Howard Lansing listed. A piece of cake. When you're registered, you gave a different name. You're making yourself look like a fool. What you're saying is you could find no evidence. Oh, but I did. One little clue that neither of you thought about. The car, Mr. Lansing. Your pretty little red sports car. I, I don't follow. You will. I told you I found that dry space out on the street last night because a car, a little sports car like yours, had been standing there during the rain. Well, it could have been anyone's car. Sure. Same size as yours. Same wheelbase, but I agree, it could have been anyone's. Only it wasn't. It was yours. You want to know how I know? We'd be enthralled. I know, because last night, that car wasn't parked outside this house, but the one next door. I got to wondering about that. I kept saying to myself, if it was his car, why did he park outside the house next door? I came up with the answer today when I entered that house. Nobody there. And found fake blood all over the upstairs room. A gag knife. The kind you attach so it looks like you're stabbed. Even your clothes. And your luggage in the closet. Mr. Lansing. Oh, God. So you see, if it hadn't been for your car, I'd never have realized that brownstone houses in a row like these are identical. You bought this place, or leased it while Jen and him were on their honeymoon, didn't you, Miss Brady? I... Last night, when Jen went screaming into the street, you deliberately let her run into the street so you could bring her back to the house next door. This house. And her state wound up tight like she was. She never realized what you were doing, as you knew she wouldn't. You'll have to prove these accusations. I will. I can. With the one little clue that nails it all down at all four corners. The little red sports car again. What about it? Well, you told me you'd never driven across country. I never have. If you're thinking of the mileage on the car, that proves nothing. Well, not the mileage, Mr. Lansing. The servicing. Servicing? You had it serviced at the Beverly Hotel in Los Angeles. A lube job, oil change, new filter, the works. And like they do at all service stations, they slapped a little sticker on the door jam. That little sticker that carries the name and address of the service station... That little sticker that practically nobody ever notices. Anyhow, you didn't. And it says, Beverly Hotel Service Station, Los Angeles, California. Date and all. <coughs> Easy, Chan. Easy. <coughs> you're going to be okay. From here on in, you're going to be just... must have been a costly business, buying or leasing that identical brownstone house and furnishing it exactly like the one next door. But then, Maggie had all the money in the world, or thought she did. I'll return shortly. Spider's web, so strong and yet so weak, the human brain can be broken. But happily, again, like the spider's web, it can be repaired as good as new. Our cast included Lois Nettleton, Tony Roberts, Terry Keane, and Norman Rose. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. 
is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Marshall. Welcome to the sound of suspense, to the fear you can hear. What do you think about witches? Not the bony hags and atrocious crones of Shakespeare and legend, or the poor unfortunates of Salem, but witches who are young, witches who are beautiful, witches who even fall in love. Excuse me. Who let you in here? Well, I hope I'm not disturbing you. I'm only trying to make a deadline. Well, if you're in the news business, I've got something for you. It better be good. I... I'm going to have to kill my wife. That won't be news till you do it. I know. I want you to know why. Okay. Why? Because she's a witch. Our mystery drama, I Warn You Three Times, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Joan Loring. I'll be back shortly with Act One. One of those miserable stormy nights in the dead of winter. A thick, clinging, wet snow seems determined to smother the entire earth and everyone on it. You'd think that most people would choose the cheerful indoors, a warming fire, a relaxing drink, a comfortable bed. That's the problem with most people. You can't figure them. For instance, Consider that line of cars crawling down Main Street, bumper to bumper, skidding, sliding. Where is everybody headed on a night like this? Have we become a race of lemmings? Do we follow some mysterious, unconscious drive? An interesting speculation, but we won't pursue it. We'd better consider the traffic, which has come to a complete standstill. A car seems to be stuck at the intersection. Let's go, sister. That light's green. Oh, officer. Well, what are you waiting for, lady? Uh, my, my husband. Your husband? That, the, the light is red, and he said he wanted to step out and clean off the rear window. Uh, hey, mister. You finished back there? He just stepped out. It was a moment ago. Tom? Well, maybe he slipped in the snow. Tom, are you all right? Lady, there ain't nobody around the back. He just went out. Yeah, just yeah, the... yeah, yeah, to clean the rear window. Uh, that's what you said. But what could have happened? Uh, just sit there a minute, lady. Hey, lay off of that horn. I know you got one. Now, what's wrong, officer? Did you see a guy get out of that car up there? Did I see a guy get yeah, out of Yeah, 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 did you? Huh? Are the police after someone in the skate car? Oh, come on, Buster, just tell me. Did you see a guy cleaning off the rear window of that car up front? Well, I tell you the truth, I wasn't paying any attention. I was listening to the radio. Now, there could have been somebody, but then again, I, I couldn't say there was. 
Uh, it's not that I'm not trying to get involved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm a citizen. I know my duty, but... but yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Officer, where is my husband? He was just there. Lady, he uh, disappeared. How could he disappear? I don't know. I do know he ain't here. What am I going to do? Well, you can't keep blocking traffic, lady. you got to move on. Where? Well, I... it beats me. But you must find him. Look, you got troubles with your husband. That's your problem. But when you hold up traffic, but... that's my problem. Will you feed her a little gas, please? Come on, let's go. Let's but go. I can't. Lady, you got to go somewhere. I can't go anywhere. I don't know how to drive. <laughs> Desk, Lieutenant Carroll. Yeah. Nobody wants this guy, you say? Well, technically, that isn't true. His wife wants him. Okay. Well, look who's here. Lieutenant? You won't win any Pulitzer Prizes around this joint tonight, Peterson. I was hoping you might have a little bone to throw me. Page one? I'll settle for two inches on the bottom of page 38. If you promise to remember two R's and one L. First name, Irvin, not Irving. Lieutenant Irvin Carroll. We may have something shaping up. Ah. I don't know where it can go. Everywhere or nowhere. What have I got to lose? Sitting over there on the first bench. Ooh, that's nice. And married. Well, you win, you lose. A very, very weird story. Tell me about it. No, let her tell you about it. Why don't you ask her? Excuse me. Uh, My name is Fred Peterson. I... I'm a reporter for the Union Messenger. Oh, no. I don't want to talk to a reporter. Why not? Because I... Because you're afraid? Why? Could you put Tom's picture in the paper? Well, that depends. Has Tom done anything? He's disappeared. Well, we need the how, the when, the where. The when. About an hour ago. Where... On Route 986 at Main Street. How? I don't know. You see, we were driving south. It was snowing hard, and he said, I can't see out the rear window. The light was red. He stepped outside to wipe it off. He didn't come back. Where, where did he go? I don't know. Well, where could he go? I don't know. In that snow. And, and there's nothing around there? Could, could you give me a why? I... I can't imagine. I don't know what to do. I sit here waiting. Look, my name is Hetty Parsons. Tom and I, we've been married five years. We don't have any problems. I mean, we're very happy. If you print his picture in the story, maybe someone will see it who can help us. Excuse me a minute. Well? Yeah, I think I'll run with it. I don't blame you. I was always partial to girls with honey-colored hair and baby blue eyes. Ah, so you noticed, too. Have you run a check on her husband, Tom Parsons? Well, he's not one of the known bad boys. No record at all. And what did she say he did? He's an accountant. He has his own business in the Barstow building. You looked him up in the phone book? Checks out. They were headed south, huh? That's what she says. If it was a trip, there should have been bags. There were. His and hers? His and hers. How does it look? What do you want from me? I don't solve crimes. I sit here behind the desk. Come on, Lieutenant. Now, this is one for you, Fred. How could a guy disappear just like that? And in that storm. Hmm. There's no place to go. He could have had a car following in back of them. A friend was driving it, maybe. Well, he had to go somewhere. But why? Right now, we're treating it as missing persons. It's all we can do. He's not wanted for anything. He's a legitimate citizen, as far as we know. He hasn't even done anything to her. At worst, he left her in a car. He hasn't even deserted her. Yet, who was driving? He was. She can't. Well, that's abandoning her, isn't it? No. At best, we'd have him for abandoning the car. Yeah. Yeah, excuse me a minute. Listen, Mrs. Parsons. Yes. Why, why don't you go home? I've got my oh. car outside. Oh, no, no. I, I, I want to be here in case they find time. They'll let you know if they find him. No, I don't want to be home alone tonight. I... I... Just want to stay yeah, here. But it may be hours. It may be even days. Don't say that. I'm sorry. I. I'm just so jumpy and so nervous. I can't believe what's happened to me. Well, if you're going to sit here, you should have some coffee and a sandwich. Oh, I couldn't think of food. I'll be right back. <laughs> Hey there. 
Officer Dennis. Well, look who's here, the friendly reporter. Yeah, listen, that girl. Yeah, I was going to ask what girl, but yeah, I won't. Yeah, I, I, I want to start at the beginning. Oh, well, you know, Lieutenant Terrell's got two R's, but Patrolman Dennis got two N's. Yeah, 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 yeah. What did happen? Well, like she said, he went out to clean the rear window and he was gone. Yeah, anybody see him? Uh, I checked the car in back, but who looks? Who notices? Yeah, where could he have gone to around here? Well, on the south side, you got open fields. On this side, a couple of warehouse buildings locked up. Night watchman? Yeah, he's a retired cop. No sign of anybody trying to break in, to hide, or whatever he may have wanted to do. Okay, so what could have happened to the guy? Well, it's all very interesting, but in 15 minutes, I go off duty, and I won't have to worry about it. I didn't think I could touch a thing, but I must have been starving. Has there been any word? Yeah, you'll hear the minute they know. Now, listen, Hetty. I can help you, but you have to help me. I'll do whatever I can. We have two basic roads to explore. One, somebody was out to get your husband. Oh, no. No. Tom is the mildest, sweetest, most obliging guy on earth. He has absolutely no enemy. That you know about Tom and I have no secrets from each other. Everybody has at least one enemy. Tom is incapable of hurting anyone in any way. He sounds too good to be true. If he does have a problem, that's it. All right. The second road to explore. He wasn't pushed. He jumped. What does that mean? It means he walked out on you. Oh, it's it's, it's inconceivable. Why? Why? I've had a liberal education tonight, Mr. Peterson. Call me Fred. No, not yet, or maybe never. I've been introduced to a new world. I've been thrown in with people who basically don't believe in anyone, don't trust anyone, and perhaps they have good cause. Perhaps that's how life is in their world. Perhaps their world is the real world, but it isn't my world. May I ask, do you come from another world? It's entirely possible. I won't call you Fred unless and until we become friends. But that's just a little thing. The policeman who brought me here is a confirmed cynic. So is the lieutenant. And so are you. I must plead guilty as charged. All of you propose two basic hypotheses. A, my husband was ambushed by enemies. B, my husband abandoned me. You can't conceive of people who... They simply don't make or have enemies. You can't conceive of people who are completely in love. I'm not a fool, Mr. Peterson. I read these attitudes. What a wonderful world you live in, Mrs. Parsons. I hope you can stay there always. We're so dependent on each other, Tom and I. We need each other. We're... We're so complete together. But we still have the basic fact of his disappearance. Yes, but all you can see are two alternatives. There is a third, you know. Really? Perhaps he was taken ill suddenly and he just wandered off. Oh, maybe I should go back there. I've and... already been back there. There's no place he could have wandered off to. Tell me, does he have a history of any sort of illness, amnesia, oh, anything like that? No, nothing like that. Well, then, where are we? Nowhere. Perhaps you are nowhere, Mr. Peterson. Okay, tell me where you are. I have faith. I believe Tom will be found, or he will find himself, and he will have an absolutely reasonable and rational explanation. I hope so. Hey! Oh! Hey! Tom! Oh, Tom, darling. Tom, what happened to you? I was so scared. Oh, darling, you're all right. Hey, are you all right? Yes. I don't understand. I happened to tune in the news, and there it was. Tom Parsons' accountant with offices in the Barstow building had disappeared under mysterious circumstances. Oh, Tom, I was so worried. Mr. Parsons was driving with his wife. He stepped out of the car to clean off the rear window and... Hetty, what did you tell them? I wasn't in the car with you. I was at home. <laughs> Well, here we have the story of two people who love each other deeply, who trust each other completely. It sounds like the Garden of Eden. But we all know what happened back there in the traffic and the snow. We shall return shortly 
with Act Two. You've seen these couples, or rather heard of them. They dwell in a sea of perfect harmony, never a ripple of discord. But when they do have a disagreement, well, it's a beaut. Here we have Fred Peterson listening to Hetty and Tom Parsons having a fantastic difference of opinion. Tom! Tom, how can you say that? Hetty, darling, I was not in the car with you. I was home. Home! You said, let's get out of this miserable cold and snow. Let's head south for a couple of weeks. Hetty, when did I say that? How could I say that? Uh, you know I'm swamped with work at the office. You came home this afternoon, Tom. You said, how would you like to leave for Florida tonight? And I said, give me an hour to pass. Uh, excuse me. Who's he? Oh, he's just... A... I'm just Fred Peterson of the Union Messenger. A reporter? Oh, please, 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 don't be alarmed. I assure you it's a thoroughly respectable profession. Well, I... I see no point in... Well, emblazoning this all over the newspapers. Is there anything to emblazon, as you put it? This is a private affair. Tom, tell me what happened. What happened to you after you left me? Eddie, I told you I never left. Tom. How could I have left you? I wasn't with you. Oh, no, Tom. This time I have witnesses. The police officer, he knows you went out to clear the rear window. How does he know? Because he... Because you told him. Mr. Parsons, now obviously your wife seems distraught. I would suggest... Keep your suggestions to yourself, Mr. Peterson. Don't you dare imply that I'm overwrought or nervous or hysterical. I am completely calm, extremely rational, and absolutely in command of myself. I know what happened this evening. Mr. Peterson, this is obviously a private matter between my wife and me and nobody's business but ours. What did you mean, Mrs. Parsons... When you said that this time you had witnesses, have there been other times when... Hetty, it doesn't do us any good to air this in public. All right, Tom. Take me home. Uh, let me talk to that officer at the desk there. Find out if there's anything we have to do. Well? Well, what? Friend, husband, Tom. He didn't turn out to be quite as advertised. And what is that supposed to mean? He isn't quite the sweetest, mildest, most obliging guy on earth, is he? He is to me. I guess it's all a matter of how these words are defined, isn't it? And about this oh-so-complete understanding between the two of you. Won't you at least admit you're having a difference of opinion right now? I don't have to admit anything. Okay, okay, don't shoot. I'll go quietly. Are you sure you really want me to go? Please. Regardless... Of what you say to me, you are in trouble. No, I... no, don't deny it. Well, what if I am? I'd like to help you. Why? Because... Would because... you want to help me if I were middle-aged and fat and sloppy and ugly? It isn't ten minutes ago. You accused me of living in a world where no one trusted the next fellow or believed in him. You accused me of being a confirmed cynic. Is it possible you don't remember what you say from one minute to the next? I'm sorry. Don't be. There's a great deal to what you said. You're kind, but no one can help you. I could try. And no one should try, either. Why not? It's too dangerous. That was the wrong thing to say to me. I'm warning you. You're only getting me in deeper. Please, For Fred. openers, my business is to take chances and get myself into... Hey, you know what happened? What? You called me Fred. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have. But you did, and that means we're friends. Look, I only want... You're the one who set up the ground rules for this thing. First names are for friends only. Please, forget what happened here tonight. I warn you... You've already warned me twice. It won't work. I can only warn you three times. Do you mean you keep score? Please don't joke, Fred. You keep saying the wrong word, or I should say the wrong name. The wrong name is Fred. You can't call me Fred and expect me to forget everything. I warn you. I warn you for the third time. Forget all about tonight for your own sake, for your own safety. And after saying all that, you still expect me to forget about it. I... Tell my husband I'll wait for him outside in the car. Wait a minute, Hetty. I warned you, Fred. I warned you three times. Now, goodbye. Where's my wife? She said she'd meet you in the car. Uh... Mr. Peterson, if I were you, I'd forget everything that happened tonight. Is that a threat? No, a warning. That's all I've been getting around here, warnings. Well, for your own good, take them seriously. And if I don't? You'll regret it for the rest of your life. 
which may not be a long one. You still insist that you're not threatening me? I'm only trying to help you. Really? And why should you do that? Why? I don't know why. Maybe it's because the last guy tried to help me. What last guy? I didn't listen to him. The last guy? What do you mean? Uh, nothing. Forget it. You know, with you and your wife, it seems, everything turns out to be nothing and forget I it. don't think it matters now. I have an idea. It's already too late for you. I'm sorry. Good night, Mr. Peterson. Hey, Fred. Fred. Yeah, Lieutenant, I'm coming. Well? Well, what? There's nothing there for us boys in blue. What's in it for the fourth estate? Looks like he's trying to drive her nuts. It could also be the other way around. I don't think so. Because of that honey-colored blonde oh, hair? Lieutenant, Lieutenant, you always know where the exposed nerve is. Just stop and figure it. Couldn't this also be her way of trying to drive him nuts? As a reporter, I would have to say yes. But, uh, as a man? I don't know. Well, you got a problem, Fred. How are you going to tackle it? As a reporter? Or as a man? <laughs> Oh, Fred, what are you doing here? Won't you ask me to come in? Well, I... You could also offer me a cup of coffee. It's been a long drive on a cold morning. Oh, well, I suppose you might as well come inside. How gracious. I'm sorry. I'm... Uh, well, I'm, I'm still upset and you should know why. Come into the kitchen. I was just pouring myself a cup. Thanks. Charming place you have here. Thank you. I suppose Tom is generous enough when it comes to money and things. The implication being that he is not generous when it comes to what? Fred, if you insist on talking about Tom, I'll have to ask you to leave. Okay. Let's talk about you. No. We can't talk about me either. What can we talk about? The weather, politics, sports... You'd be surprised I'm a very well-informed person. We could talk about art or literature. I didn't come here to talk about those things. I know why you came here. Do you? Fred, I'm a married woman. But you're not a happily married woman. I'm happy enough. Okay. Let me tell you why I'm here. As a reporter, that is. It doesn't happen very often that you get a chance to be in on a story before it's a story. You follow me? No. Last night, all I could have gotten out of it might have been a squib on the back page, or maybe nothing. But something's happening here. Something's building. I don't know what it is. But one of you is lying. One of you is trying to destroy the other. And you think you can stop it? Oh, no, that's not my job. But there's going to be an explosion. And I want to be there when it blows. Because then, I'll have a story. And that's all this is. That's all I am to you. A story. I was talking as a reporter. But as a man... Yes? As a man, I'd... I'd like to help you, Hetty. Even if it meant losing your story? Yes. I'd like to believe that. Why can't you? I tried to warn you, Fred. Look, we had all that last night. I can't warn you anymore, but remember, I did warn yeah, you. Yeah, Sure. Don't brush it aside, Fred. Hetty, on the general subject of warnings, I've had a few in my day. From gangsters, from politicians. I mean from people who had clout. But I did warn you. Look, if you want me to, I'll sign a receipt. Let the record show that you warned me. You were right. He is trying to destroy me. Ah, finally. Why? I don't know. Okay, let's go through the standards. Is he after your money? I don't have any. Another woman? I don't think so. Is he tired of you? I don't know. Well, none of this is very helpful. I'm sorry. What was this business you were giving me back in the station house about your perfect marriage, about your perfect husband? Because he is. It's just... Well, now and then he, he imagines things like last night. What's now and then? Oh, every few months. One time he stranded me up in Maine. Another time we were supposed to go to Europe. He told me he would be delayed and to get on the plane he would make the next one. And there I was. All by myself in Paris. He denied everything. 
Has he seen a doctor? Yes. And? It hasn't done any good. Is he overworked? Oh, yes. Well, maybe he needs a long vacation. I'm sure of it. It all sounds pretty simple to me, except for one little item. Why have you insisted on warning me? Because it was the right thing to do. I don't understand. First, you imply that everything is so simple. Then when I start to believe it, you drop a little suggestion that throws me off balance. I, I can't seem to get anything definite out of you. Oh, but you did. What was that? A warning. Lieutenant Carroll. Hey, Lieutenant. How did you know I was going to ask you about the part? That honey blonde hair. Does it really show that much? Pal, you are hooked. You know something? That's true. And she may even be playing me like a fish. So what can I do for you? Well, no crime has been committed yet. But you can bet there's one on the way. Well, till then, we're handcuffed around here. Sure, but you got all the facts. What facts? I mean... I mean, you can get at them in a routine way. Work up both of them, some past histories. That's spending the taxpayer's money. You spend the taxpayer's money every day. Something's ready to blow up there. Just be ready for it. That's all I'm asking. Actually, Fred, if you want the truth, we've already started. And? Keep in touch. Yeah? They said you're in this office. Well, look who's here. Tom, Tom, the Piper's son. Come on in, sir. Mr. Peterson, I've decided to tell you everything. Because... Because I know you're in love with my wife. Oh, wait a minute. Now, there are all kinds of meaningless expressions. Wait a minute, see here, hold on, or if you... Let's dispense with them. You can't accuse me. I don't accuse you. I state a fact. Well, now, let's be fair. I only met your wife last night. I, I admit she's attractive. I don't even know her. <laughs> That's what I told him. That's what you told who? The last guy. The last guy she was married to. <sighs> I wish I knew how to start this. Well, start at the beginning. Okay. I'm an accountant. You're a reporter. Both of us are men of the world. I, I mean this world. You live on facts. I live on figures. So how can I tell you? How can I expect you to believe me when I say that Hetty isn't a human being at all? She isn't? No. She's a witch. A witch. Yes, that's what he said. A witch. But how can it be? Wasn't all that witch business over and done with more than 200 years ago? Well, that's what we intend to find out shortly when I return with Act Three. Tom Parsons and Fred Peterson sit in a newspaper office. Both are young, alert, stylishly dressed, every bit the modern, sophisticated men of today. And yet, the subject, the very serious subject under discussion is witchcraft, of all things. Well, it isn't every day a man accuses his wife of being a witch. It isn't every day a man finds out he's married to one. I can only say it's incredible. I know. That's what I said when he told me. When who told you? The last guy. Tell me about the last guy. I met Hetty on a cruise ship about five years ago. She said her husband had just somehow disappeared. She was distraught. <laughs> you know, she does the distraught bit to perfection. I know nothing of the kind. What happened? Had he, had he fallen overboard? Well, that's, that's what she made everybody think. Till we got a radiogram from shore. He claimed he knew nothing about the trip. Well, either he had boarded the boat or he hadn't. Okay, let's get all of that cleared away. There was a ticket in his name. There were some people who claimed they had seen him. The trouble is, there was a pretty drunk bond voyage party. Most everyone was in no shape to remember anything. Oh, yes, yes, the steward did claim to have seen him aboard, but... But? I'm convinced the steward was bribed. 
So I bought her story. I fell in love with her. Just as you did. And I helped her kill him. Just as you're going to help her kill me. Yeah, all right, Hank. I know what you think. You think I'm a nut. You could look it up. Five years ago, Stacy's Mountainville Lodge in the Adirondacks. She called me. She was desperate. Come up here. He's going to kill me. I flew up. I found them. They were near a cliff. She was screaming for help. I started fighting him off. I I guess he slipped. He, he fell over the side. He was killed. Look it up. Coroner's office. You'll see. An accident. Let's assume I buy all this. How does it make her a witch? Oh. She told me. She'll tell you afterwards. She's a witch. She falls in love with men, gets tired of them, and destroys them. I think you must I know. be... I know. I'm here to warn you. But I'm going to kill her first. Let me get you a cup of coffee. You're a fool. I'm here to save your life. Sure, sure. Okay. Look her up. I mean that. See if you can find a trace of her. See if you can find out where or when she was born, who her parents were. She has absolutely no background. I tell yeah, you... Don't, 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 don't oh, get excited. Lord, this is all so familiar. All of this is what he said to me. And what I said to him. Back there, before I killed him. Now, nobody's going to kill anybody. I don't know you. But you look like a nice guy. Take my advice. Save yourself. Save yourself. I'm not sure I should be here with you tonight, Fred. Well, you wouldn't let me visit you at home. Oh, it just wouldn't look right. Yeah, but it's all on the level. I'm a newspaper man. It's business. I'm doing a story. I had a very proper upbringing. Where were you raised, Hetty? I'd rather not talk about it. Why? Well, I told you it was proper, but it wasn't happy. I shouldn't say this, but there were times when I thought my parents were ogres. <coughs> Fred, is something wrong? No, 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 no. See, I, I just hope I, I, I didn't spill anything on you. No. I didn't have a happy childhood. I, I don't like to discuss it. Here's something we should discuss. I spoke with Tom this morning. I think I know what he told you. So far out, I even hesitate to mention it, but obviously he believes it. I insisted that he see a psychiatrist. In fact, we both went. And it's the doctor's opinion that Tom is riddled with guilt. You see, he thinks he murdered Larry. Larry? My first husband. But Larry was a brute. I was very young and... We're really too young to know anything about people. Larry was a drunk. I didn't know that either. And when he had a few, he would abuse me. Well, I shouldn't have done it, but I was terrified. I called Tom, and he came up and got into a fight with Larry, and, well, there was that accident. But why should he get that far-out notion about you? According to the doctor, it had to be something... Well, something he could live with, something that could justify what he did, and he really has a vivid imagination. Strikes me as a very sober-minded person, aside He was from... a lit major at college. He became an accountant because he had to make a living. I... I don't know what I'm going to do about him, Fred. I've had so much trouble in my life, and... He's really a wonderful guy, and I love him. Why does he want to destroy us? Why should he have a guilty conscience about Larry? Whatever happened was in self-defense. Well, look, everything will turn out all right. Oh, you're only saying that because you have to say something. No, I believe it. Hello? Tom? Yes, it's Tom. But you said you were working late. Well, I am. I just took a break for dinner. Join you? Please. Fred, you obviously didn't hear a word I said this morning, did you? I heard every word. Heard them all and listened to none? Tom, you're not well, and I think we... Oh, I know what you think. You think we should go away for a rest and all that. Forget it. 
I know what I have to do. And I'm going to do it. <laughs> Poor Fred. I feel sorry for you. You're in love with her. To keep the record straight, I'm a reporter. There's a story here. I aim to get it. Sure, sure. That's what you tell yourself. Let's go along with you, Tom. Suppose what you say is true. Suppose she's what you say she is. Why not walk out? Get a divorce. I can't. Why? I hope you never find out. You see, she destroys you. She takes away your capacity to love. Your feelings, your mind... It's as if you are only just nourishment for her. And when everything you have to give is gone, she discards you for someone else. Tom, for your own sake, I think you should be under a doctor's care in a hospital. I suppose I should. But I want to save you. It'll make up for Larry. I must apologize, Fred, for exposing you to all this. I shouldn't have come here. But you wanted to expose him to all this. That's why you came here. You know I always eat here when I work late. Tom, I'll do anything you want. Just tell me. <laughs> Disappear. As a supernatural person, you can arrange that without any problem. Please, Fred, go now. Leave us alone. But I don't want to... He's my problem. I have to live with it. And if you stay, well... An audience always excites him. <laughs> Look who finally showed up. What happened to that Nobel Prize for Journalism you were working on? Tenet, there is no Nobel Prize for Journalism. Oh. Well, what happened anyhow? I got off it all. Couldn't make heads or tails. Well, we're still on it. As a matter of fact, information keeps pouring in all the time. On her? On him. Funny duck. He was always interested in spirits, that kind of thing. He wrote his master's thesis on something called... Uh, Demonology. Well, there's nothing there for me. As a man or a reporter? Both. You know, I've been married ten years, and I've never been tempted. But if I could be, she could do it. Oh, that dame or something. I'm surprised at you, Lieutenant. But there's hope for you. If what you say about the husband is true, he winds up uh, in the loony bin, and after a respectable interval, she could be yours. That's what's in your mind, right? You are the most cynical person I know. Come off it. We're two of a kind. I'd even wait for her myself. <laughs> Lieutenant Carroll. Is uh, Fred Peterson there, please? Hold on, I'll see. It's uh, the girl you love. Cut it out. Okay, the girl we love. You here? Yeah. Yeah, I guess I'm here. Take it. Hello? Fred, I'm scared. What's the matter, Hetty? Don't ask any questions. Just come to my place. Quickly. Come in, Fred. Oh, darling, I'm so glad you're here. Hetty, Hetty, why are you shaking like that? I'm frightened. I'm so frightened. Please, please, Hetty, calm down. I'm here. Everything is going to be all right. I know it. I know. It's wrong for me to talk to you like this. To feel like this. But I, I can't help no, it. No, no, we'll work it out. Somehow we'll work it out. No, no, no. Why are you scared? I. He asked me to take his suit to the cleaners this morning. And I found this in his pocket. It's a receipt. Read it. From Carrington's one double action Danforth Wilson revolver, caliber 32. He bought a gun. Don't you see? He bought a gun. All right. Why would he buy a gun if he didn't want to kill me? Well. I think we have enough to interest the police now. Are you sure about that? Tom. Well, answer the question, Fred. What do you expect from the police? I have a permit for this gun. I have every right to own it. Now look, Tom, I get very nervous when people point guns at me. Maybe it's unreasonable, but do you, uh, do you mind putting that, that thing away? Well, I will. After I use it. No, Tom. Don't be a fool. You're not a killer. I always thought that. Till just now. Tom, listen. Let's say you're right, that she is a witch, okay? Don't you see? You couldn't kill her anyhow. You'd empty the gun at her. It wouldn't mean a thing. Fine. Why don't we find out? I won't no. let you. Get away from me, Fred. No. Come on, step up. Right. 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 Give me that gun. gun. If you move, I'll kill you. Come on. Just lower it. Drop it. Take a step. I'm going to kill her. No, drop it. Drop it. Oh. Oh. Tom. You did it. Again, Eddie, it 
did it. Again. Call a doctor, Eddie. Oh. What for? Oh, you poor sucker. You think she... Oh, she's not worth it. Oh. You think she's paradise? She is. Ah, oh, she is. But it doesn't last. It doesn't last. And then she'll kill you. She'll kill you, too. Tom. He's... He's dead. Tom. You saw, you saw there was nothing I, I could do. I know. I know. Better call, please. <laughs> Lieutenant Carroll. Lieutenant, it's Fred. Hey, Fred, I got news for you. What I mean is I have absolutely no news for you. Lieutenant, listen to me. You know, we, we drew a complete blank on that dame. We trace her back to St. Louis City Hall, where she married a guy named Larry Bellows. She gave her home address as Charterville, Illinois. But there's no such place. Listen, Lieutenant. It's as if this dame just materialized out of thin air. No background at all. Wait a minute. Eddie. Who are you? Hello? Oh, Fred. Fred, why did you call? Who are you, Eddie? Fred, what's on your mind? Eddie. I warned you three times, Fred. I warned you three times. <laughs> And how many warnings would you have needed? Or heeded? That's the trouble. When they have honey blonde hair, it's so hard to take them seriously. A mistake. You should always take every woman seriously. We'll be back shortly. Are there really witches? Everyone must keep his own counsel on the matter. However, if you should happen upon a damsel in distress, and she has honey blonde hair and baby blue eyes, remember, we warned you three times. Our cast included Joan Loring, Mason Adams, Tom Keena, Alan Manson, and Sam Gray. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. of life and death, but rather death and life. I offer you one small comfort. It could hardly happen today. But in the last century, 
on the old Montgomery estate in Maryland, in the great, dark, rambling house called Westerly. It was easier to be marked for death than in this one. Yes, Mother. You look at home in your coffin. Sleep fast. It's taken many years. But you've made your son a very happy man. It's all mine at last. Westerly, the money, the jewels. I'm my own man. How I've hated you the way you kept me on a leash like some old hound dog. Well, now the money's mine. And you'll hardly need the rings they've let you wear to your grave. I'll take them so I can buy them. You'd hang on to them uh, even if that. Uh, uh, you're alive. You're not dead. Uh, Help me now. I should have known you'd come back to haunt me. Even before we got you to the grave. Our mystery drama, Cold Storage, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Ruby Dee and John Barraglay. It is sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. robbing a grave. Many years before Buford Montgomery found himself engaged in essentially the same activity, were every bit as shocked when the corpse whose rings they were tearing off suddenly sat up, alive. An epileptic seizure in other times could counterfeit death. The ghouls, of course, had a recourse. They ran away. Buford Montgomery has to stay and face his problem. Buford, will you put me down? Well, when I'm ready. I am quite able to walk. I, I want to make sure you don't run. What are you talking about? What, what are you doing? Locking me in? No, no, no. Keep away from me. It's all right, Mother. I'm not going to harm you. I, I heard you standing over me in that coffin. I, I want the... I need Dr. Wayne. That doddering old numbskull. He almost had you buried alive. You know he signed your death certificate. But how could he? I am alive. Oh, yes. I'm quite satisfied you are no ghost. But what what happened? Another of your epileptic seizures. Oh. We were all convinced this one was fatal. At last. Only it wasn't. Quite a disappointment to my beloved son. Well... At least I know now where we stand. Now, you open that door and send Hannah up to me. Not yet, Mother. Why? Because, you see, we don't really know just quite how we stand, do we? Buford, don't... Don't you look at me like that. How was I looking, Mama dear? You... You want me dead back in that coffin. I want all the things I thought were finally mine. The house, the estate, the money, and most, oh, most of all, the freedom to be a man. Look at me, Mama. (laughs) Listen to me call you that, Mama. A grown man, 38 years old, tied to his mother's apron strings like like some sniveling little boy. I I never meant to keep you tied down. Oh, yes, you did. You even did it with the judge. Father's life wasn't his own either. You killed him. You... You are mad. Keep away. Keep away. You want to kill me. I'm not going to kill you, Mama. You know I haven't got the strength of will for that. Oh, oh, of course you won't, son. But you can have anything you want now we've had this little talk. Now, now please get Hannah like a good boy. Oh, no, Mama. I don't need you anymore. You left me everything in your will. But I'm not dead. To all the world except me, you are. And you're going to stay that way. If you come one step closer, I'll scream. No one will hear you. Not in this big old house. Westerly's thick walls have no ears. What What are you going to do to me? You'll see, Mother. 
You'll see. Look, you... You... You don't... Go and get... Put me back in that coffin and... And... Marry me, you love Yes. I haven't any choice now. Oh, please, please, please. Don't worry. You'll be quite comfortable. I'm going to bury you alive. But not in the coffin. <laughs> Anna. Yes, Master Buford. I want you here, in the hall. What is it, sir? Where's William? He's in the stable, Master, grooming the horses for the funeral tomorrow. You want I should fetch him? I... No, not yet. Uh, sit down. I want to talk to you. Yes, sir. Now, where to begin? Uh, uh, Hannah, you were mighty beholden to my father, weren't you? Judge Montgomery was a fine man. Was very kind to you and your son. The judge was powerful good to me and William. And my mother? Mrs. Montgomery is a fine lady. It's been a privilege to have served her as housekeeper. And will you consider it a privilege to serve me in the same capacity? If you want me, sir. And William? Where I go, William goes. You know, he's just a, a, a great big overgrown baby. Has to be cared for like one. Or they'd shut him away somewhere, isn't hmm? I wouldn't ever let them do that to my boy. He couldn't stand being shut in. He'd... Why, he'd... You wouldn't let them do that to him, would you, Master Buford? Not if I can count on you to help me. You can, sir. You can. Well, uh, what about William? He does what I tell him. He's old as you are, but he has the mind of a child. I'd want to be absolutely sure of both of you. I don't understand you, Master Buford. Then I'll make myself plainer. I think you must have always hated my mother. Why did you stay on after Father died? I stayed because I... Where else could I go? You're sure it wasn't because you were afraid? Afraid of what? Not of, Hannah. For. <gasps> For William. Right? Right? Oh, don't look so terrified and, and trapped. I know it all, Hannah. I know it all. Master Buford, I... How I... you must really hate us all. Even father at the end. Not the judge. Never the judge. Even after what he made you sign? What would the judge ever have wanted me to sign? A confession that you saw your son William commit a murder ten years ago. Oh! How did you know... It's one of the advantages of my dear mother's unexpected death. It was among the papers the lawyer turned over to me. So she did know. All these years. <laughs> How could Randolph have done that to me? You know why. You were an eyewitness. And you know that William wasn't alone. It was an accident. And you were only boys. Pretty old for boys, Hannah. We were both going on 19... And the Copley kid was only 15. It was only my father being a judge that saved us all. Any jury in horse country like this could have told that boy's neck wasn't broken by any fall from a horse. The finger marks were gouged into the flesh. The rope burns were raw on his wrists. Why did you do it, Master Buford? Not I, Hannah. Remember? William was the culprit. William didn't know what he was doing. You egged him on. If I did, I didn't mean it to go so far. William didn't... doesn't know his own strength. What does it matter? It's nearly 20 years ago. Why do you rake up old ashes? There are certain things I have to be sure of. What? In spite of everything, your complete loyalty to me. I have little choice if you have any confession. I have it. In your own handwriting. And William's squall, too. I'm going to ask you to stretch your conscience further. Come with me. No, no, Master Buford. Don't bring me to the coffin. I don't want to look at her. Stop I don't want to. Stop that. Here. Look. Open your eyes. Oh. It's empty. She's gone. What have you done with her? She's in her bedroom. Upstairs. What's she? <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> I'm afraid that blind old boggler, Dr. Wayne, slightly exaggerated my mother's untimely end. You mean she's alive? And unfortunately quite well. <laughs> I see the news is as disappointing to you as it was to me. Oh, don't try to hide it, Hannah. You know you hated her quite as much as I. I won't deny it. The humiliation. The day-by-day degradations your mother has put me through all these years since your father died. I can never forgive her for them. I'm glad to hear it. When she was dead, I was glad. God forgive me. It was one of the happiest days of my life. And mine. That's why she's going to stay dead, Hannah. You're mad. You can't murder your own mother. Nothing is further from my mind. No. Dear Mama will come to no physical harm. You and William will see to it that her bodily needs are well taken care of. And I, as complete master of Westerly at last, will see to it in turn that you and William are taken care of. What are you going to do with her? First of all, Hannah, you're going to explain to William. Then bring him here so we can nail up this coffin and the burial services can be completed tomorrow. Master Buford, no, you can't. Better tell William to bring a sack of meal or corn. Won't do to have the coffin too light. How? How on earth can you hide your mother from from everyone? (laughs) On earth. That's very apt. I'll tell you what we're going to do with her, Hannah. Just what we do with the roots and the preserves. We're going to put Mama in cold storage. Make sure to drive them home, William. Do seem a shame burying a whole good sack of good feed. I picked up the worthiest one I could find. That's enough now. Finish up. Finish now. Got the ladder, Hannah? Yes, sir. All right. Did you strip the bed in the spare room, Hannah? Yes, sir, I did. William, you go on up there and bring that bed and all the furniture downstairs to the old hidey hole, right? Sure will. Where's this this hidey hole? William could tell you as good as me. Or better. He's the one who found it. Must be, oh, uh, 15 years ago. 16, Master Buford. That was the year Miss Prudence dropped her first fold. That's when old Mr. Todd Hunter, the vet man, told me all about his daddy and your grandfather and how they dug out the hidey hole and made it out of big room like a station on the Underground Railroad. William, go see to the furniture. Yes, sir. Take me a while to get the bed apart. Take your time. The Underground Railroad? You mean this was a slave station? To hide out escaped slaves being passed as the north? What it was. But you can't put your mother in a place like that. Why not? She spent her lifetime trying to turn the clock back, make a slave of everyone else. Why shouldn't it be her turn for a change? How sharper than a serpent's tooth it is to have a thankless child, as King Lear had occasion to remark. Still, on the record... Mama is not much of a prize either. Let's leave her in cold storage until we return shortly with Act Two. In the weeks that pass, Mrs. Randolph Price Montgomery is finding her quarters somewhat less elegant than she liked. But at least they are less confining than a coffin. Buford, her son and now heir, has been living as high as he promised himself in cutting a swath as the county's most sought-after bachelor. I declare, Buford, I thought I'd never be able to coax you away from all the other ladies. Nancy Lee, they may have had my arms, but my heart was with you. Well, I'd have felt a lot sure of that if I'd had your name a little more often in my car. I just don't want us to get talked about too much. Why ever not? Would you be ashamed to have your name linked with mine? Why, Nancy Lee, you know better than that. Aren't you going to sit with me, Susan? Oh, why, why, sure, honey. Hold my hand. Just lies in mine like a little bird. Now that's more like 
my Buford. Kiss me. Angel. Still the same old thrill. Gives me goosebumps all over. Oh, that's nice. I wouldn't want to think I'd lost the power to get you going. Why would you think that? Well, I'll tell you, Buford. I thought when your mother died, it would give us a chance to be closer than ever. I mean, since we could come right out in the open. I didn't think it would start you chasing after every pretty girl in sight. I wouldn't take a one of them or exchange any of them for you. Now, I'm right glad to hear you say that, Sugar, because I'm afraid you're not going to be a bachelor anymore. Huh? I got something to tell you. You're going to have to go back to being a family man again, I'm afraid. What? What, what, what are you saying? That, that you're going to be a daddy. Aren't you proud? Good Lord. Are, 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 are you sure? <laughs> that I'm in a family way? Well, it's very easy for a girl to be sure of that. Well, um, what, 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 are we, what are we going to do? Well, with Mama gone, there's no problem at all. You're just going to have to make an honest woman of me. My parents surely won't object. And <laughs> you wouldn't want the colonel to come after you with a gun knowing that my daddy is the best shot in South Carolina. Now, wait a minute, Nancy Lee. You... Oh, Sugar, you know I'm only funning. And I know you're going to be every bit as happy as I am once you get used to it. Oh, honey, aren't you just thrilled to death? We're going to get married. <laughs> Come in. Excuse me, Master Beauty. What is it, Hannah? It's about Mrs. Montgomery. She isn't that yet. I meant your mother, sir. Oh. Oh, what about her? She keeps asking for you. Well, tell her I'm... Just don't tell her anything. You haven't said anything about the wedding tomorrow. No, sir, but... Uh, she... But what? About your mother. She... She wants to talk to you. And it does seem so inhumane to keep her locked up alone. She sees you or William every day, doesn't she? Yes. Her quarters are comfortable and clean, aren't they? Yes. She's in perfectly good health? Oh, yes. Never better. More's the pity. Well, then? She's... She's lonely. So was I all those years she had me under her thumb. And I'm not going back to that. By tomorrow, I'm going to have my own woman. And a beauty at that. Mother's not going to spoil that for me. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, sir. Good. Now get out of here. And take the whiskey carafe with you and fill it up. It's almost empty again. Yes, sir, Master Buford. Sir? William? Yes, Mama? Take this carafe and fill it with Master Buford's bourbon and bring it back to him in his study. Yes, sir. <laughs> I reckon old Master Buford's getting himself liquored up for the bachelor party. <laughs> I reckon he's trying to build himself some Dutch courage. What do you mean, Ma? I mean, I don't think he exactly figured on getting tied up again when he cut his mama's apron string. Beautiful. Look at that. It started into rain. Such a pretty night, too. Hmm. Let's go on up to bed, hmm? My husband. All he ever seems to think of now he's made me his little goods and chattel. Nancy Lee, all I mean was I'm tired. Tired of me after two short weeks? Now, you know I didn't mean that. Well, come in and lay your head on Mama's breast. Don't say that. Well, heavens, don't be so sensitive. Your Mama's dead and gone. Yes. Although sometimes, I swear to goodness, I get to see them in this rickety old house. She's still sort of around. Oh? What makes you think that? Well, don't jump so, darling. It's, it's just a just a spooky feeling. Maybe you and me should have gotten rid of Westerly and gone back on to South Carolina with Mom and Papa. No. We can't leave here. Well, all right, sugar. Don't take on, so. I, I, I didn't mean to jump at you. Oh, of course you didn't. You're just so kind to little old me, and you were so generous to lend the colonel all that money to go back south with Mama to build up our old, lovely old plantation again. It must be the size of half the state what it's costing to restore it. Well, it had gotten run down, sort of, but 
You've nothing to worry about, Buford. You'll get the money back. Of course, of course, Nancy Lee. <gasps> what is it? Oh, this old porch. It, it's starting to leak like a sieve. I'll have William look at it in the morning. That big old lame brain. Buford, if we're going to stay here at Westerly, I want some changes made. I'd like to do some rebuilding. We can discuss that in the and morning. I want some new servants. I don't want that silly old William and Hannah around. They've got to go. No. But Buford... I... Whatever happens, William and Hannah stay. And we stay. That's final. My Buford, you are so masterful when you get mad. I could just swoon. <laughs> Come on, let's go on up to bed. And I'll show you just how wonderful it is to be married. I came out with your mother's train, Master Buford, and she nearly caught me. What the Sam Hill was Nancy Lee doing in the cellar? I don't know. She didn't see anything? I'm sure not. Does she suspect anything? I don't think Damn I... Damn that woman. That's her now. Get out, Hannah. I'll handle this. Yes, sir. Nancy Lee. What the devil were you doing down in the cellar? No need to take on, so I was... I was just making up my mind where to put the wine cellar. What wine cellar? The one we're going to build in the back there. What for? Well, I intend to start entertaining, having guests to stay... Well, bring this house alive. No. No wine cellar and no guests. And you stay out of that downstairs. Don't you order me around. I'll do what I want in my own house. What did you mean by locking me out of our bedroom last night? I don't allow anyone who can't behave like a gentleman in my room. If you think just by withholding your favors from me, you can get your own way. You listen to me, Buford. One way or another, I always get my own way, and don't you forget it. Master Buford, Master Buford, you can't sleep here on the floor, sir. Well, uh, uh, oh, yes. Uh, got to, Hannah. Um, wife won't let me in, in bedroom. Come on, sir. You've been drinking. I've made you up a bed in one of the guest rooms. Want to sleep on bedroom, not guest room. <laughs> Ironic, isn't it, Hannah? Don't have much luck with, with the ladies, huh? Out of the frying pan into the fire. <laughs> she, she's got to go. Except can't because of baby. Got child to think of. Can't figure that one out. I... William, is my horse ready? Morning, Nancy Lee. My, ain't you the prettiest thing? I asked about my horse. Oh, yes, this Nancy, I combed and curried and shined that old horse. Would you bring him around to the front? Yes, sir, Miss Nancy. And the name is Mrs. Montgomery. Yes, Mrs. Montgomery. Oh, get out of my sight. When you bring him around, let me know. I'll be in the parlor. Buford? Here. Hannah said you wanted to see me. I want to talk to you. I'm afraid I don't have time. I'm going riding. That's what I want to talk to you about. Do you think it's wise? What? All this riding in your condition. In my condition? Oh, man. I'd near forgotten. Forgotten? How could you forget the baby you're carrying? I'm sure I wouldn't if I were. Only I'm not. I never had one. What? Oh, Buford, don't splutter so. If you'd have a brain in your head, you'd have realized that long ago. It, it was all a trick to get me to marry you. At the time, you seemed such a cat, and the competition was a little heavy, so I thought I'd just make sure of you. And it worked. I'm really sorry to have disappointed you about the child. <laughs> disappointed? You don't know how relieved I am. Now there's no problem. What do you mean, no problem? To end this marriage, to get a divorce. You think that's no problem? It shouldn't be. I'm prepared to make a reasonable settlement. And just what would you consider reasonable, Mr. Montgomery? We can waive the money I loaned your father and call it a day. <laughs> the money you loaned my father? That wasn't a loan. That was a little payoff for a nice background of southern gentility to trap me a man. The colonel and his wife are just as phony as I am, dear heart. And they are long gone. I'm where I want to be with a name I like, and I'm not giving it up for anyone. You are never going to get rid of little Nancy Lee. No how, no way at all. Now, if you'll excuse me, dear husband, I... Why, Hannah. Hello. Did you get a nice earful? 
The door was open, Mrs. Montgomery, and William asked me to come in here and tell you that he's waiting outside with your horse. He could have told me himself. And I hope that damn beast throws her and breaks her neck. All right, Hannah, what are you waiting for? It's your mother, sir. She's in a state. She insists on seeing you. No. I've had enough of Montgomery women for one day. Tell her I... No. Forget that, Hannah. I've changed my mind. I think I will pay Mama a visit. I have a little surprise for her. But you can't be so cruel, Buford. Keeping me here locked up like a... Like an animal. You, you've you got to let me go. You know I can't do that, Mother. I've explained again and again why you can't suddenly turn up alive. Oh, but I can't stand it anymore. It's like being buried alive. Oh, oh Buford, it's so... So lonely. I know that, Mama. <laughs> and I know it's just plain isn't fair. So I thought of a solution. Oh, what, dear? How would you like to have a nice, permanent companion. Did I make an unguarded statement that Buford was no match for the ladies? Perhaps in one sense that's true, but in another, well, it seems that Nancy Lee is going to have cause to regret her match with Buford. We'll find that out shortly when we return with Act Three. It's one thing to get away with disposing of someone already legally certified as dead and supposedly suitably interred. Nancy Lee is another problem. She can't have a convenient epileptic seizure. Can Buford get away with it? Nancy Lee, I've been thinking about us. Don't waste your time. Nothing's going to change. I've got nobody but you and nowhere in the whole wide world to go. I'm a permanent fix, to Buford. Oh, I know that, honey. And I was wrong to think anything else. Don't you know I really want you here with all my heart? On my terms. Don't you try to fancy talk me. Won't you please let me tell you what I was thinking about? If you make it short... And sweet. What I was going to suggest, just to clear the air, sort of, and give us both a chance to get a new perspective was a trip. I don't want to go anywhere with you. Oh, I, I, I didn't mean to gather. I meant just you alone, sugar. Washington, Baltimore, Philadelphia. You could buy yourself a whole new wardrobe. L like, like it was the trousseau you never really had. Oh, Washington, Baltimore, Philadelphia. Even Paris, France, if you want. Paris, France. Oh, beautiful. Do you mean it? Anything's worth trying just to work things out for us. And to prove I mean it, you, you just go tell all your friends and everyone around that you're on your way. Oh, won't I make them squirm with envy? Washington, Philadelphia, Paris, France. Then you'll go? What woman will pass up the chance? Well, I'll ride everywhere this week and let everyone know. Just one thing, Buford, you ought to understand. Well, what's that, sugar? This doesn't change anything. I'm still going to spend the rest of my life right here in this house. Oh, I know that, Nancy Lee. I know that for sure. Buford. You just can't get away with it. Now you hush up, Hannah. I'm going to. But what will other people say? There's nothing for them to say. Nancy Lee went off on a little trip and she never came back. Master Buford, you're flying in the face of God. Hannah, to the devil with it. Now you do as I say, here? Yes, sir. Now you and William have already got the extra bed set up downstairs and the chest of drawers and so on. Yes, sir. Fine. Then get busy and take all Ms. Montgomery's clothes downstairs. Shouldn't take you too long. Most of her wardrobe is already packed. What am I going to tell your mother? Ever since we moved the extra furniture in, she's been like to, to drive me out of my mind asking questions. You haven't told her who to expect. You said not to. That's quite right, Hannah. We have to preserve the proprieties. I think it's my place to introduce my mother to my bride. Oh, Miss Montgomery? What is it, Hannah? Master Buford asked me to have you go right downstairs as soon as you got back from riding. But I want a bath and change. He said right away, the moment you got here. Why? He said he had a little surprise for you. Oh, very well. Buford? Nancy Lee? 
Uh, yes. Uh, what do you want me for? Come on down. I'll show you. Oh, for goodness sake. Hold that lantern a little higher. I can't see. Uh, how's that? Better. Right over here by the back wall. Hannah said you had a surprise. Why, Buford, you're going to do it. Do what? Put in my wine cellar while I'm gone. Something like that. Of course, we'll have to build regular bins instead of these old rickety shelves. You know what I thought when I was looking about down here before? Oh, what was that? If we tore down these shelves... Well, what I mean is, I was sort of stepping off the house upstairs, and it's some longer than this cellar. Is it? Yes, I walked off the cellar, too. You suppose there might be any room behind there we could sort of scoop out to make it bigger? Now, why don't you and me just try and find out? Why don't we? Of course, I reckon you'll need help. Oh, I don't think so. It might be quite easy. Like, um, like this, for example. <gasps> it's a secret door. And a room. There's someone in there. A room you're going to be sharing for a long time. No, no. No, I won't go in Oh, there. yes, you will. <laughs> I'll scream. You, you'll do as you're told. Oh, Alice, you bit my hand. You, you can't. Get in there. You can't keep me in here. I'll scratch your eyes out. Oh, no, you won't. You'll keep your mouth shut for once and do as you're told. Oh, no, I won't. You wouldn't dare shoot me. Don't tempt me. You put, put that pistol down. <gasps> it can't be. Who are you? Don't you remember the first Mrs. Montgomery? But... Mother. Your mother's dead. A popular misconception. Let's just keep this private, shall we? You. You really judge M Montgomery's wife? Certainly. Buford, what is this slut doing here? Now, Mama, that's not nice. Isn't this that Nancy Lee person I warned you to stay away from? Yes, sir. Maybe about the one time you were right, Mama. Well, get her out of here. I don't want her. And I demand you release me, too. You know I can't do that. The best I can do is provide you with Nancy Lee. You're not going to lock me up with this horrid old woman. Now, that's no way to talk to your mother-in-law. Her uh, uh, what? Oh, I'm sorry, Mama. In all the excitement, I forgot to tell you. Nancy Lee's my bride. We got married. Oh. That makes you both, Mrs. Montgomery. That's how come I thought it would work out real nice to have you roommates. Sort of keep it all in the family. Ma! Ma! Take the lie, William. You startled me so I almost burnt my hand on the stove. Ma, what are we going to do? What is it, son? Here. Here, sit down. It's shaking all over. You know that big old stone you wanted down in the preserve cellar to make a table of? For making cornmeal and such? Yes. Well, a while ago I took it to bring it on down for you. You lifted that heavy stone by yourself? It's what happened when I was down there. What? Well, I, I didn't have no light. And I didn't hear Master Buford come on down there. But all of a sudden, I see him light a lantern. And as far as I can say anything, Mrs. Montgomery come on down there to join him. I know. I sent her down there. You? You knew what he was going to do to her? Son, you got to understand. I can't help myself. You knew he was going to throw her in that hidey hole with old Mrs. Montgomery? I knew. <laughs> but she's so pretty. And he hurt her, Ma. Master Buford hurt her. He took that little girl that's like a... like a little chickadee bird. And he's going to shut her up in there. Don't think about it now, son. I, I got to think on it. I couldn't be shut up, Ma. I couldn't be shut up nowhere. I know that, son. I just take my own throat with my hands like I've done with... with someone else. Long time ago, I... Don't, William. Don't do that to yourself. <laughs> no. Not to me. To Master Buford. To Master Buford 
Unless he lets her go. That's who I got to. No, William, no. Listen to me. Let me explain. Let me go, Ma. Let go. William, you've got to understand that I... Ma? Ma, are you all right? I hope I, I, I didn't hurt you. Ma? No. You all right? Just sleeping. I'll wake you, Ma. I'll wake you just as soon as I set that poor little bird free. I spent my life trying to get free of you, Mama, and I did. Then I got myself trapped again. Now I've got to get free of Nancy Lee, too. Goodbye. You'll never see me again. You can't leave me here with this old woman. I can't be shut up anymore. You've been drinking again. You look drunk. You... I feel drunk. Drunk with relief. <laughs> Hannah and William are all you'll ever see from now on. As far as I care, you could both rot. Oh. What's that funny smell? My head. I need a drink. What? Who's that? It's me, Master Buford. I'm sorry for... for what I got to do. <coughs> Master Buford. <coughs> Master Buford. <coughs> I didn't mean to do nothing, Master. I didn't mean to do nothing. It was just... a bird has to fly free. You can't keep it locked up. William! William! Are you down there? I'm here, Ma. What are you doing? What's happened? Where's Master Buford? I'm glad you woke up, Ma. S something's happened to Master Buford. Oh, my God. Move aside. Let me see. I didn't mean him no harm. It was just Miss Nancy. I didn't want to hurt him, Ma. Ma? He's dead. Oh, William. William, you killed him. I never even touched him, Ma. How would you know? Poor, twisted mind. How would you know? Heaven help me. What are we going to do now? I've got to think. <laughs> I'm all packed. And William is taking my things down to the carriage now. What about you, Mother? <laughs> I suppose you have to call me that. We might as well get used to it. Just as you have to try to sound a little fonder when you talk to your daughter, Nancy Lee. Very well. Nancy Lee. And I not only am all packed, but my trunks have already been taken to the railroad station. All ready for our new life. Yes. Oh, come on now. This was all worked out before the funeral. And you've had a lovely time of it, haven't you? Playing the bereaved widow, being wined and dined in sad farewell. Well, I had to stay hidden at home. Well, you could scarcely come popping out of the grave without creating a legal snarl. I know, I know. It's better this way. I hope we can smuggle me out successfully. At night, in Hannah's cape, there'll be no question. Hmm. Nothing left to be done. I don't think so. Hannah and William will stay with the house until the estate is sold. And the lawyer will forward us the money wherever we settle. <laughs> wherever we settle. You and I. Not much of a life to look forward to. It's the best your son left us. Your husband. Buford. Buford. Uh... I wonder about his death. Why? The doctor certified it is a heart attack. You don't think William... Oh, no. William is so simple-minded that if he says he never touched him, he never did. No, it was something else. What? Uh, that was the same doctor who wrote out my death certificate. You don't suppose Buford by any chance could have had epilepsy? It's a disease that does run in the family, you know. You 
If Sarah Montgomery should have been right, then poor Buford went to far more than his just reward. After all, the coffin was already in the ground for over a week. But that's really too horrible a prospect to dwell on, isn't it? I'll return shortly. Before I go, I really do owe you an apology for that quite dreadful picture of poor Buford Montgomery awaking to far more confined quarters than he condemned his mother to. But as a storyteller, you have to agree, the irony is perfect. And then, of course, also, I did promise to curdle your blood. Our cast included John Barragray, Ruby Dee, Bryna Rayburn, Roxy Roker, and Todd Davis. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Welcome to the sound of suspense, to the fear you can hear. For the next 52 minutes, I will be your trainer. I say trainer because we are concerned with a horse, a remarkable, powerful stallion who not only runs, but who thinks. And what does he think about? In our spine-tingling tale, he will think most about revenge. Go, Spartacus, go! You'll find him. You'll catch him. And what you do, he's yours. All yours. Emily! Emily, here I am! I am Spartacus. See him. I'm here, Emily! Get him! Go, go, get him! Go, 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 go. Our mystery drama, Death Rides a Stallion was written especially for the Radio Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Mason Adams. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll be back shortly with Act One. five-year-old chestnut stallion. He's in the prime of his glorious life. He has fire in his eyes and steel springs in his legs. The powerful muscles ripple beneath his shiny, velvety coat. And he also has a mind of his own. He's a rebel who acknowledges no master. That's why he's called Spartacus. But if he has no master, he does have a mistress. A slender, freckle-faced girl named... Emily, and he will respond to her slightest touch, her softest whisper. Whoa, Spartacus, right here. <clears throat> steady, boy, steady. Good boy. Listen, Spartacus, here he comes now. Here I am, Frank. Oh, good morning, Uncle Harry. Oh, morning, Emily. Do I uh, detect a faint tone of disappointment? Disappointment? Oh, why, Uncle Harry, you're my favorite human being. Oh, I have the impression that you were expecting someone else. Who? 
Me? Well, I wasn't expecting anybody. Oh. But look, I, I don't say that Lollygag here is in a class with Spartacus, but we challenge you to race. Uh, well... How about here to Parsons Creek? Uh, now? Unless you just want to stand around all day. The, uh, the truth is, Uncle Harry, I... I am waiting for somebody. Oh, oh. So that's the secret of your early morning ride. And who is your partner in these assignations? Frank. Oh. Well, there's no accounting for taste, I suppose. I think I'll commune with nature on my own. Oh, Lolly, here. Uncle Harry, wait. Whoa there, Lolly. <laughs> Emily, if everybody listened to you the way the horses do, you could rule the world. Uncle Harry, do you know what I think? No, ma'am. You're too deep for me. I think this morning Frank's going to ask me. Ask you what? Ask me what? Ask me to marry him, of course. Why would Frank do that? Why would he... Oh, I suppose I'm not really pretty enough for a man to ask. No, 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 Emily. I, I never meant to imply that I... Why, you're even prettier than Judy. No, I'm not. Nowhere <clears throat> near. Well, it's just that, that I thought... That... Oh, what did you think? Well, Emily, it's, it's, it's obvious that Frank really... What's obvious is that you dislike Frank, and therefore you don't even bother to know him. Frank looks for more than a pretty face. Uh, has he uh, given you any uh, indication? Well, of course he has. Really? Well, what, what did he say? He didn't say anything. Does he have to? It would help. Uncle Harry, I know by the tone of his voice, the way he looks at me, everything about him, everything tells me he loves me. And I love him. Oh, how I love him. You think I'm crazy? Uh, I think I'll ride back to the house and have some breakfast. Well, this is the last time I'll bear my soul to you. Darling, look, I, I, I wouldn't want you to get hurt. I'm a big girl now. You don't know very much about men. Maybe, but I know what I like. Well, sounds like company's coming. Hi. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Emily. Good morning, Frank. Well, look who's here. Kind of early in the day for you, Judy. I know, but we're out to spread the news. What news? Oh, Emily, darling. It's only right that you should be the first to know. After all, you introduced us. Frank and I, we're engaged. And we owe it all to you, Emily. We owe it all to you. And I want you to be my maid of honor. Now, promise. Oh, Emily, darling, I'm so happy. I'm so happy. Judy and I will never forget what you've done for us, Emily. Can you believe this wild man? This fantastic Frank? He asked me just five minutes ago. I mean, I've been proposed to in my time, but never on horseback. <laughs> <laughs> it's another Judy Montgomery. Fabulous first. So, let's ride back to the house and tell Mother. See you. Go for it. Emily. Oh, they used to say, always a bridesmaid. But this time I'm doing better. Emily, I, I, I tried to I'm tell you. I'm made of honor. Maybe I'm getting there. Emily, he's not worth it. He is to me. Darling, please don't ride this morning. Why not? You're upset. I'm not upset. Oh, I can tell. All right, I'm upset. Emily, you'll get over it. I'm over it now. Emily, dear, one day you, you'll meet... Him. I'll never get over Emily, it. Emily, believe me. Let's go, Spartacus. Go! Oh, Emily, Emily, wait. Emily. Go. Emily. Come on, Spartacus. Emily, Emily. Come on. Slow down. Faster, Spartacus, faster. Emily, you hurt your heart. Faster, Spartacus. Emily, please, you kill yourself. Go, Spartacus, go. Emily. Emily, get out. Jump, Spartacus, up. Emily. Emily, stop! I'm trying to get up! Emily! Oh. Oh, no. No. Emily. Come in. You wanted to see me, sir? Oh, it's you, Frank. 
Yes, yeah, sit down. Thank you. Wait till I shut up this music. Oh, let it play. It was her favorite rhapsody. So it was. Well, how are the ladies? Well, Judy and Mrs. Montgomery have gone to bed. It's been a terrible ordeal. Mm. But with the coroner... Why was all that necessary? You have to establish the cause of death. Well, wasn't it obvious? What a thoroughly obnoxious man. Why did he have to ask so many questions when he knew from the start that his verdict would be accidental death? There isn't anything that I could do about it. But I disagree with the verdict. Well, what other verdict is possible? Murder. Murder? You mean someone killed her? Yes. Who? You. Me? Yes, you. But that's impossible. Why is it impossible? Well, because I because I, I wasn't even there. You were there. What are you saying, sir? You don't have to call me sir. Don't pretend with me. I can see through you. You're a young hustler on the make. You have no right to accuse me of it. You a... used Emily to get to Judy. You're going to marry Judy for her money. I don't think I have to sit here and listen to I, the... There's nothing intrinsically wrong with marrying for money. Does anyone seriously believe that poverty improves the quality of love? I married Mrs. Montgomery's sister for her money. Yes, I married her for her money. She married me for my looks. And both of us knew it. And we've had a perfect marriage. But you're a scoundrel. And you won't even give Judy her money's worth. Now, look here, sir. I said don't call me, sir. You can relax with me. Don't be afraid. Even though every word I say is true, I couldn't prove any of it. None of it's true. You accuse me of killing Emily. That's a lie. You say I was there. You know I wasn't there. I was with Judy. We were riding back to the house. You know it for a fact. <laughs> Have a drink. I don't drink. Don't say it so smugly. You have other vices that are worse... I say you were with Emily. I was not. No, don't interrupt. Since the very day you met Emily or arranged to meet her, you've been with her always. I think you're mad. That's my saving grace. But to say that I was with Emily when you know... You were with her as far as she was concerned. I don't know what you're talking about. So few. So few girls like Emily in the world. Oh, what a shame that you had to waste one of them. You knew that she was in love with you. Well, love, I... I'd, I'd say it was a crush. Girls like Emily don't have crushes. They fall in love only once, and it's forever. She was in love with you, and you know it. Admit it. What is this, an inquisition? I don't have to put up with it. Of course it. you don't, but don't try my patience either. I'm doing this for your good. For my good? Make it difficult for me, and I'll wash my hands of the whole business. Why do you say for my good? If she fell in love with you of her own accord... Well, that's a tragedy, but it's her tragedy. But if you made her fall in love with you, you're guilty of murder. Why? Because you knew it would kill her. The fact that you were only playing with her would kill her. The fact that you were only using her would kill her. All right. Maybe I did lead her to believe that I was in love with her. And it's murder in the first degree. Premeditated. I didn't know she'd take it this way. You knew... You knew it would destroy her one way or another. Okay, Harry. I killed her. That's what you want me to say, isn't it? Yes. Well, maybe she'll forgive you. Oh, come on, Harry. That's unworthy of you. Sure, I killed her. And you know why it doesn't destroy me? Because she was a girl who walked around saying to the whole world, Kill me. Please, somebody kill me. She was so trusting, so naive. Anybody could have broken her heart. Anybody could have betrayed her. Nobody has a right to be that defenseless. I was just the guy who happened along. Yes. Well, despite it all, she'll forgive you. Sure, Harry. Don't humor me. She loves you. And when she loves, she loves forever. A little thing like death isn't going to stop her. <laughs> Good morning, Mac. Good morning, Mr. Frank. You going to ride? Who do you want? Spartacus. You do, huh? Saddle him. Saddle him, the man says. What's the problem? The problem's right there in the corral. You can look at the problem. You can listen to the problem. You want to ride Spartacus, Mr. Frank? You go in there. You put the saddle on him. How long has he been acting up? More than a week now. 
since we lost Miss Emily. How long can he go on like that? Oh, for another five minutes. Or for the rest of his life. Poor Spartacus. He's kind of in mourning, that's all. Oh, Miss Judy said she'd wait for you at Parsons Creek. I got Bolivar saddled up. You know, Frank, ever since I was a little girl, nice things have always happened to me here at Parsons Creek. You're not listening, Frank. Judy, darling, I wait breathlessly for each word. No, your mind is somewhere else, and I won't have it. I want all of your attention. Now, what have you been staring at for the past few minutes? Judy, look straight ahead toward that clump of birches at the edge of the field. Why? There's a horse standing there. I don't see anything. Big chestnut. If I didn't know that Spartacus was back in the corral... Have you had breakfast? No, but that doesn't... <laughs> it's the most important meal of the day. You're probably seeing things because you're faint with hunger. What do you mean you don't see anything? And it gives you a bad temper, too. Judy, don't joke with Missing me. breakfast is no joke. We're going to go right back and get you some. That Spartacus standing there and someone is on him. Wait. Whoever it was just moved behind the trees. Come on. Where? We're well, right over there. I'll prove it. I didn't see anything. I don't have to prove anything. Wait here. Good morning, Frank. Where have you been all week? Emily. I've been waiting for you here every day. You're not angry with me, are you, Frank? Emily. Where would you like to ride this morning? You know... I never did thank you for that piano rhapsody. It was so thoughtful. Come on, boy. Let's go, boy. Frank, don't go. Don't go, Frank. Ready to go back for breakfast, Frank? Yeah. Yeah. Well, was anybody there? Oh, no. There was nobody there. Nobody at all. dream, and everything will be all right when Frank wakes up. But how can he wake up when we all know he hasn't been sleeping? We'll return shortly with Act Two. And now, Act Two of Death Rides a Stallion. Frank has gotten over the shock of seeing and hearing a dead Emily, but not completely, it seems, as he has breakfast with Judy. More coffee, Frank, darling? Thank you. You know, you weren't exactly filled with chatter and high spirits this morning. Sorry, Judy. You hardly said a word, all during our ride. I guess you're right. I should never skip breakfast. Oh, no, that isn't true. You should always skip breakfast. Or you'll wind up fat as a pig. <laughs> <laughs> the wit and wisdom of Uncle Harry. <laughs> morning, sir. And how are the true lovers this morning? Oh, I'm fine. Frank is a bit gloomy, I'm though. I'm not gloomy. Yes, I would say you are. I'm an expert on gloom. I was once engaged to a boy. Do you remember him, Uncle Harry, the tall, blonde? Uh, the one whose father owned uh, all that oil? No, no. He was a redhead. <laughs> the blonde's name was George, something or other. Oh. Anyhow, he was undoubtedly the gloomiest human being east of the Mississippi. Well, Frank, what's the problem? There isn't any problem. Frank's been seeing things. Is that a fact? Now, Judy. Now, Frank, don't deny it. He was actually convinced he saw Spartacus out riding this morning. Spartacus? And somebody was on him. Whoa. That's... Remarkable. Not to mention impossible. In the first place, nobody's been able to ride Spartacus since... Since poor Emily. And, and in the second place, Spartacus hasn't left the stable in all that time. Who was supposed to have been riding him, Frank? Look, the whole thing was a kind of a... A hallucination. Now, please forget it. All right, darling. Will you be judge at the competitions this year, Uncle Harry? Well, is it still on? After all, darling, we're in mourning. Oh, would Emily have wanted us to call off the show? What better way is there to remember her? Poor child. 
Frank, do you think that we should... Where's Frank? Uh, well, he was just sitting here. Where'd he go? Come on, Spartacus. Come on. Calm down, boy. Calm down. Everything's all right. Everything's going to be all right. I want it fine. All right. Uh, oh, good morning. Uh, that's Spartacus. Still can't do a thing with you. You don't have to play that game for me anymore, Mac. Game, Mr. Frank? Tell me the truth or I'm going to beat it out of you. You raise your hand to me and I'll be forced to break your jaw. There's nothing the matter with Spartacus. He was out riding this morning. But that's news to me. Who's paying you off? Mr. Frank, the jaw of yours is starting to look like a good target. You saddled Spartacus after I left here. I saw him. He was near Parsons Creek. Oh, you ain't well. You want to sit down? I'll get you a glass of water. Now, now, just get get your filthy hands off me. Frank, Frank, what's the matter? Nothing, 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 nothing is the matter, Judy. Mac? I think the, uh, the sun's a little strong this morning, Miss Judy, and you know these city fellows, they... They never wear hats. Frank, you don't look well at all. I'm fine. Now, listen, darling, listen to me. I'm going to call Dr. Stone. I don't need a doctor. Yes, you do. You do? I don't want to hear another word. You just go to your room and rest. Come in. Oh, it's you, darling. I don't want to hear another word. Just go to your room and rest. <laughs> Well, I could tell who's going to wear the pants in your family. Not to mention the shorts and the slacks. When $26 million tells me to go up to my room, I go. There's a bit of an exaggeration there. She only has 23. Well, it won't change my style of living. What's this I hear about you uh, hallucinating? <laughs> I'll admit you had me going, Uncle Eric. I had you going? Never been back there. I believed. Oh, did I ever believe? What did you believe, Frank? I believed, and listen to this. I believed that the dead return. I believed that I actually saw Emily sitting on horseback, sitting on Spartacus. Oh, of course it was your imagination. No, it wasn't. You mean she was sitting on Spartacus? Let's say somebody was sitting on Spartacus. Somebody you hired, an actress what? made up to look like Emily. Why would I do a thing like that? Because you know I hate your guts. Oh, come on, Frank. You don't really. Oh, I do. And once I marry Judy and start assuming some control around here, you will be thrown out on your ear. Frank, you wouldn't. And you can either starve to death or you can find somebody else to sponge on. Oh, I see. That's why I'm trying to drive you crazy. Exactly, but it won't work. Yes, I could have hired someone to impersonate Emily, but I could never get her on Spartacus. That horse is completely unmanageable. I think you're bribing that fool down at the stables. Oh, don't let that pose of his throw you. He's far from a fool. Actually, he's a physicist. You plan to put this girl, this actress, on Spartacus, and my vivid imagination would then do the rest. He just realized one day that live horses were more interesting than dead mathematics. Oh, I blew it this morning. No question about that. I panicked. I lost my cool. First, when I actually thought it was Emily. Second, when I tried to put muscle on that moron at the stables. Frank, believe me, his IQ is higher than yours. I lost points with Judy, but it'll never happen again. Sorry to end your fun so soon, Uncle Harry. Come in. Frank, darling. I came by to check. Has he been resting, Uncle Harry? Oh, yes, yes. He's been as good as gold. My darling Judy, won't you believe I'm all right? You didn't look all right, and you didn't sound all right just a little while ago. I'm fine right now. I'm just fine. Oh, that's good, darling. Because we're having dinner with the Farringtons. Far oh, Judy, he's such a bore. Oh, of course. But he has one of the biggest stock brokerage firms in the country. We were talking about making you vice president. Judy, I'm not interested. Frank, darling... You'll have to do something. I don't know anything about... And there's no reason you can't learn. Now, Uncle Harry knows all about finance. Let him teach you. Will you, Uncle Harry? Oh, gladly. I'll pop in again soon, just to check on you. (laughs) Does she know your plan to assume control after the wedding? Don't you worry about me. I know how to handle women. Well, Judy has all the money. But you know you'd have been much happier with Emily... (laughs) 
I was so proud of you this evening, Frank. You were so attentive and so interested. You hung on Jim Farrington's every word. I'm going to work for him. No, dear, not for him. With him. After all, Mother and I are major stockholders in Farrington and Company. But don't you find stocks and bonds fascinating? Slow down, Judy. Why? Slow down! I went out, Judy! Judy, you all right? Oh, of course I'm all right. Why did you make me skid off the road? Uh, there was there, there was there was somebody up ahead. I didn't see anybody. Yeah, there was somebody up ahead on horseback. On a horseback? At eleven o'clock at I, night? I could have sworn I. Uh, Maybe, maybe maybe it was the shadows. Oh, you have this thing for people on horseback, Frank. Oh, I'm never going to get out of this ditch. We're less than a mile from home. Let's walk. Oh! Oh, no! We'll have to wait till it lets up. Oh, we could wait all night. I tell you, I can run to the house, pick up another car, and be back in ten minutes. <laughs> I was waiting for you to suggest a gallant thing, darling. You mind waiting alone? Why should I mind? These are my woods. Well, there goes. Hello, Frank. What? Emily. Poor oh, Frank. You're getting soaked. Climb up. Ride with me. Emily. What? What do you want? I want you to come with me, Frank. Where? Where we can just be together all the time. Just you and me, Frank. You love me. This is some kind of trick. But it isn't working. Harry, he hired you. No, Frank. I'm Emily. Really. When I saw you this morning, you mentioned the piano rhapsody. Harry knew about it. He coached you. No, Frank. Only you and I know about the day we met. Only you and I. Oh, it's... My ticket stub says R1. So does mine. Hey, look at the date on your ticket. It's for tomorrow. Oh. Well, look, you... You you take the seat anyhow. Oh, but I couldn't. I insist. Now sit down and enjoy yourself. And we met in the lobby at intermission. And you bought me a lemonade. And when I said my name was Emily Montgomery, you said... Of the Montgomerys? Well, yes, that's what we're called. Hey, I had no idea I was buying a lemonade for an heiress. Oh, I'm not an heiress. My stepsister Judy has the money. Come with me, Frank. No. Don't be afraid, Frank. I love you. I wouldn't harm you. Come with me. I, I can't go with you, Emily. Why, Frank? Why? Because, be, because you're dead. Oh, no, Frank. Love never dies. And neither do lovers. You remember that verse you once recited? So speak to me of parting never. For all who love shall live forever. Get away from me. Frank. I forgive you for Judy. Keep away, I said. You were poor all your life, and when she smiled... Keep away, you... please. But I'm the one you love. I'm the one you want. Come with me, Frank. Keep away from me. Frank! Stop, go, Frank! Keep away from me. Keep away from me. Keep away from me. And so... We have here a man who is sprinting down a country road at midnight in a pouring rain, shouting, keep away from me. And his urgent plea is directed to a dead young lady. And yet, 12 hours ago, he was convinced that the dead do not return. We'll return shortly with Act Three. country road in the dead of night. It can try the souls of the most practical of men. Pragmatic, sensible Frank is now terrified, delirious Frank. Keep away from me. Keep away. Keep away. What, 
What? what? Lie back, what? Frank. Lie what? back what? and be quiet. What? How? How did I... How did I get here? What am I... What am I doing in bed? Judy found you lying on the road, unconscious. I waited in the car for almost an hour. <laughs> I thought you'd taken this as an excuse to run out on me. Oh, Judy, don't say that. Right, darling, now don't excite yourself. No, I'm fine. I'm okay. You see, the rain had let up, and I started to walk home. And there was someone lying in the road. And it was you. What happened, I, 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 I must have tripped over something, or maybe I, I ran to a low-hanging branch. I, I guess I was knocked out. And, and you kept moaning, keep away from me. Uh, why? Well, Who? I don't know. I, 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 I just, I guess I must have been having a nightmare. Well, listen, the first thing in the morning, we'll see Dr. Stoneman. But right now, what you need is some sleep. And we'd better leave you alone. Are you coming, Uncle Harry? Yeah, just a minute. Frank, dear, you look very tired. You try to get some rest. Good night, my darling. Good night. <laughs> so... You were running, you tripped, you fell, you were knocked unconscious. Oh, no. No, that story won't do. You don't have a mark on you. What are you talking about? She's starting to have second thoughts, Frank. Bad move. You should have chosen Emily. No 23 million there, but she wasn't exactly a welfare case either. It won't work, Uncle Harry. You can't hope to psych me out of it. Nobody can psych me out of it. Little things, Frank. Little straws in the wind. For instance, she just said, I waited in the car. I thought you'd taken this excuse to run out on me. What she really meant, Frank. She might be looking for an excuse to run out on you. Enjoy yourself, Harry. I've been with that girl through... Oh, it has to be at least a dozen engagements. Each one is like a fever. It runs a predictable course. And you can always tell when she's reached the crisis... She becomes thoughtful. Pour you another glass of wine, dear. Judy, more wine? No. Oh, thank you. What a glorious spot for a picnic. Frank, did you tell Dr. Stoneman everything? Of course. You heard what he said. I am 100%. Did you say anything about that mysterious rider? What mysterious rider? Oh, I know for a fact you've seen it twice. Once yesterday morning and again on the road last night. The rider who's supposed to be on Spartacus. What's there to say about it? It's impossible. Who can even get a saddle on Spartacus these days? Then why do you keep seeing him with someone on his back? Julie, darling... Didn't you ever have a momentary flash from, well, an illusion? No, not really. I take after Dad, both feet on the ground. You know, it's a pity you never knew my dad. There was a man for you. You're a lot like him, except, well, except when you get these, what do you call them, delusions? No, he wasn't like that at all. Who's that coming? I don't see any, but... Oh, Frank, not again. Hello, Frank. What's the matter, darling? Nothing. Nothing is the matter. I'm fine. Well, you don't look it. Come with me, my dearest. Frank, are you sure you don't have some deep, dark secret? Come with me. She won't mind if you come with me. I always thought I wanted to marry a man of mystery, but... Judy and I, we grew up together. We loved each other as sisters do. Frank... Are you sure you haven't been drinking? She wouldn't have taken you if she knew I loved you. Judy, let's go back to the house. But we just got oh, here. Oh, no, but please. Don't go with her, Frank. Come with me. All right, we might as well. I can tell you're not going to be much fun today. Good morning, Mr. Frank. Do anything for you? Matt. Spartacus has been here all morning, hasn't he? This time, you don't have to take my word for it. The vet's in the stable. He's been here all morning. Ask him. Want me to call him? No, no, no. Never mind. Hey, you, you look you look nervous, Mr. Frank. You ought to get some rest. Yeah, sure. Sure. The vet's been here all morning, and so is Spartacus. Why do you keep asking? How, how, how long will it take you to saddle Spartacus? The way he is now? Forever. I'm going to ride Spartacus. Mr. Frank. Now, that is a damn fool thing to do. If you won't saddle him, I will. 
I tell you what, Mr. Frank. This is a bad time. Toward evening, he kind of simmers down a bit, and that's the best time to try. Right now, he'd kill the both of us. That's five o'clock. Oh, I'd say five o'clock's just fine. Come in. Well, I'm here to attend your education as a budding financier, as per your fiancé's instructions. So, let's begin with something right up your alley. Let me tell you about watered stock. Oh, shut up. People have been talking about you. Mac in the stables, for one. He tells me that you intend to ride Spartacus. That's right. Why? Harry, at first I thought you were out to destroy my mind with an actress who was impersonating Emily on Spartacus. But that's impossible. <laughs> Might have been fun at that. Now I know for sure that I am having hallucinations. I keep seeing Emily. Oh, that's bad. But as long as I'm aware of it, I can handle it. It's my own mind, and I can control it. Hooray for you. The key to this thing is Spartacus. If I can break that horse, I can break this whole psychological hang-up. Well, that's what you think it is, a psychological hang-up. Absolutely. Judy's also been talking about you. She's uh, a little disturbed. I didn't notice. Yeah, key sign. Tell me, did she talk about her father yet? No. You sure? What, she... She happened to mention him briefly. But his name did come up. Just in passing. Oh, bad news for you. Why don't you get out of here? I don't think she'll ever marry anybody. None of this is going to work, Harry. Her daddy was just too overwhelming a man. She's attracted to guys who resemble him. And then when she finds out the resemblance is only superficial... She's done it no fewer than 12 times. Oh, my goodness. You're number 13. Will you get out of here? I'm supposed to teach you how to be a stockbroker. Cut it out. Well, here you are, you two. Hard at work, I hope. How are the lessons coming? The lessons are coming to an end. <laughs> you mean you've learned everything already? I don't intend to learn anything. I don't care about finance. I won't go into an office with that idiot Farrington. And when we're married, I intend to make the decisions. Well, uh, of course. Now, what I... did you want to see me about? I, I just came up to find out if you were all right. Obviously, I'm fine. Oh, well, uh, I'll see you at dinner. That's how you handle women, Uncle Harry. That's how you regain control of your mind. And now, I'm going for a walk. Oh, if you happen to see Emily riding Spartacus, say hello for me. Hello, Frank. Emily, you're either in my mind or you really are out there. I'm out here, Frank. Either way, I can live with it. You won't destroy me. Oh, my darling. I'm not here to destroy you. I'm here to save you. Emily, I don't love you. Believe me, I used you. I used you to meet Judy. No, Frank, that's not true. You love me. Some stranger. Something. Someone who's alien to your very nature was attracted to Judy. Oh, Frank, she won't marry you. She doesn't love you. She will marry me. I've come for you, Frank. We'll be together, always. Go away from me. Speak to me of parting, never. For those who love shall live forever. Emily, I don't want you. Yes, you do. Oh, how badly you want me. How you need me. I can live with this. I can keep seeing you and talking to you. It won't destroy me. I'll just get used to it. I will get used to it. so soon, Frank. Have a nice walk. Boy, thought Judy would be here. Wanted to find out what the plan was for dinner. Aren't you the newly appointed planner? No, not when it comes to dinner. That's a woman's prerogative. Well, Judy isn't here. Where'd she go? She left for the airport. Why? I wouldn't know. Did something come up suddenly? Probably. Oh, she uh, left you this note. Thanks. Frank, darling. How lucky we are to find out sooner rather than late. Obviously, it isn't going to work. 
the one thing I must have in my life is someone solid, dependable. Someone who has a clearly defined goal and purpose. You're wonderful, Frank, but so moody, so unpredictable. How ironic. You would have been just right for Emily. I realize that now. Had she lived, I'm sure you would have found each other. I hope we can meet again as friends. Judy. Well, Frank, I'm sorry. Uh, let me pour you a drink. I'll ride that damn horse. I'll kill him. Mac! Yes, Mr. Frank? Will you saddle Spartacus? No, sir. Saddle him. I have strict orders from Miss Judy that no one's to ride Spartacus at this time. Anyhow, sir, he's impossible. No, no, no. He's standing there very quiet. Well, that's just for the moment. Frank. Oh, Frank, darling. There's Miss Emily. She's getting ready to ride him. Miss Emily? There she is, right beside him. You see Miss Emily? Of course. Come with me, Frank, darling. We'll be together now. Yes, Emily. I was so foolish. Mr. Frank, please tell me, who are you talking to? Sir, Miss Emily. Come, Frank. Yes, Emily. You're all I have. Climb up behind me. We'll ride Spartacus together. Hey, Mr. Frank, Mr. Frank, you, where do you think you're going? You can't go in that corral at her. It'll kill you. Spartacus, look at him. So still, so gentle. I can't let you go in there. It's all right. Emily and I will ride him together. Come, Frank. Let go, Mr. No, Frank. Mr. Frank, Bert, 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 quick, quick, quick. Come on, give me a hand. I can't hold. I'm waiting, Frank. Let me go. I'm coming, Emily. Mr. Frank, get out of that corral. Climb on, Frank. Climb on. Get away from that horse. Get away. Don't be afraid of him, Frank. Climb on. Don't touch him, Mr. Frank. Back away, back away. Here. Let Don't me touch help him. you. Back away. Take my hand, Frank. Yes. No. Take my no. hand. Yes, Emily, yes. Don't touch that horse. Don't be afraid, Frank. Emily, give me your hand. Emily, where are you? Emily! Emily, help me! Help me! Mr. Frank! No! No! Bert! Get a rope! Jerry! Call an ambulance. As you can already guess, the ambulance was too late. But, as the poem says, those who love shall live forever. If Frank truly loved Emily at the end, then both of them will be together somewhere forever. I'll be back shortly. story of Spartacus? Well, maybe you should, because whenever we vouch for something, we say it's from the horse's mouth. That's because everyone knows that horses never lie. Our cast included Mason Adams, Marion Seldes, Paul McGrath, Barbara Worthington, and Harry Belliver. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the sound of suspense. To the fear you can hear. Consider this. What is the nature of danger? Is it a clear threat to our safety? Or is it a murky product of our imagination? And what is safety? Do we ever really possess it? Isn't there always danger? Our tale is about a little old lady who ran from danger and was pursued by a cat. How did you get into this house? Now get... I didn't even touch you. What's the matter with you? Sooner or later, you're going to have to get out of my house. Don't you think I'm going to feed you because I'm not? There's nothing in the house to eat anyway. How in the world did you ever get in here? How am I going to get rid of you? Our mystery drama, The Resident, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Carmen Matthews. It is sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll be back shortly with Act One. It's hard to live with danger. Hard if you're old, elderly. Hard if you're a woman. And hardest if you're alone. Miss Malvina Thrip is elderly, a woman... And alone. Oh, my. Oh, how many years since I lived in a place with stairs? Forty at the very least. Well, how am I going to navigate up and down six, eight times a day at my age? Well, I wanted to get out of the city. And here I am. Oh, but it's a nice house. It really is a nice house. <laughs> what was that? Was that a cat? Didn't I hear a cat? I'm sure... All right, Malvina. You heard a cat. There's nothing surprising about hearing a cat. Nothing alarming. <laughs> the thing is that I... I haven't lived in a house since I was a child. It makes me feel very... alone. Not that I'm not used to being alone. I, I, I like being alone. But in the city, there was always somebody around. Other tenants. Not necessarily anyone you'd want to know or, or even talk to, but... But you'd meet them maybe in the elevator and, and exchange a few words. <laughs> Not that I even knew their names or cared to. Also, there were the children at school. But I never knew what to say to them either. What I really liked was to talk to people on buses. Because sooner or later, one of us had to get off. <coughs> Quiet out there, cat. <sighs> cat, go away. Honestly, Cat, I will not let you in my house. Well, where are you? After all that racket, where are you? Cat? Gone off to howl at somebody else. Well, good. All that meowing. Well, how in the world did you get in here? Did you skitter through the door without my seeing you? Nah, you're, you're a big cat, aren't you? Big yellow eyes. And you're sitting in my chair, you know that. My favorite wing chair. I'm probably getting cat hairs all over it. So um, I think you'd better get down. Come on, cat. Get down. Get off my chair. Get... I didn't even touch you. Well, what's the matter with you? Who could that be? Maybe somebody looking for you. I devoutly hope so. Mailman. Mail? Mail? For me? Nobody knows I'm here. I just moved in. One letter addressed to resident. You the resident of this house? Oh, I'm the resident, all right. As of this morning. Yeah. Here's your letter. Thank you. It says, Sam's Garage. Circular. Sam runs a good garage. I don't have a car. <laughs> Better luck next time. Uh, uh, Mr. Mailman. Yeah? Do you know anybody who's lost a cat? Uh, you, uh, found a cat? It's in my house. It doesn't want to leave. Crazy about you, huh? I wouldn't say that, no. Uh, maybe if you leave the door open, you'll sort of wander out. Well, is that safe? 
to leave the door open? In this town? <laughs> Are you kidding? Well, it's good to hear that. <laughs> I had a cooperative apartment in the city. Every cent I had was invested in it, and I, I traded it for this house <laughs> to be safe. Everybody here was born here and is about to die here. I'll inquire around if anybody's lost a cat. Oh, thank you. I'd appreciate it. Oh, no. Leave it open, he said. <laughs> Safe, he said. Well, now, Cat, any time you're ready, the door is open. You can... Where are you? Where have you gone to? Are you still in this house looking for someone? Oh! <laughs> you frightened me. The door was open. I, I left it open for the cat. You have a cat? No, no, I don't have a cat. It just showed up here a little while ago, and it didn't seem about to leave, so I... Did you, uh... Did you want something? Something in particular, Miss... Viola's my name. Viola? Mm. What? I've forgotten. <laughs> oh, you have a little scratch on your arm. Well, the cat did that. What did you do to the cat? I just wanted her to get out of my chair. Why did you? Well, it's my favorite chair. No wonder... It's nice. Oh, you uh, you don't want to sit in it. Yes, I do. Well, it has cat hairs all over it. <laughs> These old dungarees have been up against worse than cat hairs. Okay to drop my knapsack here? Oh. You live alone. I just moved in. This morning. I saw you. You did? I should think you'd want a nice cat living here with you. Well, I, I don't. Anyway, it seems to have disappeared. Maybe she went upstairs. You think so? I think it's possible. Well, I must go and have a look. Good idea. Uh, if you, um, if you want to be on your way now... Not quite yet. Do you, uh, need some money? I, I have a little in the house, not much, but... I just want to sit here in this nice chair. You go ahead. Go upstairs. But I... I won't steal anything. Oh, I, I didn't mean to suggest... There's nothing to steal. Well, if you want to rest yourself... I do. I really do. Yes. Well, you rest yourself and I'll just look upstairs. Maybe I'll take a hot bath and change my clothes because I'm going out going for dinner. Out? There's no food in the house. I... I don't like leaving you here. You want me to come with you? Oh, no. No, I'll, I'll go by myself. Oh, wait. You forgot your letter. Oh, that's nothing. I guess it's yours. Resident. Is that you? What a nice name. My name is Malvina Thripp. Malvina Thripp. I think Resident is a much nicer name. It could be anybody. Miss Viola, why don't you leave right now? Miss Thripp. I shall leave when I'm good and ready. Now go on upstairs. I really don't understand why I'm letting myself be subjected to all this. Uh, I'll, I'll be back. Shortly. <laughs> oh, why, Miss Thripp. You were born to be subjected to all this and more. One bedroom door closed. You are a natural victim, Miss Thrip. Other door closed. Rest well, Miss Thrip. Pull the pretty pink and white afghan up around your shoulders and rest well. There's excitement in store for you. Ah, oh, there you are, my beautiful. Come here. Come. Come, Eva. Come to my arms. Oh, my beautiful evil one. She's lying down now, upstairs on her little white bed. She's staring at the ceiling, making plans. She'll stay up there for a while, so you and I must make our plans, too. Our careful, careful plans. better, Miss Thripp? You're still here. You've changed your clothes. What on earth are you doing? This is our dinner. 
I'm going out. I told her... Look, a barbecued chicken and a bottle of wine. What on earth? I had them in my knapsack. On the road, I buy a chicken and a bottle of wine every day. Have a drumstick. I couldn't. Not hungry? Not a bit hungry. Oh. You pack up your chicken and your wine and your knapsack and you get out of my house. Miss Thrip, you sit down. Uh, sit down, you old fool. Now listen to me. You're a selfish old lady. Here you are with a little gem of a house, two bedrooms, and you won't even share a little corner of it. Well, it's my house. It's my house. Mine, mine, mine. What a way to talk. But it is my... Don't you know what it is to share? Why should I share my house with you? With anybody? If I don't want to... It's sharing I... that makes life beautiful, Miss Thrip. Don't you know that, for heaven's sake? No. Well, I... then you are going to learn. Here. Have some wine. Well, perhaps I'd better. Of course you'd better. There you are. Do you like me, Miss Thrip? Well, I, I'm sure you're a very nice girl, really, but... Don't you think you are... I mean, do your parents know where you are, what you're doing? What are parents? Your, your father, your mother. Oh, my biological predecessors. Do, do they know what you're doing? Wandering about with a knapsack, living off of chicken and wine. Let me fill your glass. Uh, they don't care. And I don't care. It's very strange. Only the very weak cling to their families. Well, I know I'm not strong, but on the other hand, I'm, I'm not weak either. I don't think I am. Wishy-washy. I've... I've supported myself. I, I've lived alone. I, I haven't complained. You call that being strong? Well, it isn't being weak. Anyway, I, I've never thought it was. You've endured, Miss Thrip. Strong people don't endure things. They change them. Well, they take things and they change them. I wouldn't know how to change, to take... If one way doesn't work, try another, that's how. The thing is, get what you want. Well, I want my house. I want my house. Take it. If you just go. Make me. If the cat would just go. If I could just have my house back again the way it was when I moved in. You want more chicken, Miss Thrip? Oh, no, no. It's the cat. She's back. <laughs> you like those bones, do you, my lovely? My evil. My beautiful evil. What did you call her? Eva. That's her name. How do you know what her name is? Because I just named her. Evil is a horrible name. No, it isn't. Think about it, Miss Thrift. Evil, spelled backwards, is Liv. Think about that. Evil, spelled backwards, is Liv. E-V-I-L. L-I-V-E. The girl's right, no doubt about it. But wait. Take the same letters and mix them up again. And they spell vile. V-I-L-E. Think about that. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. get back to the story of a lady living alone until a cat moved in a cat named evil until a girl moved in named viola and the lady no longer lived alone wake up miss thrip it's morning time to wake up what oh, where... what happened you went to sleep on the couch that's all why did i do that who are you you know me i'm viola why are you holding that cat? Uh, this is Evil. Evil slept upstairs with me on my bed. Your bed? Don't you remember anything at all? I, uh, I wanted the cat to get out of my house. And Evil wouldn't go, would you? You lovely thing. And then you walked into my house, a total stranger. I won't and... be a stranger for long. You can count on that. I want you 
to get out of my house. You and the cat, both of you. Can't you understand that? This is my house. Where's the telephone? I don't have a telephone. Why? Look at you. You've got my dress on. Why don't you have a telephone? How dare you put my dress on? My dungarees were dirty. Why don't you have a telephone? I haven't had one put in yet. Now I'll have to go out. You're leaving? I have to go out and get some food. We have to have breakfast, don't we? I don't care about breakfast. I want my house back. Miss Thrip, you really must stop being so selfish. I just want what belongs to me. That's not selfish. Listen, old lady. I'm going out, but I'll be back. Don't get any ideas in your foolish head that you can keep me out. I'll get the police. I'll tell them... Tell them a girl is in your house and a cat... Tell them they moved in and ate chicken and drank wine, and so did you till you fell asleep on the sofa. But, but it's true. Does it sound true? But I'll show them. They'll see. I'll hide. Where? Where would you hide? Under the porch. Behind a bush. What? Up a tree. In the attic. In the cellar. Under the stairs. Oh, I know how to hide. You've done this before. You've moved in on people before. I do it all the time. I have to live, don't I? I've got to get going or we'll all starve. Please, take the cat with you. And leave you all alone. I want to be alone. It, it's what I'm used to. I'm off to the store. I won't forget you, Evo. I'll bring you something delicious. Be quiet, cat. I want to think. I'm afraid. That's what I am. Scared to death. <laughs> oh, I wish I had my little apartment back in the city. I loved it there. I, I, I really did. Well, no use thinking about that. Those people have it now. They'd never let me have it again and, and take back this awful house. <coughs> Why, you're purring, aren't you? Are you talking to me? What are you saying? Tell me. Oh, tell me. Because... I'm not just frightened. I'm... I'm panicky. I don't know what to do. I don't want to do anything foolish. And when people are in a panic, they do do foolish things. Anything I did might be foolish. There's no use locking the door, is there? Well, that's, there's no use going to neighbors. They don't even know who I am. They've never seen me before. Neighbors the police. Well, those are things I do in the city. Sensible things. Practical things. Not here, though. No, I'm... I'm in a strange place. In very strange circumstances. <laughs> You're a very extraordinary cat. I'm not going to pretend I like you. I couldn't fool you anyhow, could I? Of course I couldn't. But you're very unusual. I'm sure you're very wise, very knowing. You must know strange things, secret things that I don't know, couldn't possibly know. Evil things. Evil, spelled backwards, is live. And I want to live. And I can't live being afraid like this. Fear is an impossible thing to live with. So tell me, cat... Tell me what to do. I'm sure you know. And I'll do whatever you say. I'm back. Where are you? You didn't go out, did you? You wouldn't be such a fool. We're in the kitchen. Well, there you are, the two of you. We're hungry. Well, I bought plenty. Eggs and butter and all that kind of stuff for breakfast, coffee, tea, and meat and vegetables for dinner, enough for the whole week. The whole week? I don't want to keep going to the store. And for you, my lovely caviar. <laughs> did you, did you have enough money for all this? Of course not, I charged it. To, to me? To Miss Malvina Thrip. But they... Didn't they say anything? They don't even know me. That's how small towns are. 
They just went ahead and, uh, and charged it. Mm. They'd never do that in the city. They gave me a couple of applications to fill out for charge accounts. I said I'd drop them by tomorrow. You'd better sign them. In the city, I always pay cash. You're not in the city now. Oh, I know, I know. So sign them. Huh. There. That fixes that. Viola, did you say... Did you tell them at the store that you were me? I said my name was Malvina Thripp, so I guess they thought I was Malvina Thripp. Uh, are you just going to sit there? Or are you going to fix us some breakfast? What should I fix? Well, I don't know about you, but I want grapefruit and fried eggs and toast. Oh, and open the caviar for the cat. Put the coffee on. And start the eggs. Before the coffee's ready? And put the bread in the toaster. Well, I, I haven't unpacked the toaster. Well, then butter some bread. Uh, cut the grapefruit. There's no knife to cut the grapefruit. Oh, let's have a little efficiency around here. There's no frying pan. Hurry up! I can't. There, it's the butter, there's the bread. Now put the butter on the bread. Use your fingers. I can't understand why I'm doing all this. I am telling you to. There's no reason. And you like it. I don't. You like being told what to do. I... Hate it. All right, Miss Thripp. You may not like it now, but you'll get where you like it. Never. I won't. You'll get where you can't live without it, Miss Thripp. You just wait and see. You're a very passive person, Miss Thripp. And passive people need someone to tell them what to do. And then when they do it, they get a pat on the head and they are very, very happy. Is that how it is? That's how it is. To the end of time. The coffee's ready. People like you need people like me. I tell you what to do and you do it, and that's what makes the world go around. Pour the coffee. <clears throat> Very nice. Hot and strong. Mm, thank you. Pour yourself a cup. Thank you. I, I will. You're getting the hang of it. Of what? Of doing as you're told. Am I? Now, let's see. What'll I have you do next? I'm not going to do anything next. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. Oh! Oh, 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 oh get out! You burned me! Out of my house! Coffee all over my dress! It's not your dress! It's my dress! Oh. It's not your coffee! It's mine! And it's my kitchen! And my house! Oh. And oh! oh. Me, me, One more word about your house and I'll slap you again! Now! I am going upstairs and change these clothes and put something on those burns. And when I come back, I want you to be in control of yourself. I can't possibly be in control of myself as long as you're in this house. You told me wrong, Cat. It didn't work. You told me to give in to her and do everything she wanted. And it didn't work at all. I don't think I want any more of your advice. She was asking me to be her servant. Pretty soon it would have been sweep the floor, scour the sink, take out the garbage. I'd be her personal slave for as long as she stayed here. Suppose she stayed forever. Suppose I never got my house back. Is that possible? Sooner or later, surely somebody would... Would what? Come to the door? Who? Oh, I wish I had friends. People who cared about me. And would miss me. And worry about me. I used to think I only needed someone to talk to now and then. And not for very long, but... That's not true now. I need... Someone close. Someone who cares. of a household are we running here? I just put my head down on the table for a minute. Dirty cups. Evil, get off the table. I said get off the table. Go lie down somewhere else. Okay, Miss Thrip. Wash the cups and then sweep the floor. Oh, uh, here's something else. 
What? My dungarees. They're filthy dirty. I've been traveling in them for weeks. What am I supposed to do with them? Wash them. What? You want me? Throw them in the washer dryer. I don't have a washer dryer. Everybody has a washer dryer. And if I did, I wouldn't wash your dirty dungarees in it. Then you're just going to have to do them by hand. No. I am not going to wash them by hand. And I'm not going to wash your clothes, or buy your food, or cook your meals. We had an arrangement. You had an arrangement. Where you'd swagger around this house, my house, and give orders, and act as if you owned the place. And I would do what you told me. And that's the way it's going to be. It's not. That's the way it has to be, Miss Thrip. It can't. There are people who give orders and people who take them, and nobody in between. That's the way it is. That's the way it always has been. And that is the way it's going to be. Not in my house. Right here in your house. Now, pick up those dungarees. You pick them up. Pick them up. And take them to the sink and wash them. Wash them yourself. And then put them on and get out of my house. Don't talk to me that way. You stupid old woman. I'll show you if I have to kill you. Oh, they say, put two women in the same house, it never works out. Or am I being catty? I'll be back shortly with Act Three. Two women in the same kitchen, plus a cat. Teeth are bared. Claws are unsheathed. Fur flies. It's a cat fight. What else could it possibly be? Did she hurt you? My arms are bleeding. Your face is bleeding, too. And my hands. What got into her? I can't imagine. I thought she was asleep. Have you got some iodine? I, I haven't unpacked it well, yet. Well, unpack it. I, I wouldn't know where to look. Then give me some soap and water. Yes, that, that will do just as well. I thought that damn cat liked me. Well, you can never tell with cats. Maybe she didn't like me, but she respected me. It is very hard to get respect from cats. As hard as getting them to like you. Oh, here's the water. And here's the towel. There's no soap. This water isn't very hard. Well, it's the best I can do. Oh. Well, that's enough. You can use it now. I don't need it. Why don't you need... Why, look at you. You haven't got a scratch. That cat didn't even touch you. But we were standing right together. She came between us. Why didn't she scratch you? Why just me? I, I wouldn't know. It couldn't be that she likes you. <laughs> no, I don't suppose so. Once in a very long while... A cat falls in love. Well, I've never heard of that. When a cat falls in love, it's disgusting. They lose everything that... that... made them cats. Proud, beautiful animals, aloof, untouchable, sitting in the softest spots... Staring at things no one else can see. Thinking their secret thoughts. Why, the ancient Egyptians worshipped cats, kept them in temples, bowed down to them. They knew what cats are. The inscrutable. The unknowable. But when a cat falls in love, everything is changed. What happens? Viola, the cat becomes the lowest of the low. Shameless. Cringing, rubbing up against the person she loves, wanting to be touched, to be held. Not looking off into the distance anymore, only watching where the loved one moves. And when will he return to the cat who is waiting so patiently, loving, and longing without dignity? 
without pride. It sounds sweet. It's sickening, I suppose. And that cat is in love with you. Oh, I, I don't think so. It, it, it isn't reasonable. That's why she came between us when she thought I might hurt you and she didn't scratch you. She only scratched me. She's in love with you. She's put me out of her mind and she's in love with you. Well, that settles that. We'll get rid of her. Uh, put her outside, you mean? What good would that do if she's in love with you? She'd get back in. No. We have to kill her. Kill her? Well, you couldn't do that. Have you got some poison? Poison? We'll put it in the caviar. But I, I don't have any poison. Why would I? A have? knife. Give me a knife. Well, there isn't any knife. A poker, a shovel. I don't have any of those things. I'll strangle her. That's what I do. Oh, you I better be polite. I dare you. No, I'm stay in my house. She I don't hate you. you. She loves you. Viola, you don't mean that I should... Oh, no. No, I, I couldn't do that. I, I just couldn't. Pick her up. No, no, I... Pick uh, her up. I... I... I can't do what you said. I can't strangle a cat. You didn't mean it, did you? We'll take her upstairs. And we'll throw her out the window. Come on. No, no, we can't do that. Uh, Nevertheless, it's what's going to be done. It's what you're going to do. Up the stairs now. I'm right behind you. Keep going. I I never wanted this cat in my house, but but that doesn't mean that I I wanted this. Keep going. Uh, in here. Oh, good. The window's open. Go ahead. Throw her out. I can't. I can't do it. Yes, you can. Just lean out and drop her. The doorbell. The doorbell. Come back here. Come back. Oh, it's a friend. It's a friend. Someone remembered. I'm coming. Wait. I'm coming. Another letter, Miss Fritz. Oh, come in. Yeah. This one's addressed to you. Oh, please. Please come in. I'm so glad to see you. Miss Malvina Thripp, it says. Nothing like hearing from a friend, is there? Listen. They're in the bedroom. Hmm? She's going to kill her. Uh, hold on now. Uh, Maybe she has already. She wanted me to do it, but I couldn't. What uh, bedroom is this, Miss Thripp? The front one. Top of the stairs. I look outside. Maybe she's there. Maybe she fell in a tree. Or a bush. Or something. Where are you? Are you all right, Cat? Oh, please, be all right. I didn't want you in my house, but, but that was all. I never meant that you should... Oh, oh, where are you? Yes, yes, I'm here. What? What did you find upstairs? Nobody, nothing. Nobody? No cat? No cat. Wasn't there a girl? A young girl? Nobody. Nothing. Oh, both of them couldn't have gone out the window. I I don't think both of them... Look, Miss Tripp, you're all shook up. Why don't we go into the kitchen and I'll pour you some coffee? I, uh, I threw the coffee at her. There isn't any. Well, I'll make some fresh and you can tell me all about uh, the cat and the girl. The, 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 the whole dream. It wasn't a dream. Well, what if it was? You think it could have been a, a hallucination? Ooh, maybe something like that. You remember I told you there was a cat in my house. And I told you I'd inquire around about a lost cat, and I did. But uh, nobody's lost a cat. This girl, this Viola, she went and bought things at the store. Look, look, all these groceries. She bought them. I didn't. And caviar for the cat. She charged everything to me. You sure it wasn't you charged all these things? I haven't been out of the house. What would I have done if you hadn't rung the bell? Viola was going to make me throw the cat out of the window. Uh, Miss Tripp, uh, uh, maybe I should call a doctor. Oh, I'll be all right now that you're here. You're my friend. You brought me a letter yesterday from Sam's Garage, you remember? Address to resident. Yes, and I'm the resident here. I'm Malvina Thripp, and I'm the resident of this house. Sure you are. Although for a while there, I, I didn't know if I really was the resident of this house. Well, I wouldn't have taken the letter from you if I wasn't. 
Would I? A resident means anybody who's living here. And I'm living here. I was at the time. And I am. Of course. Of course you are. You, uh... You don't think I'm out of my head, do you? Oh, not necessarily. You're uh, upset. <laughs> I'm going to call a doctor for you, eh? Well, there's no phone. I, I haven't had one put in yet. I'll go next door. Oh, don't go. Don't. Don't leave me. You don't believe me. You don't think there was any, any cat here or any girl or that we ate chicken and, and, and drank wine and the cat ate the bones. And in the morning she came downstairs and she was holding the cat in her arms and I was on the couch. I'd been there all night. I think, I think I was drunk from the wine. Drunk, huh? Well, the bottle must be around here somewhere. Mm, I don't see it. And, and she told me to get breakfast. And wash the dishes, and then to sweep the floor, and wash her dungarees, her dirty dungarees. Look, look, there they are, her dirty, filthy dungarees. They're not yours? Well, you don't think I'd wear anything like that, do you? Oh, lots of women wear dungarees these days. Um, what was this girl wearing if she wasn't wearing the dungarees? My dress. Can you imagine? She was wearing my dress till I threw the coffee pot at her. Threw the coffee pot at her, did you? Yes. And the cat attacked her. You don't say. Not me. Just her. Mm-hmm. And she said the cat was in love with me. Now, I don't know if that was true. If such a thing could be true. But she said it was. And she said in that case, we would have to kill the cat. Poison it. Or stab it. Or strangle it. But I couldn't do that. Of course not. Not, not any of those things. Then she said, we'd take the cat upstairs. And throw it out of the window. And that's where we were when you rang the front doorbell. And oh, was I glad. You, uh, you don't believe any of it, do you? Well, now, let's just say you've been through a lot. What with one thing and another. Oh, I have. <sighs> what you need is something to calm you down. Well, I, I never take anything like that. Oh, just something mild to relax your nerves. I'll be all right. Now, uh, now that I have my house back. Uh, there's a very nice doctor who lives not far from here. He's on my mail route. I'll call him and ask him to stop over. Oh, please, don't go. He'll fix you up fine. Hey, look what's coming up the wall. Yeah. Why, it's... Oh, cat. I'm so glad to see you. Careful. Don't let her in the house. Oh, that's all right. Yeah. I've gotten sort of fond of her. And she's, well, she's rather fond of me. Oh, see. Almost forgot what it came by for. It got a letter for you. Another circular? Not Sam's garage again. Oh, no, no. Addressed to you, Miss Malvina Thripp. Well, for heaven's sake. It's from the city, my old address, where I used to live. Miss you already, do they? <laughs> well, I don't think anyone misses me. I, I didn't even tell anyone I was moving. Well, open the letter, why don't you? Imagine. My my hands are shaking. <laughs> Want me to do it for you? No. No, that's, that's all right. Why? It's from the people who took my apartment. The people who used to own this house. <laughs> I told you... We traded? <laughs> well, dear Miss Tripp, we hope you are enjoying the little house as much as we are enjoying your apartment. <laughs> One day soon, if it's all right with you, we want to drive up and see you. Well, and how you're getting along. <laughs> also to pick up our cat. We came away in such a hurry, she got left behind. Will you be kind enough to let her share your house until we can make arrangements? She's a dear, sweet thing. Her name is Viola. And we know you will love her as much as we do. Good Viola. Or is she vicious Viola? Violent Viola? Vile Viola? Hmm? 
Well, anyway, for the time being, Viola has a home with Miss Valvina Thrip, the resident. May they both rest safe and sound. I'll be back shortly. There's so much good in the worst of us, and so much bad in the best of us, it scarcely behooves any of us to talk about the rest of us. So the poet said, think about it. That's what I'm going to do. Our cast included Carmen Matthews, Joan Loring, and Gilbert Mack. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Nostalgia. Tune in to now. Golden Radio Hour.